made by Zephyr Odin audiobook. Audiobook title, Phantom Kid in the World of American Comics, 01-233, by Greek and Fish Part 01, he is a, who tries to trample all American police under his feet GCPD. He is like the 21st century Robin Hood who can easily disguise himself as the person you are most familiar with. We are not even sure whether he is a he or her CIA. We may have to spend a lifetime hunting him down, but in the end, it is mostly useless FBI. The Magician Under the Moonlight, his risk assessment, is very complicated, but we can at least be sure that he is much more skilled than most members of the Avengers Shield. He is our dream lover female fans in this world treasures, and beauties are the most indispensable, Matheson, Chapter 1, The First Notice Letter of Phantom Kid, On the Night of the Full Moon, After the Curtain of Sunset Falls, I will claim the Stone of Destiny under the first rays of moonlight, Phantom Kid joined in, GCPD, the headquarters of the Gotham City Police Department, received an odd letter today, a provocative letter, to be precise, the paper was of premium quality, rough, like a piece of cardboard but far thinner than that, the text on the letter was printed on, so there was no way to tell by whom it was written through the handwriting, in the lower right corner of the text, there was a drawing of a cartoon head with a tall bowler hat and monocle, the stone of destiny is an alias for sapphire, one of the most precious stones in the world, coincidentally, only three days later, the Gotham City Exhibition Hall will be exhibiting the world's largest sapphire, the Adams Star, it is valued at $170 million, and that day as well, concurrently, is the day of the full moon, from the contents of the provocative letter, it seems that a thief has taken a liking to Adams Star, obviously, he had planned to steal it on the day of the exhibition and send a teaser to the police. You're kidding. No thief in the world would inform the police before stealing, unless he was a psychopath. This letter shed all the police's lights upon him. Jim Gordon, Commissioner of the Gotham Police Department. The security of the Adams Star, the national treasure, was the sole responsibility of the GCPD. They have scheduled to deploy over a hundred police officers on site. However, Right after receiving the letter, Gordon immediately pulled close to a tenth of Gotham's police force to take charge of protecting Adam Star. Commissioner, would the number of men scheduled to the exhibition hall be a little too much? Aaron Cash said, right after he joined Gordon in his office. He was the one who had discovered and then reported the forewarning letter, although he himself had been completely dismissive of it. Aaron. Don't you think it's been too quiet these last few years? Gordon's eyes were as deep as a tunnel, as if he was remembering the old days catastrophes. Oh, dear chief, why do you want me to think of Ackham's criminals, whereas they have all been defeated by Bat? Don't say that name, he's gone. Okay, chief, I won't say it, but what I must say is that Gotham has changed since that incident eight years ago. It's not the same Sin City it once was, Aaron said, with intent. I know, but. This teasing letter makes me uneasy. You think this might be another nutcase? Aaron, you've been through all that with me. You should understand that this city is never short of lunatics. No matter how many years it's been quiet in this city where prosperity and sin coexist. No matter how shiny and bright the skyscrapers are on the outside, a dirty and dark alleyway exists behind them, even the GCPD is no exception. In the shadowy alley behind the Gotham Police Department, Matheson Fang emerges, a young man of Asian descent whose parents died young. Matheson is a 20-year-old second-year student at Gotham University. He is our destined phantom kid. Yes. It was he who sent the teaser letter to the GCPD not long ago. All other villains have all kinds of talented great powers. Why do I only have a thief's superpower? Leaving the police station, Matheson thought, depressedly, as he was walking home. Ever since he has been transmitted to this world ten years ago, he was shocked to find out that this place was called Gotham and there was a super rich man with the surname Wayne. Just when he thought this was the DC Universe, he saw some report that a legendary inventor, Tony Stark, had slept with another magazine celebrity. Good lord, DC is dangerous by itself. You had to add Marvel to it? Thanos dancing with Darkseid? The Infinity Glove versus the Anti-Life Equation? 
I'm afraid Earth is going to be rebooted infinitely. If it was just Marvel, I could bet on the half who survived. Thanos's fingers snap, but with the presence of anti-life equation, only death is expected. After years of observation, Matheson was sure that he lives in a world based on the Marvel Cinematic Universe with some of DC's, all merged in a mess. Only, in this world, there was a Gotham but not a Metropolis, a Batman without a Superman. As for the exact number of other DC heroes who might still be in hiding, Matheson was not sure. Timeline-wise, Gotham here is before the start of Nolan's version of the Dark Knight Rises storyline, and, on the New York side, Stark has just announced himself as Iron Man. The Great War in New York has far-reaching implications, but has little to do with Gotham and may not spill over into Gotham until the Age of Ultron. And so, Matheson has, still, long enough time to develop. Whenever he thought about how dangerous this world was, Matheson sighed that he was in the most miserable transmigrator in history. Everyone is granted some kind of ninjutsu, superpower, immortality, kryptonian blood, alien magic. How about myself? Seriously? A thief system? I admit that being a thief is very pretentious, but what am I to do with it? In this dangerous environment, what's even scarier is that this thief system did not grant him anything other than a newbie pack of smartsy pants skills. At first, there was not even a manual to explain to him how to use his powers, what their potential is, or how to unlock their full mastery. It was up to him to fully discover his skills and it took him 10 years to do so. In the spirit of not wasting his skills, Matheson decided to be bold. Perhaps, his thief system would be completely activated once he becomes a phantom thief. Otherwise, these last few years have been quiet in Gotham, with super criminals, such as the Scarecrow, all in the net, and Batman who retreated into obscurity. Before Bane came to Gotham, there was not anyone in particular who was difficult to deal with, but currently, it is Gordon on his own against the existing villains, consequently, there couldn't have been a better time than now for Phantom Kid to make his move. Three days passed, and it was finally the day Kid had announced. On that day, Gordon and Aaron arrived early at the Gotham City Exhibition Hall with a team of police officers, and were, then, surprised by the overwhelming crowds. What they saw was the exhibition hall gates packed with people, all held back by the dozen police officers who had been placed to guard at the entrance. It was not even yet the time for the museum to open. What the hell is going on here? Why are there so many people coming? Gordon asked, frowning. That, I don't know, sir. Aaron also looked dumbfounded. Although the Adams star is so precious, it usually isn't so attractive to ordinary people. It captivates the attention of an exception from the upper class. At a cursory glance, the entrance was blocked by more than 300 people. And this number is increasing by the second. One should know that it was only 7 in the morning and the exhibition would not start until 2 in the afternoon. The event will last for 24 hours, until 2 in the afternoon of the following day, and it will not close halfway through. Could it be? A possibility suddenly occurred to Gordon. These people couldn't be here for Phantom Kid, could they? How was that possible? The GCPD hadn't announced this to the public, only the exhibition's staff and the police department knew about it. Look, it's him, Gordon. A scream of alarm suddenly came from the crowd, and immediately, Dozens of people pushed out from the crowd and surrounded Gordon and Aaron. The group of people, both men and women, some carrying cameras and others holding microphones, were obviously journalists from the mass media. As soon as they appeared, they began to ask Gordon questions, each with their own. Yet, the stream of questions thrown out didn't shock Gordon. Commissioner Gordon, may I ask if you know the true identity of Phantom Kid? Commissioner Gordon, may I ask if it's true that Phantom Kid is coming to steal Adam's star today? I heard that you made an exception and mobilized a tenth of the GCPD's police force to protect the exhibition hall. As far as I know, the value of the Adam's star does not seem to require such a large mobilization of the police force. The need to mobilize so many police officers against one criminal only occurred eight years ago during the supervillains wave. Do you think that Phantom Kid will be another supervillain in Gotham after eight years? Shut up, 
Gordon yelled. The reporter's mouths were sealed with their eyes glaring at Gordon. Before I can answer your questions, what I need to know is why do you know about Phantom Kid, and why are these civilians gathered here? At his statement, the crowd of journalists looked at Gordon with strange eyes. Don't you know about Kid's letter? Last night, a person from Gotham's downtown found a teaser letter from Phantom Kid the Thief saying that he would take the Stone of Destiny today. The story has already gone viral on the internet. You wouldn't be unaware of it, would you? The journalist who asked the question wore a duck top hat that was pressed down low enough to make his face unreadable. Gordon turned to Aaron. Hey, sir. What are you looking at me for? Everyone knows I'm not good at online socializing or anything. Gordon. Chapter 2, Gordon's Suspicions I don't want to be bothered with some stupid teaser letter circulating on the internet. Aaron, take your men and dismiss this crowd, now. Gordon felt a headache. What the hell was this phantom kid up to? Sending a provocative letter to the police station could be understood as an act of confidence a signal that he was a supremely confident criminal who gave an advance notice to the police just to show off his high IQ. It has been eight years since an incident as bad as this one happened, but inviting the general public to witness him in the course of stealing? That's something even someone as crazy as the Joker wouldn't do. Gordon had a hunch that this thief might be one of the toughest opponents of his career, or, even maybe, the toughest so far. Based on Gordon's past experience, whatever this bandit's purpose behind spreading this news, he must not be allowed to achieve it. And since he wants the hall crowded, Gordon better empty it out. Hey, Commissioner Gordon. You have no right to kick us out. Gotham's exhibition hall is a public place, and we're here for the show. Seeing that Aaron had called hundreds of Gotham police officers behind him and was about to evict these reporters out. The duck-topped reporter immediately shouted, Well, well, what newspaper are you reporting for, and why have I never seen you before? Gordon immediately sealed the duck-topped man's mouth with a sharp gaze that startled him. I'm sorry, sir. You have good knowledge about the current situation. I have to suspect you. Not to mention the fact that your face has been hidden under the brim of your hat from the start. You don't want anyone to see your face, do you? Hey. Commissioner Gordon, are you suspecting that I'm that thief who's not right in the head? After a moment of shock, the duck-topped hat guy snapped back to reality and immediately raised his head, revealing the face of a disheveled young man with stubble. My name is Eddie Brock, I'm not a reporter from Gotham, but from the New York Daily Bugle, and here's my work ID. Eddie pulled out his own credentials and handed them to Gordon and said quickly, I know it doesn't make sense for a New York reporter to show up here, but the truth is I was just here on holiday and happened to learn about this. The Daily Bugle is considered a relatively famous newspaper in the United States, and Gordon took the work permit and saw that it was indeed true, but he still did not rule out the possibility of it being forged. There was also the coincidental holiday that made Gordon even more suspicious of Eddie. Gordon winked at Aaron who instantly complied and called the Daily Bugle to confirm Eddie's story. Soon after, Aaron hung up and nodded to Gordon that what Eddie had said was true. It always felt wrong, but apparently, Eddie's suspicion has been cleared and Gordon had to apologize. Now that the misunderstanding is cleared up, there are a few things I have to say. Eddie was open-minded enough not to countenance what had happened before, but instead showed a keen interest in the incident. Look. Officers, I know that the peace of Gotham has depended on you over the years, and at the same time you would hate nothing more than to see a return to the chaos that existed here eight years ago. So this strange thief, kid, who has come out of nowhere has stirred up some of your memories and made you so anxious that you have to drive these innocent civilians in front of you out of the exhibition hall. Believe me, gentlemen, this decision is not only illegal, but it's even a bit stupid. What do you mean? At that, the grumpy Aaron immediately roared. I don't know for what reason Phantom Kid announced his plans to the public, but I do know one thing, stealing always happens when no one is around, otherwise, it becomes robbery. Gordon got his point across. You mean he did it on purpose, to mislead us? Or else what? Oh yes, it's also possible that the so-called Phantom Kid is just a cover. Such a person might not even exist, it's just a joke. 
Otherwise there's no way to explain something as ridiculous as a thief calling for an audience to watch him stealing. More importantly, the teaser letters have gone viral in Gotham and there will be a steady stream of people coming here. You can't chase everyone away, after all. This fair is accessible to all Gotham citizens, not a specific group of people per se. Gordon nodded, Eddie was right. It was true that he couldn't stop the people from attending the fair, it was just that he still felt that something wasn't right. It was a bizarre instinct and Gordon really was unable to think of anyone who could steal Adam Star from the gazing eyes of countless people in front of him. Even if Kid manages to blend in with the crowd, the amount of people in the hall would block all his possible escape routes, and get captured as a result. The police would simply have to guard all the exits tightly, so even a top thief like Catwoman would never be able to escape. No, there is another possibility. This letter Kid sent may be a plan he faked. He's not stealing anything, his real intention is to gather people in the exhibition hall and carry out a demolition attack on them. That's the kind of crime that fits the people of Gotham. Eddie's heart tightened as he saw that Gordon had been deep in thought. I guess it's true that Jim Gordon is still hesitant to stop people from gathering here when he knows that the exhibition hall will never be closed because of Kid's warning letter. Yes, this Eddie is not Eddie, but Matheson in disguise. Of course, Eddie Brock is a real person, and it's also true that he came to Gotham on holiday and found out about the teaser letter by chance. But the real Eddie is probably still asleep in his own car. A reporter is the perfect identity to be able to ask the police all sorts of questions, including some of their setups, and not be suspected even if they don't get answers. As for why Matheson is spreading his teasing letter, ease of invasion is one reason, but more importantly, wouldn't Phantom Kid's debut be a failure if there was no audience? You're right, Gordon sighed as he watched the number of civilians grow. Aaron, you lead the team and guard the main entrance for me. There is still a long time before the show starts. Don't allow anyone to enter the hall during this time. The only remaining exit from the exhibition hall, besides the main entrance, is a narrow back door, which can be guarded by just two officers. Gordon instructed an experienced veteran officer before shouting at a young officer in the back of the group. Rookie, you follow too. Yes, sir. Matheson glanced at the young officer. The rookie was probably a newcomer to the GCPD. A rookie at this time of year would most likely be John Blake, the future Robin. That's right, including these reporters, no one is allowed to get in. Gordon gave Eddie a deep look, and Matheson saw a bit of doubt in his eyes. Even with the officer's confirmation, Gordon was still unsure. I thought journalists had a lot of power in a free country. But as expected, the police arrangements can't be made public. Matheson wasn't flustered, that was to be expected. After all, being a journalist had allowed him to observe many police officers up close. Gordon ignored the barking journalists and took hundreds of his men into the exhibition hall. Aaron remained at the main entrance with a team of police officers. In addition to the first dozen of security guards, a total of nearly 30 men, all with loaded guns, standing in a line blocking the entrance. No one dared to come forward. At this point, no one noticed that Eddie, the journalist from New York, was missing. Once the entrances and exits had been secured, Gordon led a large force into the exhibition hall and set up a full defense line. John Blake followed his colleague to guard the back door, a dark alleyway as usual which is very Gotham-like, one must say. Chapter 3, Welcome to my performance. Man, the chief is taking this one too seriously. The long wait has been tormenting. After more than an hour, the senior couldn't help but complain to Blake. What kind of thief is this kid, Ha! Huh? I think this is merely a gimmick to tease people. What do you mean? Blake didn't understand what the senior said. Think about it. This jewelry exhibition is being funded by the Wayne family. We all know how reclusive and absurd Master Wayne is now in comparison to his old days. So, I bet that, to advertise the show, it is possible that he'd do something such as forging this weird teasing letter. What good will this bring to him? Blake asked. Whether the gem is actually stolen or used as a cover, Wayne's corporate reputation will be greatly affected. Hey, rookie, one can never guess the ideas of those rich people. The senior police officer chuckled, Oh, I have something urgent. 
I will be back once I solve it. I'll leave it to you here. Although I don't think it is necessary to be so careful. Closing the door with sheer force, the senior entered the exhibition hall through the back door. Waiting is really torturing. The opportunity has finally come. Above the closed roof of the exhibition hall, Matheson stared down at Blake's location, with a grin on his face. Peng. Blake, being only a new police officer, was alert in every task. He never misses any details, although it was a very low volume. He still heard an unusual noise. It was like the sound of an object falling on the ground. The sound came from the corner of the alley and Blake was immediately alarmed. He put his hand on the gun by his belt and walked slowly towards the source of the sound. Blake walked to the corner wall. First, paused for a second. Then, suddenly took out his pistol and aimed. From behind the wall, ready to subdue the suspicious person at any time. Meow. A stray cat jumped past Blake's eyes and the long alley in front of him was empty. Having a sigh of relief, Blake's tense nerves relaxed, and he planned to return to his post. Unexpectedly, as soon as he turned around, he felt a sudden tingling in his neck and gradually blurred his consciousness. Before he plunged into darkness, Blake took a glance at that shocking figure. It was a white outrageous figure, dressed in a snow-white suit with a retro British style, and wearing a white medieval top hat. The monocle with a triangular pendant matched with the backlight, making it impossible to see his face. Only the smirky curvature of the corner of the mouth was visible, giving people an elegant calm temperament. His white cloak was flapping naturally after hitting Blake's neck, giving a dramatic impression, as if he came out of a painting. It's Phantom Kid, Matheson. Matheson stunned Blake, quickly tied him up, and sealed his mouth with tape to prevent him from sabotaging his actions once he is awake. Judging the time that has passed, the old policeman should almost be back. Swiftly, Matheson took out the rope launcher and launched it on the rooftop and then tied the other end of the rope to Blake. Pressing a switch, Blake was dragged to the rooftop. The roof of the exhibition hall can only be reached by one elevator, and the elevator coincidentally broke down a week ago. And, later, due to the appearance of the notice, repairing the elevator has been postponed. On the rooftop, Matheson switched in Blake's police uniform, put on a mask, then stood calmly at the back door. Blake's figure is similar to that of Matheson. In addition, he is a newcomer to the police station. There is no better disguise than him. After a few seconds, the back door was opened again. Hey, rookie, nothing special happened during the time I was away, right? The senior police officer returned to his post and smiled at Matheson, not realizing that the person in front of him was no longer his junior. I thought about what you said before, and I think it makes sense. Matheson smiled back and smoothly adopted the role of a newcomer to the police station. In the past ten years, in order to exercise his ability to control facial expression, one can never guess how many nights Matheson spent with the corners of his mouth twitching, to only be able to execute his current stunt. Sorry, my stomach hurts, I think I am going to use the bathroom, Matheson said, with expressions of pain and discomfort covering his abdomen with both hands in pain. The senior police officer was stunned watching him. Yeah, you go in, I will take care of the watch. With this feedback, Matheson immediately rushed into the exhibition hall. His acting is extremely smooth and natural. This kid should have upset his stomach. I guess he'll have to squat in the toilet for a while now. The senior police officer shook his head and then continued to hold his post boringly. Matheson entered the exhibition hall and sneaked upstairs, avoiding patrol officers. Gotham Exhibition Hall has four floors, the first three floors have seventeen large wings. However, on the fourth floor, there are only five. The gem exhibition is arranged on the fourth floor, and it occupies all five exhibition wings. Wayne Corporate is rich and powerful. It can showcase thousands of valuable gems and Adam Star today. Phantom Kid's target is Adam's star, on display in the middle exhibition hall, on the fourth floor. Gordon has spread his police force. Hundreds of police officers are firmly guarding the elevator entrance and main passage on the fourth floor. There are a lot of people in every exhibition hall, especially the exhibition wing of Adam's star. It was directly surrounded by a large circle of people. Hey, 
It is such a large crowd. I am so valued, although I am just debuting. Should I say that I am flattered, or that Gordon is a good fortune teller? In the ventilation tube on the ceiling, Matheson observed the police positioning and patrol method and studied the plan of action. The Adams Star is vastly covered with bulletproof glass. This is a bit troublesome. I don't have the equipment to break it forcibly. If I try to dismantle it, I won't have time. After taking note of the situation in the exhibition hall, Matheson returned to the back door calmly. There is still a long time. It's the summer of 2010. The moon usually rises round 7 o'clock. And that's when Matheson set himself time to deliver his blow. A bit of time passed, and, soon, it was sunset. Everyone knows that the previewed time of the letter is coming. Will this phantom kid who has never been heard of really appear? At this moment, the gem exhibition site is almost full of tourists, and thousands of Gotham citizens are in high spirits. They have not seen such a big show for a long time, so everyone cherishes this opportunity. It is impossible to steal Adam's star in front of such a huge crowd. Gordon personally stood next to the Adam's star booth and thought to himself, I don't know if these arrangements will make him give up his actions. No, people who dare to release a notice to GCPD will never give up halfway through. Looking out the huge transparent French windows, the setting sun on the horizon is almost invisible, and the night is about to wrap the earth. The previewed time is coming. What will he do? Boom. Gordon had no time to think about what had just happened, because after a sudden explosion, the power supply system of the entire exhibition hall was paralyzed, and the lights went out instantly. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my first performance. As everyone panicked due to the sudden power failure, a loud voice came out. Everyone looked at the place where the sound came from, and then saw the most memorable scene in their life. Only near the floor-to-ceiling window facing the moon, a gorgeous and elegant figure appeared. Looking up, a bright moon was just above him, as if it was rising for this person. Faint moonlight shone through the glass on Matheson's body, allowing everyone present to see him, and it became the focus of the audience in one fell swoop. The white cloak floats up uncontrollably, although his face cannot be seen clearly in the backlight. One can't help but think of what a handsome face is behind the lens. Kid, the Phantom, officially debuted. As stated in the notice, he appeared in the moonlight, and then he is about to take away Adam's star. Chapter 4, Silver Wings in the Moonlight Under that night sky, he appeared quietly and immediately in front of us, his eyes seemed able to detect and pierce everything, showing a bold smile. With a cloak and a top hat, and without any unnecessary movements. His face was covered with a monocle shedding its backlight. Although he cannot be seen clearly, one could notice how surprisingly young he is, maybe in his thirties, twenties, or even younger. It has been many years since Jim Gordon first met Kid. To his shock, he recalled. Is that Phantom Kid? It should be. But why is he wearing white clothes? I don't know. I only know that the clothes are obviously very old-fashioned. Yet, they have an indescribable charm worn by him. He is even more elegant than a British gentleman. Yes, he looks so cool. White is the most eye-catching color in the dark. And, at this time, many people have taken out their mobile phones to turn on their flashlight Shindon Kid. He was the spotlight of the audience. In these circumstances, Kid was hard to be missed out of the sight of the masses. The elegance of this thief is simply humiliating the police, said Gordon, with an extremely ugly expression. At the same time, he seemed insecure and unlumbed. To Gordon's thoughts, this thief kid is no more than an amateur. Everyone, please be quiet. Matheson smiled politely. His voice seemed to have a magical power, and the crowd instantly stopped talking. I believe everyone has guessed who I am. That's right, I am kid. Guilty as charged today. I am here to take away Adam Star. Stop the foolery. A roar interrupted Matheson's speech. Your mockery is over. Phantom Kid, you are under arrest. Gordon took out his pistol and aimed at Matheson and coldly said, This place is surrounded by the police. There is not a single chance to escape. Although you have not yet stolen any gems, spreading misinformation and sabotaging the power supply system through explosions are a crime. I hope you can reflect on the pranks you caused today in jail. Both. 
The police on the scene and the ones hidden in the dark, moved at the same time while pointing their guns at Matheson. Pranks, facing such a dangerous situation, Phantom Kid didn't even flinch. As if all these pistols aimed at him did not exist, he was more interested in Gordon's words. No, 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 I don't have the habit of making pranks nor telling jokes. More importantly, who said that I didn't steal Adam's star? You are making fun of the police. Are you even aware of the consequences? Aaron Cash's forehead burst with blue veins, and he couldn't at all wait to shoot the guy who dared to despise the police in front of everyone. Don't be impulsive, Aaron. Gordon patted Aaron on the shoulder, staring at Matheson calmly. Well, I believe you came for Adam's star, but it's a pity that it is now lying peacefully in the bulletproof glass behind me. There isn't a chance you could lay your hand on it. Really, are you sure? Matheson asked rhetorically, with a mocking curve at the corner of his lips. Hearing these words, Gordon's pupils shrank, and immediately, as he looked back at the glass cover, his face changed drastically. Adam's star, which was there a second ago, is gone. Chief Gordon, are you looking for this? Matheson raised his right hand and snapped his fingers. There was a huge sapphire in his hand, almost as big as his palm. It was obvious that it was Adam's star, from the starlight sapphire's unique six-star line pattern. He really stole the Adam star. When? It's amazing. It's like magic. No, it's purely magic. How did he do it? Since the lights went out until his appearance, only ten seconds at most have passed. The bulletproof glass cover is also intact. How is this possible? Gordon looked at Adam's star in Matheson's hand in disbelief. Could it be that he has some sort of superpowers? During this period, the New York War had not yet started, and there was no news of Superman. The existence of superhumans was still out of the public's sight. Batman and many criminals, whom Gordon knew well, had no supernatural abilities, so he was naturally shocked by such a suspicious act. The act of stealing gems through objects. I should have left after I got the gem, but this is my first performance. I can't bear to step down too quickly. It's a pity that the police officers don't seem to want this stage to continue. At this time, Matheson is like a magician who is unwilling to leave the stage, yet has to step down as soon as possible. He has no choice but to say goodbye to the audience. However, before I leave, I want to give you a small gift. Due to my time restrictions, I have not prepared enough. I hope none of you will dislike it. Now, everyone here, please, close your eyes. The young ladies closed their eyes obediently. In addition to most of the young people who were impressed by the thief's charm, only the police kept staring at him intently, and a small part of the audience, who wanted to see what tricks Phantom Kid would do. Matheson slowly raised his left hand and snapped his fingers again. At the same time, his right hand moved down a little, gradually, and a small sphere slipped down. What? Everyone who had their eyes open yelled out, almost at the same time, because a strong light pierced their eyes. Damn it. It's a flashbang. There are too many civilians here. Don't shoot relentlessly. There is no need to panic. Gordon shouted, quickly covering his eyes with his arms. He moved slightly faster than the others, but was still blinded. Boom. Suddenly, there was a sound of broken glass. Although Gordon himself ordered the police officers to cease fire, he followed his instinct and fired a shot in the direction of the sound. Due to his experience, Gordon could swear that he heard the sound of a bullet penetrating flesh, but he was not sure which part of the body the bullet had exactly damaged. Uh, sir, I was shot. Can you cover me? Wait. Why is this Aaron's voice? Flashbangs in reality are not like the ones in games that can only blind for a few seconds. Powerful ones can even cause permanent blindness. Even if you immediately cover your eyes, as a result, one's eyes will take tens of seconds to recover. The power of the flashbang made by Matheson was not so powerful, its effect disappeared in about 20 seconds. At this time, Gordon happened to look at the French window where Phantom Kid was standing before. It was broken, and a blast of wind was blowing in from the outside. Aaron fell by the window with one bloody right thigh. Aaron, how could it be you? How could you be there? Gordon never expected that he would hit his subordinates. A feeling of guilt penetrated his heart. I heard the sound of the window being broken, and, impulsive, 
ran towards it. I didn't expect to be shot by the thief. Aaron smiled bitterly, Sir, I'm so useless. For an instant, a confused expression wore Gordon's face. Aaron. It was actually me. When Gordon was about to tell Aaron the truth, Aaron suddenly struggled. This is not the time to stay here, Chief. Go after the thief kid. This reply immediately released Gordon from his guilt. He immediately walked to the window and looked down, but he saw nothing, not even any traces of ropes or cranes. Look up, sir. Gordon looked up, and he saw a white figure in the sky far away. Who else could be except Phantom Kid? As for how he flew, how could Gordon be unfamiliar with that device? Hang gliding, the end is even equipped with a propeller to stabilize the flight. More importantly, just like Phantom Kid's costume, the hang gliding wing is also white as if it is to enable the police to see him more clearly. This is obvious mockery. Chapter 5, Wanted Order Number 1412. No, today's wind is very weak, and it is not enough to support a long gliding. That direction is Dot Splendid River, Phantom Kid. I have to say that you are really good, but you miscalculated the weather. Gordon's eyes were firm. He ordered all the police, everyone, head to Splendid River to hunt down Phantom Kid. Quick, Aaron, you are injured, just wait here for the ambulance. Meanwhile, you can help with the evacuation of the crowd. Oh, sir. By the way, what did you want to say just now, Gordon? It's nothing. Gordon led most of the police as he rushed out of the exhibition hall to pursue Phantom Kid. Only three or five police officers remained to maintain order and evict the people. In fact, there was no need to maintain any order because no one was hurt in any way except Aaron. By this time, the audience at the exhibition has now completely recovered. Something is not right, didn't he mention that he will be giving us a gift? Since it is our first meeting, how is a flashbang a gift? At this moment, a young girl suddenly wondered. No way. You trust what that thief said? I guess that he only mentioned the gift to trick us into closing our eyes. On her side, a boy who seemed to be the girl's boyfriend appeared shocked. He turned to the girl and attempted to grab her head. However, his hand stopped in the air, as if it had been petrified. Toby, what's the matter with you? You dot on your head. The girl was so frightened by his facial expression, she carefully stretched her hand to her head and touched a long, thin object. She took it off and glimpsed at it. The two of them suddenly widened their eyes. It is actually a rose. There was also a note on it that rose. Beautiful lady, this rose is my gift. I hope you will like it, and I sincerely hope that you can come to watch my performance in the future. Phantom Kid. The girl read word by word, with an expression of excitement on her face, and nodded vigorously after reading, indicating that she would not miss such a show. At the same moment. Any woman who closed her eyes found a red rose pinned on her head, while men found a blue rose pinned on their chest. The content on the note is exactly the same. This is amazing. How did he do it? I don't know. Everyone is asking the same question. Phantom Kid is so handsome, I have fallen in love with him. The little girls have been swarmed with romantic ideas. They are impressed by Phantom Kid and have already become his fans. After a while, people left in joy. As for the stolen Adam star, no one cared about it. Why haven't the ambulance come yet? Aaron limped on one leg, stood up slowly, and asked the remaining police officers. Hey, sir. I think you'd better not move, a young guy advised. I think that something is wrong. Aaron turned a deaf ear to the boy's advice, and murmured instead. What do you mean, sir? Another police officer also asked. Remember? From the moment of the explosion and the power failure until Phantom Kid's appearance, no more than ten seconds have passed. Everyone nodded. Ten seconds? You must know that the unbreakable bulletproof glass that protects Adam Star is one of the latest products of Wayne Enterprise. It is impossible to break it without professional cutting tools or, at least, blasting it. And, to imagine someone cracking this thick glass in under ten seconds, that is unthinkable. Not to mention that he didn't even break the protective glass. Instead, he took the gem, as it appeared out of thin air in his hand. And, again, in only ten seconds, around one thousand people possessed flowers, pinned on them and on the top of their heads. Now, you tell me, how the hell did this happen? Aaron exploded with an aggressive tone. 
The officers looked at each other as if they were looking for someone who could answer this question. Listen, I don't believe that Phantom Kid can perform any actual magic. Maybe he is a clever magician who tricked us with these obscure illusions. Aaron screamed, and the most suspicious thing is the bulletproof glass cover. He went closer to the glass cover little by little, leaned down, and looked at the almost transparent cover. There was nothing inside. Aaron reached out and knocked on the glass cover. A crisp sound emerged and his face changed as he began to knock around the glass surface. His face started getting uglier. The current Aaron does not seem to be as grumpy as he has always been. The guy who just advised him not to move, said strangely, Huh, I see you have been in the GCPD for less than two years. I don't know whether you know this, but Aaron was Gordon's comrade, they both served at the same time. Hence, Aaron was a senior police inspector ten years ago. He may seem usually grumpy, but he is actually shrewd. Hum, I see. Several people stood there in a daze. Watching Aaron knocking on the glass cover, after a while, Aaron said with a solemn expression, Sure enough, the glass cover was replaced. Aaron picked up the bulletproof glass cover with both hands, lifted the cover from the booth, effortlessly. This meant that Phantom Kid could easily open the glass cover and steal the gem. Damn it, when did he change it? No. The more important thing is that since he can change the glass cover, why not just steal the gem? Rather, wait until now. Who knows? Maybe he just wants to humiliate the police. The mystery has been solved but generated a more mysterious case. On Gordon's side, near the splendid river, as he expected, the weather tonight was not suitable for long gliding. The closer Kid gets to the splendid river, the closer he also is to the ground, until he plopped and fell right into the river. A large number of police forces were docked on both sides of the splendid river. The rescue team had already descended to the river, where it was difficult for Phantom Kid to fly his wings. Right at this moment, Gordon murmured Kid, Making such a lowly mistake, Commissioner. We caught Phantom Kid. He seems to have passed out. The rescue team shouted, while they were dragging the human body to the shore. Gordon looked intently and found that it was indeed the white suit of the thief. Commissioner, you, come over and take a look, it is Phantom Kid. Another one shouted, but compared to the cheerful shout before, the current shout held confusion and horror. Gordon frowned and ran over to see Phantom Kid's face, causing his subordinates terror. What, Aaron? How could it be you? The familiar words came out of Gordon's mouth, but Aaron, who was in a coma, couldn't answer him anymore. Commissioner, he is merely in a coma. His life is not in danger. This is bad. Everyone, go back to the exhibition hall. If this is Aaron, then, who is the Aaron who fell on the ground after being shot? Gordon hurried back to the exhibition hall, but he found no one but the police he left behind. Where did Aaron go? Chief, he just got in an ambulance and left. Was he alone? Yes, Aaron wanted us to stay here. He said that you will be back soon, so we should wait for your instructions. I didn't expect Aaron to betray me. Gordon held his forehead and looked at the removed bulletproof glass cover. He understood everything. Now, immediately release a search warrant for Phantom Kid. Code.1412. Chapter 6, Encountering Catwoman Halfway. On an empty street late at night, a middle-aged man in a police uniform walked slowly, with a cheerful face, then turned into an alley. Your Excellency, after following me for so long, it's time to show up. Confirming that there are no monitors in the alley, Matheson stopped. A rustling sound emerged, and Matheson turned round with a calm expression. A tall and hot woman in black tights appeared in the alley. Catwoman? Matheson noticed that the woman was wearing a mask with cat ears on, only the lower half of her face was exposed. He suddenly guessed her identity. Catwoman, Selina Kyle. You are a female thief, yet you dare to follow the police. Are you trying to get caught? Matheson gestured to pull out his pistol. You already said I was a thief, aren't you, poor phantom kid? Selina had a cold expression. Interesting. How did you see through my disguise? I think the disguise is good enough, plus, it is impossible that you are very familiar with Aaron Cash, however, you still saw the minor differences. <laughs> Matheson smiled slightly, now that he is exposed, he faced her openly. 
he stretched out his hand to grab the collar of the police uniform and pulled it down, the entire police uniform was magically stripped off and immediately replaced, with his white cloak dancing in the wind. Wow, you are really quick at changing your clothes. Among all the men I have seen, you are the fastest. You also dare to steal things in such an eye-catching outfit. I really don't know if you are brave or stupid, Catwoman said, sarcastically. Phantom Kid, your disguise is really vivid. I can't see any flaws. I just happened to see someone knock that stupid old policeman unconscious and send him to the sky with those white wings. Matheson realized, it seems that there is more than one person interested in Adam's star. Only because the notice letter caused the police to pay special attention to it, it was difficult for Selina to get close to the exhibition hall. Maybe she wanted to see how the phantom kid, who had disturbed her, steals gems from such a herd of police officers, or she wanted to pick the gem from his own hands. All in all, Catwoman did not give up on Adam Starr. She has been monitoring the situation in the exhibition hall from a distance until she happened to see the scene of Aaron being knocked out. As long as it is not a mistake in his disguise. Matheson is relieved. I don't know why you wanted to steal that gem, but, unfortunately, my employer specified that he wants to get it, so, you better give it to me willingly. Oh, beautiful lady, if I heard you right, you want this? Matheson took out Adam's star that was in front of Gordon. I'm surprised by your cooperation. But do you think I am blind? I don't want this broken stone. I want the real thing hiding in your sleeves. I'm sorry, Miss Kyle. Although I am willing to dedicate everything to a beauty like yourself. Adam Starr is not among the list. Matheson threw away the fake Adam Starr in his hand and then spread his arms out. It seems that speech won't be enough for you to give me the gem. And, I'm the same. No one will give up $170 million just like that, right? Selina tilted her neck and said rhetorically, he he, that's not necessarily true. Matheson and Selina looked at each other and the atmosphere instantly became serious. You are such a gentleman. I don't think you would beat a woman, would you? Halfway through her words, Selina stretched out her hand to her waist without warning, quickly drew a pistol, and instantly pulled the trigger. At such a close distance, Selina was confident that she could hit the opponent even with her eyes closed. However, just as Selina pulled the trigger, a playing card hit her wrist at a strange angle. Miss Kyle, your sneaky attack was a bit too much, don't you think? Selina never imagined that a playing card would be so powerful. Not only did her hand holding the gun deviate from its position, but even dropped the pistol under the pain. At the same time, Matheson approached Selina at an astonishing speed, and a hand knife slashed at her neck. Catwoman deserves to be Gotham's most brilliant thief. The flexibility and agility of her body are really not much different from that of a cat. No matter how difficult the posture could be for humans, she can fluidly do it. Selina relied on the weak impact of a playing card hitting the wrist, took off on the spot, and side somersaulted. The overall center of her gravity tilted to the right. When her body rotated to 180 degrees, Selina's head was almost against the ground and her legs were slightly raised, clamping Matheson's neck. Selina's leg hooked Matheson's shoulders for a second time. She took the next step, and Matheson fell down, while Catwoman just finished her somersault and squatted on the ground, with her right knee resting on Matheson's chest. It's complicated to describe, but, in fact, the whole action was perfected in only one second. Wow, Miss Kyle, you were so elegant just now. I think I can't help but be fascinated by you. Although it seems that Matheson was subdued by Selina, he still maintains his humorous attitude. Selina was surprised, she had never seen such a man. It's just a pity that you don't wear a skirt but tights. Matheson's angle of view just happened to be able to see a hidden part along Selina's thigh. Hearing this, Selina was very audacious, not as shy as ordinary women. That's really a misfortune but you will never see the bottom of my skirt. Selina put her hand into Matheson's chest and took out another Adam's star. Phantom Kid, your skill is really bad. You are not suitable to be a thief. You better go to the circus, maybe, there, you can make some money. After confirming that it is real, Selina nodded in satisfaction, stuffed the gem in her cleavage, and then kindly advised Matheson. At eleven o'clock, 
The sniper on the building, 500 meters away, is also under your employer. And he is not here to help you. Selena's face froze. When did you detect that person? How did you know that he is not teaming with me? Matheson didn't answer Selena's question directly, nor did he intend to get up. The location of the sniper. Location? If you take this alley as the center, the sniper will cover three quarters of this area from the place where he is. But there are always dead ends. Doesn't this give me a chance to escape? This is obviously impossible, so I guess that this escape route was not for me, but for you, Miss Kyle. You are worried that you will be killed by the sniper, so you specifically ask them to leave some dead corners for you. Otherwise you will not help them steal the gem, because, once you are exposed to the snipe's lens, you will lose your life, am I right? It is obviously a question. But Matheson said in an affirmative tone. Selena was shocked that Matheson figured out the plan correctly. Don't you really think I only have these two things, do you? Matheson suddenly grabbed Selena's hand with full dexterity. Catwoman's entire body leaned forward unconsciously. She wanted to pull away. Only then did she find out that Matheson's strength was far greater than that of a male of the same size. She couldn't break free. Hence, she was pushed to the ground. Phantom Kid's motor nerves are abnormally strong, not inferior to those of Catwoman's. With a swift movement from Matheson's body, the two opponents swapped their positions. Matheson was, now, on top of Selina. Chapter 7, Red Magic. Actually, I have always wanted to see with my own eyes what Catwoman, who's been wanted by the police for so long, really looks like. After all, you really are my senior. Matheson suddenly became curious and took off Catwoman's mask, revealing a moving face that looked very similar to a certain Hollywood actress in Matheson's previous life. It's a shame for a woman as beautiful as you to be a thief, Miss Kyle. Matheson returned her original words to her. I can't tell you are stingy. Selena curled her lips. She wasn't worried that Phantom Kid would hurt her. After all, she didn't feel any hostility. It's getting late. Miss Kyle, I will ask you one last question, who is your employer? Well, you know, even in our business line, we have our own principles, such as never discussing information about our clients. Selena turned her face to the other side facing away from Matheson, not allowing him to stare into her eyes all the time. Well, it looks like you are a principled thief. Then, do you know Bane? Matheson asked suddenly. Who is Bane? Selina was puzzled by Matheson's sudden inquiry. She knew most of the wealthy people in Gotham City and was employed by them many times. This is precisely why her name is on the wanted list, yet she has not been caught by GCPD. However, she had never heard of the name Bane and had no idea what Matheson was asking about. This expression and reaction. She isn't lying. While the expression on Matheson's face hasn't changed, deep down he pondered, which means it's still quite a while before Bane shows up. But not too long. Eight years ago, the Joker prosecuted Harvey Dent into the abyss of revenge. He was a bloody criminal with a sense of justice. However, Gotham could not accept the decay of their justice knight, Harvey Dent, especially since he was seen as the savior of Gotham at the time. He strongly advocated the implementation of a Dent Act to effectively fight criminals. Once Harvey Dent's image will collapse, the Dent Act will completely lose its effectiveness among Gotham citizens. The GCPD that finally had the chance to clean the mess caused by Gotham's criminals will never allow this situation to occur, so the police hid the truth about Harvey Dent's death, falsely claiming that Batman had killed Harvey and associated some crimes committed by Harvey to Batman, and thus, the Dent Act became unbreakable due to Harvey's heroic sacrifice, while Batman disappeared. From that point, Gotham remained in a state of peace for eight years, thanks to Dent's act of course. Although black markets trading couldn't have been completely stopped, it has changed from being rampant in the open to being hidden in the shadows. Gotham went from being the city with the highest crime rate in the United States to a city with a medium crime rate, an improvement beyond belief. That is, until Bane had descended on Gotham, revealed the truth about everything, and almost led Gotham to its downfall. This whole event happened exactly eight years after Harvey's death. This year, 
except that Matheson doesn't remember exactly when. Matheson recalled that the prelude to Bane's coming was when he hired Catwoman to go to Wayne Manor to obtain Bruce Wayne's fingerprints and use it to transfer Bruce's shares on the stock exchange. And now Catwoman says that she doesn't know Bane, which proves that Bane hasn't expanded his operations in Gotham, but it is estimated that he will reach for Serena soon. There were definitely a handful of rich people who wanted Adam's star, but Matheson didn't care enough. It looks like I guessed wrong, Miss Kyle, then. It's time to say goodbye. Matheson grabbed the cloak with his hand, flicking it, covering his body completely, and moving frighteningly fast. By the time the cloak fell naturally, the figure of Phantom Kid had already disappeared. At this time, Selina hadn't even recovered. Wait. Didn't he take Adam's star? Selina's heart was puzzled. Was it because the place where she had put Adam's star was so sensitive that Phantom Kid had not taken it back out of some kind of gentlemanly manner? Although she couldn't see his face, it seemed that Phantom Kid was very young. So if you think about it, he could be a young bird who had never seen a woman. Selina thought in her mind. Hesitatingly, she put her hand in her cleavage and took out Adam's star to examine it. Damn. This is a fake. But when did he swap it? Why didn't I feel anything? On the other hand, Matheson went around a dozen blocks haphazardly and changed disguises three or five times before returning home in his original form. In the world of American comics, even the cinematic universe is not to be taken lightly. As soon as he arrived home, Matheson quickly locked the doors and windows, then went into his bedroom and opened his system with great anticipation. Immediately, his personal panel appeared and a faint look of disappointment flashed across Matheson's eyes. Host, Matheson Feng. Age, 20. Identity, Phantom Kid. Items, Phantom Kid's complete skills, magic mastery, small tech prop manufacturing book, a panel with poor content, no beep, no instructions, no complex roulettes to claim prizes, not even any tasks. The system had been like this since he had crossed over ten years ago, and Matheson had long since gotten used to it. When the system was first bound, he had imagined that it would tell him a marvelous story. It might be some kind of technological crystallization of a high civilization or a game to please some supreme being, however, it remained unchangeably static. Ever since, he had thought that he would have to wait until he became the Phantom Kid to activate the system. But nothing really happened. Over time, Matheson grew up, but the system remained the same. But wait. Suddenly, Matheson noticed that something had changed in the system panel. In the top right corner of the host section, there was a very small exclamation mark that could easily be missed without close observation. When the exclamation mark was clicked, the panel instantly became transparent and a new panel popped up. Target stolen, Adam Star, treasure value. C. Difficulty. Easy. Magnificence grade. B. Special note. Making more than 10 people feel shocked is grade D. More than a hundred is grade C. More than a thousand is grade B. More than 10,000 is grade A. More than a hundred thousand is grade S. Final evaluation. B. Reward. Encyclopedia of Red Magic. It seems that as long as you steal treasures, you can get rewards. Do you want to claim the reward? That was no need to ask, and Matheson clicked yes without hesitation. A thick and ancient book appeared in Matheson's hand, the cover covered with weird and mysterious patterns. This book of red magic came from the world of magic Kaito. It is the magic of Akako Koizumi's family. Its main function is to temporarily control human emotions and actions. Other types of magic are also available, but in small quantities. In the duel with Kid, it also showed similar effects to freezing time and space. So it's not as if red magic itself is weak. And really, at a B-level evaluation, there shouldn't be any red magic rewards, even at A-level or even S-level. It is uncommon. However, the limitations of red magic are equally great. For example, you will lose magic power when you shed tears. The highest level of magic can only be used when it's full moon. Offensive magic is rare, etc. Which lowers the evaluation of red magic in the system. Open the magic book, and you will see packed spells covering the pages of the book. There are countless strange and puzzling patterns, and the text on the book is different from any known language on earth. Fortunately, 
The system had been kind enough to imbue Matheson with the words and language associated with the spell book, otherwise, it would have taken Matheson a lifetime just to translate the contents. Of course, learning how to use these spells and cultivate magic power is still something that Matheson has to figure out for himself. Chapter 8, not 1412, but kid. Hey! Did you guys hear about this? What did you hear? Oh, I see, you're talking about number 1412. That's right, that thief, 1412, he is so handsome. Yes, I heard that he can change into someone else's appearance at will. In addition, that he can do magic. That's right, he can even fly. Oh, my, so cool. You all got it wrong. In the classroom, three young students are discussing the most trendy criminal, thief number 1412. The name is spread because Gordon's wanted order code is 1412. The heist of Adam Star in Gotham is a timely event. It spread all over the streets overnight. Phantom Kid became one of the most talked about subjects among Gotham citizens. However, just as these students were talking about it, a divergent voice emerged from a girl with brown red hair. He is not Thief 1412, his real name is Kid Phantom Kid. Next, the girl snorted coldly, bypassed the classmates and sat in the last row of the classroom. She took out her laptop from her bag and then started typing on the keyboard quickly. No one knew what she was doing. She's such a freak. She sits all by herself in the last row in every class. She never participates in any parties, and she only works with her computer all day long. Don't say that, Barbara is the number one computer genius in the school. It's not surprising that she has a strange personality. Moreover, she is not alone. After Barbara walked away, several people began to whisper again. Hey, guys, it's not a good idea to speak in an ill manner of people behind their backs. At this moment, Matheson appeared suddenly and said with a smile on his face. Look, who is this here? It turned out to be Matheson Fang. The boy who said Barbara was a freak cried strangely. I have to admit that I was wrong before. Barbara is not alone. After all, she still has you as a knight to accompany her. Enough, Kemper. I'm not a knight. I'm just a magician. Yes, you are Matheson. Of course, you're a magician. Matheson stared into Kemper's eyes for a long time. Well, I give up. Man, don't stare at me with that kind of eyes. I apologize. I shouldn't have said that Barbara is a freak. Anything else? Actually, yes. Kemper is stunned. What else? Remember this for me. It's Phantom Kid, not Thief 1412. After leaving these words, Matheson left calmly and sat next to Barbara. Do you think there is something wrong with the two of them? Why are they so obsessed with Kid? It is clearly written in a newspaper that the thief is number 1412. Who knows? Do you think that Phantom Kid is cool, too? As soon as Matheson sat down, he heard Barbara's voice. From all the video data, we can see that the Phantom Kid has a lot of magic skills. It must be that you like him very much. Barbara took it for granted. At this time, Matheson noticed that the scene of Phantom stealing Adam Star had been playing on Barbara's computer. There were a lot of reporters at the time. They were all present to film Phantom Kid's first show. Yet, during the whole process, almost all of these videos were confiscated and blocked by the police. Only two or three pictures were circulating. Barbara's full name is Barbara Gordon. Jim Gordon is her father. According to the plot, in the near future, Barbara will go to New York to study for a while, and then return to Gotham to become finally Batwoman and Oracle. Coincidentally, Matheson's home happened to be on the same street as Gordon's home. They often played together since they were young, so Barbara and Matheson are actually childhood friends who grew up together. After Matheson transmigrated, his parents died prematurely, he hadn't even seen them, he still needed normal school life. He could only do magic openly in the public. His ability to disguise and practice other Phantom Kid's skills were kept as a secret. So anyone who knows Matheson thinks that he is just a magic enthusiast. Barbara has a miraculous talent for hacking. She had been extremely good at computers since she was a child, and has now long surpassed her computer professor by a huge chasm of mastery. So much that not even the GCPD's web security wasn't enough to stop her from hacking into it. 
I didn't really pay much attention to Phantom Kid, so I didn't really know that he is a master magician. That's right, after all. We both know you can't hack into the GCPD database. Matheson wiped the non-existent cold sweat from his forehead and said, Is it really a good idea that you keep hacking into the police database? If your dad finds out about this, do you believe he'll actually arrest you and put you in jail? You seem to care a lot about this phantom kid. I've never seen you this attached to a criminal before. It's not like you've been affected by someone's charm, is it? Matheson asked with a smug look on his face. Suddenly, Barbara twisted her head to gaze at Matheson and said, Matheson, I feel that this phantom kid is very strange. Strange? Well, he gives me a very familiar feeling, as if I've seen him somewhere. But I'm pretty sure I don't remember anyone like him. All these words have instantly shaken the heart of Matheson. After learning how to obtain the system reward, he was not in fear that his identity might be exposed. But, right now, his power is too weak, not much stronger than an ordinary person, it is best for him to just ignore it all for now. Such situations are better to wait until he becomes skilled in red magic before he could really ignore ordinary police and military. And it wouldn't matter if he would be recognized then. You're probably overthinking it, despite the emotional roller coaster he is going through. Matheson still kept his poker face on. His expression hasn't changed much from the beginning to the end. He he, that's true. Suddenly Barbara laughed in a goofy manner, as if she has just remembered something funny. You wouldn't believe it. There were times where I even wondered whether Phantom Kid could be you. Then, I thought about you often enjoying peeking at girls in the shower and stuffing women's lockers with toy snakes. I say to myself, how could even you possibly be that classy and elegant gentleman thief when you are always this mischievous? Barbara covered her mouth and laughed, as she started remembering all the times Matheson's caused such troubles. Barbara, that was years ago. Don't go too far. Matheson couldn't help to face the embarrassment especially as he felt the eyes in the classroom staring at him at the same time. As for peeking at a girl's locker room, that was to observe the details of females' physiology for possible cross-dressing disguises later. As for stuffing toy snakes, it was to exercise his lock-picking skills. If he hadn't put anything there, he would have been treated like a pervert, but since he did so, People thought he was playing pranks. He did many many other things to hone his thief skills. Matheson was incapable of saying anything. Before he met Barbara, his impression of the Oracle was that she was very knowledgeable and cool. In reality, she is knowledgeable, but only in front of her computer, and, most of the time, she is a rebellious and sarcastic person. Just as Matheson was trying to clarify himself, the lecturer entered the room, and everyone stopped talking. Chapter 9, The Second Notice Wayne Manor, the place where the richest man in Gotham lives. Its owner has once been a super playboy whom everyone knows, identically the same as Stark in New York City. Strangely enough, eight years ago, the super rich man disappeared from the public. No one even knows for sure if he is dead or alive, and if it weren't for the announcement that Bruce Wayne had been missing for seven years in the past, I am afraid that people would have already held his funeral, with his corpse missing. Only one person knows what caused Bruce to become like this, and only one person knows that he was not a playboy, but Batman who protected Gotham. Master Wayne, are you in room? In a huge and luxurious manner, a grey-haired old man dressed as a butler walked to a bedroom with a meal in his hand and shouted. Master Wayne, you haven't eaten for several days again. With all due respect, people shouldn't destroy themselves. The body is what makes one human. There was no response after several attempts of persuasion. Not even a hint of a sound came out. The old man looked puzzled and put his ear on the door to listen. He confirmed that no one was even inside the bedroom. But it was clear that Bruce could never get out of his bedroom at this time, which means that the old butler Alfred's face flushed with excitement at the thought, and he hurriedly took out the only spare key he had and unlocked the door. As expected, there was no one inside. A smile appeared on Alfred's face as he went to the piano and played it seemingly in a casual manner, and the wall in front of him opened automatically to reveal the elevator behind it. It was the elevator to the underground Bat Cave. Master Wayne, it's been too long since you've been down here. 
Alfred walked into the Batcave to see a ragged bearded Bruce, watching a video in front of the Bat computer of none other than Phantom Kid's crime. Alfred, Adam's star has been stolen. Yes, sir, everyone knows about Phantom Kid now, except that I'm surprised you actually are paying attention to these things. I really don't want to concern myself with that, but Adam's star is different. Bruce's face showed a hint of determination for the first time in a long time. It is a gem that my father personally bought back in the days, and although it does not count as my father's legacy, I cannot let it be stolen just like that. So, is he coming back? Alfred suddenly asked. Bruce kept quiet for a long period of time. No. At Gotham University, Matheson remained until the end of class, which was just about the end of the day. During the whole class, Matheson noticed that Barbara hadn't taken her eyes off her laptop screen. When the bell rang after class, she picked up the computer and ran out of the classroom aimlessly. I wonder what her reaction would be if she finds out that I am Phantom Kid. Matheson thought with amusement, it's time to send the second notice letter. As for his target, Matheson looked at the news report on his phone that John Daggett, a veteran director of Wayne Enterprises, had acquired the Cat's Eye Emerald, a priceless gem and smiled in mystery. It has been a week since Adam Starr was stolen, and even though Phantom Kid was still the man of the hour, he will soon be forgotten if his face kept hidden for too long. The feeling of the limelight as a thief is really addictive, especially that feeling of ignoring the law and easily manipulating a crowd to one's own will. Only those who have experienced it once will understand. Not to mention the fact that the only way to get more system rewards is to steal treasures, and maybe the more precious the treasure is, the harder it is to steal, and the better the rewards will be. In the future, there may be many chances of claiming rewards. Thinking about it, if one day Matheson was strong enough, he would be able to sneak into Asgard and steal Gungner and the Infinity Gauntlet from Thanos' hands, but it will take an extensive amount of time to do this. Walking out of the school, Matheson ran into an empty alley, disguised as a middle-aged white-collar worker with a common face, and then headed for the GCPD. Inside the Gotham City Police Department, in the Commissioner's office, Gordon was pondering with his eyes closed. The sudden appearance of Phantom Kid had left him in an irritable mood. A week ago, he mobilized all the police forces to search the entire city. However, he couldn't even find any faintest sign of Phantom Kid, whose age and appearance are unknown. That night, the scene in which Phantom Kid pretended to be Aaron lingered in Gordon's heart. No matter how he thought about it, he couldn't believe that Aaron was fake. There are no flaws in his appearance, voice, or manner of speaking. Phantom Kid's disguise skills really shocked Gordon and made him feel anxious. Sir, you have been sitting in your office since last night. Your body will not be able to hold up if you continue this way. Aaron walked into Gordon's office with a pot of coffee an act that he shouldn't be doing, but anyone else would have been dismissed straight away as soon as they walk into his office. Aaron, I'm just thinking about things. Phantom Kid? That's right. Sorry, sir, there's something I have to tell you. Kid is certainly troublesome, but he's not nearly as dangerous as the criminals of the past. After all, he's just a thief, not a terrorist. No, Aaron, it is not Phantom Kid himself that worries me. Gordon shook his head. What I'm worried about is when Phantom Kid keeps trampling on the law, playing the police like fools, and even exposing it all to the public. How many people do you think will start imitating him? Once the number of people who no longer respect the law grows, a terrible storm will be triggered. This is what Gordon was really worried about. Phantom Kid is very different from other criminals. He would not hide his criminal actions. Instead, he would make it public and let the crowd see for themselves how easily he escaped from the police siege. After a while, people will question the police's ability to enforce the law. Their incompetence will take hold and Gotham will be flooded with crimes. All the gangs that have been pinned down by Gordon for eight years will no longer repress themselves and there may be riots on a larger scale than before. Hence, Phantom Kid is the only criminal who is to be arrested at all costs urgently. Sir, Aaron didn't know what to say. In his opinion, Gordon's description was too serious. But seeing the heavy look on Gordon's face, he kept his mouth shut. I've put the coffee on the desk, old champ. 
I don't suppose I need to pour it for you. Aaron placed the coffee pot on the desk and exited the door when he saw Gordon nod. After a while, Gordon felt a surge of tiredness and thought that he is indeed getting old. A decade ago he could have stayed up for days and nights. Now he could barely last a night. He got up and poured himself a cup of coffee. However the moment he picked the pot up, Gordon froze, staring dead at the table. He saw a white guard lying there quietly. A clear cartoon head came into view. Sir, you have been. At that moment, the office door was opened again and a man with a coffee pot walked in, and sure enough, it was Aaron Cash again. Gordon quickly stepped forward, grabbed the coffee pot in one hand, and then grabbed Aaron's face tightly. Hey, hey, Jim, what are you doing? I'm not into this. Gordon stopped and walked back to the desk without saying a word. His anger burning. Phantom Kid can come in and out of the GCPD freely, just like coming into his own house. This is a striking shame. Taking a deep breath, Gordon calmed himself down, knowing there was no point in going after him now. He picked up the card and examined it carefully. After reading the contents of the notice letter, Gordon's pupils shrank instantly. Chapter 10 The Iceberg Restaurant The Fickle Brothers are going to the end. By this time, the Twelve Trials had reached their second, when Celine cannot look far enough to see Helios. I shall listen to the call of the waves and come to snatch the cat's eye. See you soon, Phantom Kid. Looking at the notice letter, Gordon read it word by word. Uh, if I'm right, you're writing a poem? Aaron asked with an odd look on his face. What is the deal with this letter? It's a new notice letter from Phantom Kid. Gordon was deep in thought. It was clear from the content of the last notice letter that Phantom Kid was a man who liked to bite more than he could chew, only this one was more enigmatic than the first one, which was written in a direct manner. It's understandable, after all, no one would take him seriously if his first notice letter was so fancy. Who are the fickle brothers? What do the twelve trials refer to? What does he mean by Selene and Helios? Is this from Greek mythology? Could waves be a reference to the waves of the sea? For a moment, Gordon felt dizziness in his head, remembering a certain criminal from the past who also enjoyed playing these puzzle games. Unfortunately, the person who had managed to solve the puzzle every time was now gone, which meant he was left to solve them on his own. The only certain thing was that in the last sentence, the cat's eyes referred to the target of Phantom Kid, the cat's eye emerald of recent fame. Aaron. Call Mr. John Daggett, now, and ask him if he's received a similar notice letter. Thinking of this emerald, Gordon immediately shouted at Aaron. I don't think that's necessary now. At that moment, another voice broke into the conversation. It was Blake, pushing his way through the door and saying in a deep voice, Mr. Daggett has just called the police, claiming that he has received a notice letter from Phantom Kid. At these words, Gordon and Darren looked at each other silently for a long time. Walking down Gotham Avenue, wearing his PM 2.5 mask, Matheson manifested a refreshing smile. He had spent all day thinking up this notice letter, and, although it wasn't that difficult to solve, it was the first time to write a coded letter. He felt an inexplicable sense of achievement. He couldn't wait to see Gordon's detectives torturing their brains to decipher the code. Although it was a bit risky to sneak in the GCPD, sending out the notice letter had been efficient to spook the police. In addition to that, he is sure that Gordon is investigating everyone in the station at the moment. Sniggeringly, Matheson walked to a brightly lit spot, not many of which were found in Gotham at night. If there was a family in Gotham that could rival the Waynes in power and wealth, it was the Cobblepots. Under the leadership of Oswald Chesterfield Cobblepot, the Cobblepots developed the illegal black industry and formed the largest gang in Gotham, with a striking amount of power and wealth. At the height of its power, it could even compete with New York's Fisk, but unfortunately, during the eight years since the Dent Act, the Cobblepot black industry has shrunk many times over, leaving only a part of it hidden behind the glitz and glamour. But the penguin's power is still not to be underestimated. If at least four out of every ten crimes in the U.S. are fisk related, at least two of the remaining ones are related to Cobblepot. In today's Gotham, Cobblepot is the only one who still has the audacity to run an underground operation, 
and their most typical venue is the Iceberg Restaurant. When Matheson pushed open the door of the prestigious restaurant, he was greeted by two young waitresses in tuxedos. Hello, sir. Do you have a reservation and how many people are there? Matheson didn't say a word. He walked straight to the cabinet next to the front counter of the restaurant, took out a black umbrella from underneath the cabinet then placed it upside down on the front counter. The waitresses were unsure and could only look at each other. The receptionist's expression, on the other hand, has changed. You guys go down and entertain the other guests. I'll take care of this one personally. Interesting. It seems that the staff at the iceberg aren't all right under the penguin. At least on the surface this is indeed a normal restaurant. The receptionist led Matheson towards the private dining area inside the restaurant, and along the way, Matheson noticed that both the lobby and the various private dining rooms were filled with people eating in the place, and it didn't look like there was any criminal activity going on. But this was all just a facade, the real face of the iceberg was actually Gotham's largest black market exchange, only a few people knew the real way to get into it, and those who did were not normal people. After a while, Matheson was led into one of the last booths. This doesn't seem to be where I'm going, Matheson asked with playful eyes. Gentlemen, before we send you there again, we need to ask you to put this on. The receptionist smiled slightly and took out an eye patch. Her tone was quite polite and courteous, not at all like the attitude of someone in the black industry. Come to think of it, those in their line of work might offend any big shot if they are not careful, the kind of arrogant watchdogs in the movies are almost non-existent. At the same time, two powerful men in suits suddenly burst through the door and stood behind Matheson, one on the left and the other one on the right. Your boss is really cautious, or shall I say timid? It's just a pity that this caution is a little too much, too much so that it seems to give an impression of cowardice. Matheson was calm and even in the mood for a bit of teasing. Sir, please watch your words. The smile on the receptionist's face gradually disappeared. The location of the exchange cannot be revealed, a rule you should not fail to understand. That also depends on what goods I have to sell. Wait, it seems to have run to you. Only to see Matheson's left hand suddenly probing towards the receptionist's waist, and quickly drawing back before she could look back. A gem suddenly appeared in his hand. The moment she saw this object, the receptionist's face changed dramatically, only to see her staring at Matheson with a shocked expression, saying in disbelief, This is there. Adam Star? You're the Phantom Kid. I can't imagine that the recently famous Phantom Kid would originally look so mediocre. The receptionist wondered. Ha! Huh. A soft laugh was heard, and as soon as Matheson casually took off his jacket, his whole clothes magically changed into another outfit. The outfit of Phantom Kid. The two strong men behind him instantly took an offensive posture, ready to attack, because of Matheson's surprising action. It was indeed rude not to use my real costume before, but I didn't expect the Iceberg restaurant to be built in such a prominent location on Gotham Avenue. I'm afraid I wouldn't have been able to come here if I used my original appearance. The white cloak danced without wind. The backlight of his monocle flickered as Matheson ignored the threat behind him and gave a gentlemanly bow. Chapter 11, Marvie Brandon Ah ha 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 ha. Suddenly, the receptionist burst out laughing so wildly that those who didn't know her would think she wasn't one of Penguin's crew but just some fang earl. Phantom Kid, a gem as valuable as Adam's star. How dare you just show it to someone? Especially in the Iceberg restaurant? If only you hadn't taken the gem out and instead obediently put on your blindfold and entered the exchange room. Everyone in there is so professional. Even the boss wouldn't have just grabbed the goods that others are trying to sell. But, no, you're foolish enough to let us see it now. The female receptionist's expression instantly became extremely wrapped with greed. Matheson couldn't help but sigh, it was a shame to see such a pretty face distorted. If I can offer Adam Star to the boss, I can. At the thought, she reached out and ordered the two burly men, deal with him. Snatch the Adam's Star. The two burly thugs were well prepared, and as soon as the receptionist's words left her mouth, the two lunged at Matheson, yet were easily dodged by him. Trust me, you have made a foolish decision. 
Agility is a must for a thief, he could even dodge a pistol bullet, let alone the fists of two punks with no training in combat. Even without the powers of the system, the transmigration itself has given him an extraordinarily strong motor nerve, which makes any physical training he performs twice as effective. After dodging the attacks of the two strong men, Matheson crouched down and threw a heavy sweeping kick pump. One of the strong men fell down, and then Matheson rolled to his left, distancing himself from the other one, with an extra poker card already in his hand. The Ace of Spades Did you know that this card, apart from being the best, also represents death? The receptionist swore that the hand holding the card had not moved at all in her sight, but the card had suddenly disappeared, in the true sense of the word. Then, there was a slight poof and she realized that the card had been stuck in the neck of the other buff man. No, both of them had a card stuck in their necks, only that the one who had just been kicked down and hadn't gotten up yet was worse off because he couldn't stand up straight and had to remain in a half crouch position. Because the two cards had cut perfectly into the carotid arteries of the two men, normally, by now, blood would have been spurting everywhere, but what was actually happening was that it was flowing very slowly. I advise you to stay still, otherwise you will die of excessive bleeding in a very short time. The kind of bleeding that cannot be saved. This restaurant is beautifully decorated and I don't believe any of us would like to see it become covered in blood. Matheson stood up and said in a gentlemanly tone. He wasn't in his civic form. And he doesn't mind killing someone. Nevertheless, he certainly isn't the kind who would kill someone even if he could. After all, he was a thief, not a robber. What's more, in a dangerous world such as American comics, being too nice would definitely get him killed. At the same time, he didn't want to just give the gems he'd worked so hard to get his hands on. Well, I underestimated you, Phantom Kid. The receptionist pulled a pistol from her belt. Hand over Adam Star and I can guarantee that the boss won't take revenge against you for what happened today. Oh, you've had quite a change of attitude. How about we make a bet? A bet? The receptionist gasped. For a dollar, I bet your gun has no bullets in it. Matheson looked confident as if he was certain of what he was saying. How could the receptionist possibly believe such an absurd statement? Her finger pulled the trigger straight away. At that moment, an unprecedented silence fell over the compartment, because no bullet really flew off it. Matheson slowly extended his right hand, and in it was a magazine. It was that time. Suddenly, the receptionist remembered that the phantom kid had previously probed his hand towards her waist, and it turned out that he had stolen her own magazine at that time, without alerting her. Such a terrifying hand speed. The receptionist was soaked in cold sweat. Her grip on the gun unconsciously loosened, and the pistol fell to the floor. Well, can you take me to the exchange now? And, don't even bother. Just take me to your boss, the penguin. I'm here to do business. I don't want to ruin the peace. Matheson approached the receptionist, reached out and lifted her chin, with his face close to her ear, and whispered softly. The young receptionist nodded shakingly. She had thought that a newcomer to Gotham like Phantom Kid would not dare to cause trouble on the penguin's territory, but she was proven wrong. Then, the doctor from Penguin's crew was called over to save the two big thugs, and then, with her leading the way, Matheson made his way from the third box to the left of the current box. It had identical tables and chairs set up. The receptionist walked over to a wall and knocked lightly a few times and a secret door opened to be precise. It was a lift and the iceberg exchange was located underground in the iceberg restaurant. It was not known how many meters deep underground but Matheson's rough estimate was probably over 50 meters. The structure of the exchange is actually very similar to the restaurant above, once inside it is an auction house that can hold hundreds of people. Most of the items traded here are large quantities of illegally smuggled goods, including marijuana, ketamine, opium, bobbleheads, and even a small amount of human organs and only the really high quality black deals are carried out in a separate private room area at the back of the auction house, where the deals are just as diverse. There is only what you can't think of, not what you can't buy. Slaves, arms, intelligence, treasures, technology. Anything can be sold if you can find a buyer. 
The boss will usually only be in the private room and wait until he sees something he likes before making an offer. Here, we don't sell any goods, we leave it up to the guests to trade themselves and, of course, we don't offer any protection. If you are robbed or scammed, we don't care. You can settle your problem as you walk out of the iceberg restaurant. The receptionist led Matheson to the penguin's exclusive private room while introducing him professionally. Her mental strength is so strong that she was acting as if the recent fight had never happened. Up ahead is the private room where the boss is. She pointed to a dark doorway in front of her. Who the hell are you? Matheson asked suddenly. What do you mean? Interesting, such a low-grade receptionist shouldn't be acting the way you do, even if you are one of the penguin's subordinates. I'm curious about your real identity. Matheson's gaze flickered as he noticed the woman in front of him stiffen for a split second, something he wouldn't have been able to spot, if not for his own excellent eyesight. I'm not a receptionist, I'm just here to fill in for the day, and as for who I really am, you'll find out when you meet the boss. Sure enough. So, pretty lady, can you tell me your name at least? Marvy Brandon, Marvy said coldly. Chapter 12, Bruce's Curiosity Marvy, is he the rumored phantom kid who played Gordon like a child and now came to offer me Adam Star? In the luxurious room, a short fat middle-aged man in a suit and black bowler hat was sitting on a sofa with an umbrella pinned in his hand, and like phantom kid, he was wearing a monocle, only without that magical backlighting. In total, there were only three people in this room. The penguin was confident that no one would ever be able to break through here, maybe there existed one eight years ago, but never now. Even if there was, he'd better run away quickly. No amount of bodyguards will be able to protect him in this place. As for Marvie's real position, she was actually the penguin secretary. Matheson was genuinely surprised when he knew this. The infamous penguin. I should say I am honored to meet you. Matheson's face beamed the same smile he always wore. I don't like to be called that. The penguin's face became cold. Then, forgive me, Mr. Cobblepot, for my overfamiliarity. Matheson shrugged, unconcerned by the penguin's warning. Marvy, I asked you a question. Why are you still frozen there up to now? The penguin turned his attention to the last person in the room. Boss, he brought Adam Starr with him. Marvy walked over to Penguin and told him everything that had just happened, and as soon as he heard of it, his face became instantly gloomy. Marvy, it was a low roar full of anger, and Marvy, who knew her boss's temperament well, cowered in fear. How many times have I told you that we are businessmen and that we never break the rules of our own territory? No businessman would turn down his own customers. The umbrella in the penguin's hand hit the floor with a heavy thud. Robbing a customer of the goods he wants to trade? Do you have any idea how your actions could stain the reputation of the iceberg? The biggest black market in Gotham that I've managed to build could be ruined. Marvy, you've been by my side for two years now. You should know what kind of punishment will follow. At those words, Marvy's face was pale and her eyes were filled with horror. As Matheson watched, Marvy's end was probably going to be miserable, but he wouldn't speak up for someone who tried to shoot him. What he hadn't expected was that the penguins actually valued their reputation, which was ironic when you consider that even heroin sellers take the purity of their goods very seriously. All of them are professional businessmen who demand quality, compared to some legitimate businesses. At first, Matheson thought the penguin would turn on him, because a mere Adam's star was not enough to make Cobblepot go desperate for it. In addition, there were many other goods traded here worth far more than the gem. Of course, he survived up to now due to his strength, if by now, he was killed by a shot from Marvy, the penguin would have merely given an order to get rid of his corpse. With this thought in mind, Matheson sat down graciously opposite the penguin and placed Adam Star on the middle of the table. R, Phantom Kid, I apologize for what just happened and also appreciate the fact that you chose our place to trade. So, what would you like to trade Adam Star for? Money? Gold? Or anything else? The penguin immediately reverted his face to the one of a businessman, with a big smile on it. Though in this case, it was as ugly as it could be. I am in desperate need of a sum of money, 
the amount does not matter, and I trust that you, Mr. Cobblepot, won't make me a wild offer. Although the market valuation of Adam Star was up to $170 million, black market transactions are not based on the normal price. Usually, the amount would be reduced by 20 to 30 percent. It is possible that an auction would fetch a high price, but the starting price would be much lower than the normal price, and the bids would vary from territory to territory. It didn't matter how much, more or less, the cash he is getting. After all, his parents had left him a lot of money, but he wanted to establish an exclusive base for Phantom Kid, and if he used his own family money he would be easily traced so he had to use these unrecorded funds. Then, based on the market valuation, $170 million, as an apology for Marvy's rudeness earlier. The penguin lit a cigar and took a puff. Oh, wouldn't you be losing a lot of money out of thin air then, Mr. Cobblepot? Matheson couldn't believe such a good thing could happen. Don't overthink it. I'm not in the business to lose money, said the penguin a veteran of the business who could not see the suspicions of Phantom Kid. Someone in New York just happened to want the jewel at a high price, and guess how much he offered? A whole $200 million. A little operation could have raised the price even higher. And if it weren't for this buyer, I honestly wouldn't have any interest in the gem itself. But if you want to ask who this buyer is, then I have no comment. Matheson couldn't confirm whether the penguin was telling the truth or not and had to choose to believe it. With the agreed price, the transaction was carried out straight away. $170 million was transferred to a virtual account that Matheson had, opened in advance so that even if the transaction records were traced, no one would know whom it belonged to. Once everything was done, Matheson got up and left the place, disguised as a middle-aged male in front of the penguin, and then walked straight outside to the auction house. Penguin recognized that Phantom Kid could change his appearance at will and that it would be impossible to track him in the middle of a crowd. Phantom Kid? What an interesting guy. Seems that Gotham will be lively again in the future. He ha he. Looking at Matheson on his way out, Penguin laughed meaningfully. Meanwhile, in the Batcave underneath Wayne Manor, Master Wayne, there's good news for you. Alfred came to Bruce's side with a newspaper in his hand. Almost every day this week, Bruce had gone to the Batcave, using his back computer to search for any signs of Phantom Kid. For a month, Bruce has extracted and seen all the surveillance records of the area around the Gotham Exhibition Hall. Yet no clues about Phantom Kid were found. It was as if Phantom Kid had appeared out of thin air, with no absolute records of his whereabouts. He could not even find any suspicious person who might be Phantom Kid. This raised Bruce's curiosity, it had been a long time since he had been this interested in something. The newspaper that Alfred had just handed over to him had increased Bruce's interest even more. The headline of the paper read, A second teaser letter from Phantom Kid appears. Is this coded teaser letter really from Kid? The Fickle Brothers are going to the end. By this time, the Twelve Trials had reached their second, when Celine cannot look far enough to see Helios. I shall listen to the call of the waves and come to snatch the cat's eye. See you soon, Phantom Kid. Looking at this mysterious teaser letter, Bruce showed a smile of triumph. Seeing this, Alfred smiled with relief. Chapter 13, The Deciphered Teaser Letter it's not easy to see your smiling face. Alfred smirked. Ha, huh, let's leave that aside for now Alfred. What do you think about this teaser letter? Bruce chuckled lightly. He was somehow in a light mood these days. Since Phantom Kid had appeared, Master Wayne, Phantom Kid's coded message is one of a kind, but it's still a lot worse than the Riddler. Yes, those riddles Edward devised back in the day nearly pushed me to break my head. Alfred laughed happily not just at Bruce's rare joke, but because he was finally willing to bring up a memory from the past. How many have been solved? Bruce asked. No response or answer from the GCPD. No, you know I'm not talking about the police. A good chunk, I guess. I only know the date, the location, and the target of Phantom Kid's crime. Alfred said, truthfully, if it was a Riddler's riddle, he was afraid he wouldn't be able to solve anything. Bruce nodded. Well then, Let's talk about it, maybe we'll both have different opinions, let's start with the easiest. He said he wanted to take the cat's eye, 
No doubt the target was the cat's eye emerald, the most valuable emerald with the highest value in Gotham. Is the cat's eye emerald that Dagger auctioned off not long ago? At this point, Alfred's expression suddenly became weird. It's not nice to say this, but, for a moment, I have to admit I was pleased to know that Daggett is the victim. This was because, during the eight years, due to Bruce's seclusion, Wayne Enterprises had been declining, especially that the negative annual revenue led to the displeasure of many of the board of directors, all of whom were shareholders in Wayne Enterprises. The largest shareholder was Daggett. He was ambitious and wanted to take control of Wayne Enterprises but never had the chance. The second largest shareholder was Miranda Date, a philanthropist and one of the few members of the board who supported Bruce, although her support turned out eventually to be fake. It was clear that Wayne Enterprises was down and Bruce, its isolated owner, knew nothing about it, only Alfred saw some of what was happening to it. Bruce didn't care for Alfred's confession as he added, the cat's eye emerald was housed in Daggett's private collection after it was bought by him, which is located at the southernmost tip of the island of Lower Town, right next to the Atlantic Ocean, and since it's summertime, and the wind will be blowing from the ocean to the mainland, the waves mostly refer to the direction the waves are facing, which means he will somehow detour from the Atlantic to Daggett's collection. Yes, that's what Alfred had thought too. The last thing is the date and the first two sentences refer to the date. Alfred affirmed, the fickle brothers mean Gemini, and the second of the twelve trials refers to the birth of cancer, which means that Phantom Kid will commit his crime between the last day of Gemini and the first day of cancer, which is June 21st to 22. Only the last sentence, when Celine cannot look far enough to see Helio, which I'm not sure what it refers to, Alfred sighed and said, Pa 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 pa. Bruce applauded approvingly. Great, Alfred. So far you and I are on the same page, and as for this last unexplained sentence, I've got a clue as to what it says about the exact time when Phantom Kid will strike. In fact, the contents of this teaser letter are so simple that anyone who has studied Greek mythology will understand it at first glance. Selene is known as the god of the moon in Greek mythology, while Helios is the god of the sun. Oh, I'm sorry, Master Wayne. Isn't Apollo the god of the sun in Greek mythology? That's the hard part. Bruce's A's were playful. Usually popular Greek mythology describes Apollo as the god of the sun, which of course he was, but as the successor to Helios. In Hesiod's genealogy of the gods, it is recorded that Helios was the son of the titan gods Hyperion and Thea, the brother of Selene, the god of the moon, and Oz, the goddess of the dawn and that the gods in their line were responsible for bringing light to the world. In this way, Selene is the moon and Helios is the sun, and the inability to look away refers to, the moon and the sun are separated by another celestial body, a lunar eclipse. Alfred said in surprise but the next instant he rejected the explanation. No, according to the observatory's estimates, the lunar eclipse is supposed to happen on June 26th, which doesn't match the date on the teaser letter. Exactly, so it doesn't refer to a lunar eclipse, which means it's not the Earth that separates the moon from the sun, but an artificial satellite. Bruce cut to the chase. The time when the artificial satellite is located between the moon and the sun, which is 9 o'clock at night, is when Kid kicks off. On the other side, Matheson was still unaware that his teaser letter had been deciphered by Batman, he is busy picking out his new base at the moment. With the $170 million in hand, Matheson first forged a series of identity documents for himself, which, of course, did not look like his real self. He then made his way to Wayne Real Estate. There was no way around it. It was hard to find anything in Gotham that Wayne Enterprises hadn't claimed already. Mr. DiCaprio, may I ask what kind of property you need? Matheson was dressed as he was on his ID, wearing a high-end suit that the young agent knew at the first glance that a big order might be coming in, and rushed over to talk to Matheson. I need a single-family home on a large lot with a quiet setting, preferably with little foot traffic. The price doesn't matter. At these words. The agent's breath caught, she felt that this customer's last remark was just too manly, she adored this kind of young and handsome man who was also rich. 
she pressed down her restless heart and introduced the finest properties to Matheson one by one. Look at this villa, it covers a total of 1,000 square meters. The villa is over 600 square feet, located at the southeast end of the Diamond District. The environment is absolutely quiet. Without waiting for her to finish, Matheson interrupted, not in the Diamond District. The agent had to switch to another villa, does this one, with 750 square feet of land and 500 square feet of villa space, located near the Robert Kane Memorial Bridge. Meet your requirements, the Memorial Bridge? There really weren't many people, and Matheson thought about it for a moment before finally shaking his head. The Memorial Bridge was on the East End, the most chaotic part of Gotham, where almost half of all crime took place. Although the Memorial Bridge was on the edge of the East End, there was no guarantee that it would be bombarded one day. The agent frowned, she felt that this customer was very picky. Next, seven or eight villas were introduced in quick succession, all of which Matheson rejected. Sorry sir, we're down to the last villa that meets your requirements, but I don't recommend that you choose this one. In the end, the lady had to move that one. Oh, let's see. A luxury villa estate, covering an area of 1700 square meters, with a villa area of 820 square feet, four floors above and below, and a basement with a good amount of space, and a great overall decoration. To be honest, looking at the condition of the villa itself, I like this one the best, but this estate is located in the Edinburgh district. The Edinburgh district was the largest industrial area in Gotham. Originally nothing famous, but no one dared to settle there now because of an accident at a factory that had led to the birth of some villain. This factory is the famous Ace Chemical Plant. The agent was helpless, she was ready to be rejected again, she hadn't been able to sell any of the houses today and it looked like she was going to have to live a hell of a month again. I like this one, I'll take it. Chapter 14 Everyone Against Phantom Kid the villa is just about 15 kilometers west of the Ace Chemical Plant, and it is rare to see a human around the area. It was on the west bank of the Gotham River, not far from the Westwood Bridge, which gave direct access to the Berlin District. If you were brave enough, you could even cross to Arkham Island, where the popular Arkham Asylum was located. Unwillingly, the agent lady had to take Matheson on a tour of the house. The villa was priced at just $10 million. Whereas in the Diamond District, a villa of the same size would have gone for at least 40 million. Matheson was pleased with the setting, as the fence surrounding the estate was at least twice as high compared to any normal estate. He was told that it has been specially raised later, making it difficult even for him to climb over with his bare hands. It provided decent security. The basement was built to serve as a nuclear proof bunker. Hence, could be used as a good refuge. Thus, the first stronghold of Phantom Kid was selected, where all of Matheson's training would be conducted in the future. The agent lady was dazzled when Matheson swiped his credit card and paid it all without a distinct reaction. The villa had been on sale for a long time. It was a kind of a burden in the hands of Wayne Real Estate. The documentation was processed very quickly. Within a few hours, all was finished and Matheson was ready to move in. Today is June 19th, two days before the preview of the teaser letter and the last date to step in, which means that there is only one day left for Matheson to get ready. Matheson had ordered a large batch of strange and unusual materials, all for practicing magic. Red magic was a type of magic that relied heavily on external objects, with curses, blessings, divination, alchemy, and magic circles making up 90% of the content of red magic. Spells that relied solely on one's own magic power were air. Magic is a mysterious thing. From the time he got the red magic book, Matheson had been practicing the spells written on it achieving very slow results. The only magic he could release was Ignition, one of the few spells that did not require the use of physical materials to release. Unfortunately, with his current magic power, lighting a candle was the best he could do. The magic talisman that Koizumi Akako could easily make would take Matheson a whole day. It's better to rely on the system's empowerment since it's quick. After all, I don't think that I can directly use my magic power. Now was not the time to think about all of this. Once the gems are stolen, 
The rewards will be naturally known afterward. Matheson burned a large cauldron in the basement, added countless strange and exotic herbs to it, and dropped two sheets of paper into it to make sure the operation was foolproof. He had to refine some magic charms. While Matheson was concentrating on making magic charms, the GCPD received another anonymous message claiming to have deciphered Kid's teaser letter. The anonymous message this time included the full contents of the decryption. Gordon immediately ordered all the officers who were not on duty to move out and head for Daggett's private collection. That's right. Gordon suddenly remembered the glider that Kid had put Aaron on earlier. Remember to call in three helicopters so his glider wings will be useless. This time, he was determined to arrest Phantom Kid. Both the police and Wayne are prepared to confront Phantom Kid, and naturally, Daggett, who was his prey, is ready as well. Striver, did you contact her? Inside a luxurious presidential suite, Daggett asked his closest subordinate. Don't worry boss, she'll be here soon. Striver glanced at his watch before replying. That's right, I'm never late. Suddenly, a third voice emerged. Merely hearing the voice would make one think that it belonged to a sexy beauty. A woman who had entered the room at some point slowly appeared from the shadows. It was none other than Serena, who had battled Matheson not too long ago. Catwoman, Daggett's eyes narrowed. Oh, great Mr. Daggett. Isn't it lowly for a social celebrity like yourself to meet a petty thief like me? Serena asked cautiously. You're no petty thief. You're Gotham's thief master. So I'd like to entrust you with something, an issue that only you can help me with. Daggett said with a slight smile and a friendly face. Phantom Kid. Serena knew who Daggett was referring to as the issue. That's right. I'm sure as Gotham's number one thief, you don't want the rise of this weirdo above you. Daggett said so. I don't mind taking your commission, though. Even if I already have a feud with him, you'll have to pay my fair price. Daggett understood keenly that Catwoman had a conflict with Phantom Kid, but he didn't ask more. You will naturally like my reward, believe me. It is a reward that you can never refuse. Daggett was so confident that Catwoman would not refuse his temptation. That thing you've been looking for, it's in my hands right now. Sure enough, at those words. Serena's eyes changed. It was a longing desire for the reward, but in an instant, she regained her coldness. No, as far as I know, the only one who could possibly make that is like in data. Right. Hence, I bought that company. Daggett said it confidently. Serena bit her lip, knowing that Daggett held more shares in Wayne Enterprises than Bruce. Buying like in data was very simple. With such big news as buying a company, one could find a lot of reports about it via a casual check on the internet, one wouldn't assume that Daggett was attempting to lie. What do you want me to do? Serena quickly got into character. Protect my gems and make Phantom Kid a big joke. And surely, Daggett said with a cruel smile, if you can kill him, that would be even better. Sorry, I only know how to steal things. I don't know how to keep things from being stolen. Just as Daggett frowned, Serena turned the tables and said, but I would be more than happy to accept that latter proposition. The thought of being unwittingly taken advantage of the day, and not getting Adam Starr, made Catwoman's customer very unhappy. If it wasn't for the skill of my good hands, I'm afraid I would have died, back then. How could Serena not hold a grudge against Phantom Kid? If you continue with that high-profile style, sooner or later, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. And when you've offended the police, the mob, and the rich, there will be no place for you in Gotham, Kid. Serena mocked in her mind. At this point, Daggett and Serena had a sort of an agreement, and then Catwoman disappeared into the shadows. Although Matheson had now committed only one crime, the eyes of Gotham's authorities were all fixed on him. With just the second teaser letter bringing together Catwoman, the GCPD, and Batman, it will be far more difficult for Matheson to steal the Cat's Eye Emerald than it had been for Adam's star. At noon on June 21, after a full day and night of refining, Matheson finally finished the two magic charms. With this, I'm in complete control. Matheson wiped the sweat from his face, revealing a delighted expression. Chapter 15. The Self-Cultivation of Phantom Kid. Downtown Island is the southernmost area of Gotham City, 
and the largest island compared to Uptown Island and Midtown Island, with the Atlantic Ocean just within its reach. Luxurious and exquisitely, Daggett's private collection hall is built on the south shore of Downtown Island, right next to the ocean. There are many sea view houses and villas, but Daggett on the other hand has a sea view estate. God knows why Daggett decided to place his goods in a hall situated on the beach. Wasn't he afraid of humidity? Obviously, he might have learned this behavior from the most wealthy man of New York, otherwise, it is hard to believe that there exists such an idiot who doesn't know how to spend his money. In fact, not even Gotham's most absurd businessman, Wayne, could have done this with his hall being kid's target. Daggett's private beach extended for five kilometers, human presence was extremely minimal there, and all audiences who heard the news and arrived would have to stay away. What's more, it was difficult for Matheson to blend in with the venue in his disguise as a citizen of the general public. As a result, the difficulty of stealing was much higher than last time, and so, the first problem he was facing is what's the way to sneak into Daggett's collection. At noon, Matheson switched his appearance to the one of DiCaprio when he bought the villa, and headed in a taxi downtown. In the hot sun, he observed every street downtown. How does one become a competent thief? Good disguise? Surprising speed? Lock-picking techniques that crack locks in seconds? None of the above. The most important thing for a master thief is to be familiar with his surroundings well enough to ensure that he can easily lose his pursuers if he is spotted but also to be able to plan a course of action that is in his best interests. A master thief has a complete plan, from picking a target to choosing a date, to infiltrating, and then escaping, all in one smooth set of steps. Therefore, before making a move, one must be familiar with the whole area, anticipate the possible police patrols, and calculate the timing of the operation, without making a single mistake and all this requires stepping on the spot, as the kleptomaniac he was. Matheson thought he was well trained enough to do so, and this part of analyzing the environment was, of course, important. Unlike ordinary thieves, Phantom Kid never needs to put in the effort to think about the time the police are coming and how to get around them. With the existence of the teaser letter, the police have already arranged a net of heaven and earth at the target location. There are pros and cons to everything, and while a teaser letter may reveal the plans of Phantom Kid, it does as well reveal the police's plans. The police, who knew what Matheson was trying to steal, could not have spare police manpower to stop him at the major roads. It is either because they were not strong enough or for the sake of honor. After buying a tourist map of the island, he rented a car and went around the city for about three hours. He figured out the main traffic routes dark alleys, which were well hidden and hard to find, as well as being close to the Atlantic Ocean. Downtown Island also has the Gotham River running through it. This river separates Downtown Island from Midtown Island, again, the only route connecting the two large islands. If you follow the Gotham River north into the Merchant River Basin, you can cross Midtown Island as a whole into the Edinburgh District, back to the Stronghold. While sunbathing on the beach, he constructed an escape route back in his head. It was impossible to go by land, as there was only one bridge that connected downtown and the Midtown Islands. The police could easily block it, and it was not safe to fly back on gliders as he heard that Gordon had deployed three police helicopters. We'll just have to go by water. With a firm decision in his mind, Matheson went to the port and claimed a yacht in Jim Gordon's name, with a solemn warning to the owner that the boat was being borrowed for a covert operation and would need to be used for a whole night. And so, no one could be told that he had commandeered the yacht, until early tomorrow morning, when he will go to recover it from the GCPD. Commissioner Gordon was so valued in the hearts of Gotham's citizens second only to Batman. So, when Matheson disguised himself as Gordon, the boat's owner agreed on the spot, without even asking to see his police officer's license. With the yacht hidden under the Gotham River Bridge, the preparations for the escape were done. The next thing to do was to find out what was going on inside the collection hall, how the police was set up, whether Daggett had installed any high-tech anti-theft devices, and so on. Without finding this out, it would be difficult to carry out the theft. However, this matter would need to wait until it was dark to proceed. After all, 
daylight was not suitable for such operations. What's more, Matheson will appear late, he has all the time to observe the collection hall. It's only two o'clock in the afternoon, just in time for a trip to the best tourist destination on Downtown Island, the public beach. Downtown Island is the largest commercial district in Gotham, with the Gotham Financial Center, the Statue of Justice, William Street, Gotham Broadcasting, and Gotham City Center, all located here. This makes Downtown Island at the top list of Gotham's major subdivisions, especially in the afternoon. The entire coast, except for a few chartered private beaches, was almost full of people swimming along. Matheson walked along the beach in a pair of beach trousers, a tight muscular line exposed, he didn't go into the water because the water would have eroded the mask off his face. Even in disguise, his perfect body and handsome appearance still got him a lot of attention from women. Matheson loved this. Suddenly. He caught a glimpse of a familiar figure in the distance, and his mouth curved up. He did not walk towards the figure but simply closed his eyes. After staying up all night yesterday, now is the time to rest. Soon, night fell and the cool evening breeze blew through just in time for Matheson to wake up. By now, most of the tourists had already gone back one by one, only a small group of people were still on the beach, enjoying the night view. On the beach, the temperature difference between day and night is vast, and the beautiful women who sweat in their bikinis during the day have now to put their jackets on. As soon as Matheson woke up, he felt a coolness that seemed to make his mind think faster. Putting on the black casual clothes he prepared, Matheson walked towards Daggett's private collection. About twenty minutes later, he was near the location of Daggett's private beach, and the closer he is. The more pedestrians there were. Young men and women, mostly, were blocked off from Daggett's private beach. The GCPD had established a long barrier on the beach. Most of them were fans of Phantom Kid and had come here to show their support for Kid. This all stems from Matheson's confidence and charisma. Of course, in fact, many girls were holding up a sign that said, Phantom Kid. Well, it wasn't that many, only a few hundred. Of course, one could not dismiss the possibility that the GCPD had sent civilian policemen to blend in with the crowd. Matheson quietly stepped around his fans and observed the long barrier of police. Chapter 16, Barbara Wants to Catch Phantom Kid 1-5 Chapter, Enjoy, How Much Longer, Inside the Collection Hall, Gordon asked Taran, who had stepped aside, about two hours or so. If that teaser letter is deciphered correctly, Gordon pondered for a moment and then asked, How are the shore arrangements going? Don't worry, sir, the nearby shore has been fortified. There are no exposed gaps. I can guarantee that not even a mosquito could escape if it tried to fly in. Do you think Kid will really fly in from the direction of the ocean in a roundabout way? Gordon's eyes manifested a degree of confusion. You do not know enough of Kid's disguise. He pretended to be you in front of all of us that day and no one could tell that he was any different from you. He even has identically imitated your voice tone realistically. If it wasn't for the fact that I heard his distinctive voice when he presented himself as Phantom Kid, I would have even thought you were Phantom Kid. This, sir, but doesn't he have gliders? Using one to fly should be the most convenient. I mean... Can he still dive in this situation? Our men are all spread along the sea. There is no way he can come if he is in a boat. Aaron laughed dryly. He had not been able to see the fabulous disguise technique because he had been knocked out by Matheson, and could only hear all sorts of absurd claims from his colleagues. To be fair, Aaron was reluctant to believe in such things. The technology of simulating human skin masks was not really rare. Many spies or agents used them, unless they were of advanced quality. The disguise would look fake. How could a thief have such latest technology? It was unlikely that a thief could own this technology. Aaron, is this collection hall connected to anything like a ventilation duct or downpipe? Gordon suddenly asked. Yes, there are 13 ventilation ducts and 5 vents in the collection hall, located in these parts, which are not connected to sewers. A voice emerged, but it wasn't the voice of anyone present. More importantly, it was a woman's. Aaron turned his head to look at where the voice was coming from, only to see a red-haired female student wearing glasses approaching. Her left hand was dragging her laptop, 
while her right hand was manipulating the keyboard. Barbara, Jim, is it really appropriate to have your daughter here? It could be dangerous after a while. As soon as he saw the girl, Aaron's brow frowned and stopped his formality. He started addressing Gordon as a friend. Rookie, ignoring Aaron's rhetorical question, Gordon yelled towards the outside of the collection hall. Blake heard the shout and immediately came running over. Any instructions, sir? Get two more teams of officers over here and keep a strict watch on the five events in the pavilion. We can't rule out the possibility that Phantom Kid would sneak into the collection hall from there. Blake saluted and then went down to arrange the men. Barbara? Didn't I tell you not to follow me here? It was at this point that Gordon looked at Barbara's dissatisfied face. I want to catch Phantom Kid. Barbara grunted and walked around both Gordon and Aaron and headed inside the collection hall. That child, Gordon said with a headache. He didn't know who Barbara was imitating. She had been interested in all sorts of cases, and a large part of the reason she had thoroughly studied hacking was to break into the police database and go through the various case files, and gather information. Matheson knew exactly what Barbara was doing this for, and Barbara had told him herself. Eight years ago, when Barbara was just a young girl in junior high school, she was almost killed by Two-Face. It was not a very memorable experience. Yet Barbara was an extraordinary girl. And after that incident, she learned one thing, and that was that Gotham's superficial beauty was no more than hypocrisy. Barbara is one of the very few people who had seen Harvey Dent's true face with her own eyes. How could the gangster families that had been established in Gotham for hundreds of years be so easily swept away when even a man that righteous could go down the wrong path? Unfortunately, the majority of people are so deceived by the current circumstances. Even her father, Gordon, had to go against his will and do his best to maintain a peaceful society by telling lies. Often, she even despises her father. She doesn't understand why Gordon doesn't tell the truth, why he doesn't tell people who the real killer is and who saved Gotham by defeating the Joker. Barbara admires Batman looks up to him, and wants to fight crime like him too. Except that women are naturally weaker in combat than men, so Barbara chose a different path, that of wisdom. She never spoke of these plans to outsiders, including Gordon and her brother, with the exception of Matheson. As to what surprised Barbara, she always thought for no reason that Matheson was different from the others, that he was the only one of his peers who would listen to her describe how great Batman was. The others thought Batman was just a wanted criminal under various influences. However, whenever Barbara said she wanted to be Batman too, Matheson always smiled oddly and then inexplicably said to be Batman, you have to have his powers. And when Barbara wondered what Batman's powers are, Matheson just smiles mysteriously and doesn't say a word. When Phantom Kid appeared, and actually gained a lot of admiration, Barbara was determined to catch him to set out his case as her debut battle. Once she did so, she was not ready to follow Phantom Kid for the rest of her life. Only by the time she realized it, it was already too late. Anyway, Barbara came to Daggett's private collection hall, fully ready to fight. She wants so badly to prove herself. Jim, remember to protect Barbara. I don't suppose you want to recreate that incident from the past? Aaron looked at Barbara's back as she walked into the pavilion and said in a deep voice, looking at the way Phantom Kid did his last crime, he doesn't look like a vicious criminal who would actively hurt people. Jim, we can't trust the character of a criminal. Maybe he didn't hurt anyone last time because we knew so little about him and he was able to tease us easily. But this is different. It's hard to imagine what Kid would do if he was pushed to the edge. You're right, I'll look after my daughter and I won't allow anyone to hurt her unless I'm dead. Gordon said with a firm gaze, the layout of the collection hall seems a little too simple. Doesn't it look as if it was constructed to be similar to that of a library? Meanwhile, Matheson had infiltrated the collection hall in disguise. It didn't matter who he was pretending to be this time. What mattered was that he could now explore the police setup openly. But the situation inside the collection was somewhat unexpected. Daggett, the owner of the gem, was not even here. He did not even put his secretary or assistant in charge, as if he had no regard for the Phantom Kid. That's interesting. 
In this case, either he really trusts the GCPD completely or he's left behind a backhand, which makes it inconvenient for him to be here. Chapter 17, Time for a Trailer 2-5 Chapter, Enjoy For whatever reason, Daggett did not come to his own collection hall, which deprived Matheson of the most suitable disguise. After all, the owner of the place is always the best option of disguise. The structure of the collection hall is not quite the same as that of any typical ones. There are not many collection rooms, and right in the middle is a circular sightseeing hall that takes up most of the space on the first floor. There is a large collection room on both sides of the hall. In addition to the hall that connects the two collection rooms, there is also an interconnected corridor at the back of these two rooms, that encloses the hall. But, strangely enough, this corridor does not connect to the outside of the hall, meaning that once you enter through the main door of the collection, you can only enter one of the collection rooms through the hall before reaching the corridor. No one knows why Daggett designed such an odd corridor in his collection. He was reluctant to say anything about it. The entire collection has two floors, each about eight meters high. At the first glance of the interior of the building, Matheson had only one feeling. Everything was so big, the floors were above standard, the halls were inexplicably empty, and all the hallways and corridors were designed to be unusually wide. It was as if the building had been deliberately made to look bigger. On the first floor, where the collection is located, a curved wooden staircase extends from both sides of the hall on the first floor, connecting the second one, and on the way up to the second floor, there is a long circular corridor around it, with two collection rooms on each side of the corridor, about five meters apart, with the two rooms facing each other, making a total of twelve collection rooms. Adding the two rooms on the ground floor makes it 14, each of which is divided into two parts, one for the police to guard and the other for the collection, separated by a safe door, which is a secret room with a motion sensor alarm system. Daggett's wealth was far less than Wayne's, and his collection was mostly of ordinary things worth around a million dollars. It didn't even contain many things, just a hundred or so, with the most valuable being the Cat's Eye Emerald, which sold for $21 million at an auction. The Cat's Eye Emerald was much less valuable than Adam's Star, for the latter is the largest sapphire in the world and a national treasure. And despite Cat's Eye Emerald's rarity, it is not even considered the most valuable Cat's Eye stone. However, this does not mean that the Cat's Eye Emerald is not worthy of stealing. In fact, from Matheson's aesthetic view, this stone is way better looking than Adam's star, and, as an item's collector, he prefers the Cat's Eye Emerald. Of course, it would also be more suitable as a gift, as the Cat's Eye Emerald is set in a necklace. The number of arranged GCPD officers in the collection hall is beyond imagination. Gordon brought a total of more than 1,200 police officers. Even if it was not really a big place, and bringing this amount of officers would be seen as useless, 500 of the officers set up a barrier outside the collection hall to prevent unrelated personnel from approaching, while for the remaining hundreds of officers, 150 of them in 30 speedboats patrolled the sea. 200 on the beach, and three helicopters hovered on the sky with three snipers on board. It was as if there was a war going on. The last 300 were distributed throughout the collection hall, 20 at the main entrance, 10 in each of the collection rooms. The air vents, staircases, corridors, and rooftops were all manned, with each point guaranteed to be guarded by at least three police officers. During the last heist, it was because only two policemen were allowed to watch the back door that Phantom Kid had caught an opportunity to take advantage of the situation. Gordon would not make the same mistake a second time. And so, to ensure that Kid would not disguise himself as his companion, if any officer was found alone they would be treated as Phantom Kid. TSK, TSK, I guess Gordon has lived up to his reputation of being an expert at such hard times. Even the Gordon of the cinematic universe is not that easy to deal with. This collection hall is already hard to infiltrate. Unfortunately, I'm already in. Matheson smiled secretly, and once he had mapped out the inside of the collection hall, he disappeared from the patrol, unnoticed. No one noticed he was gone. There's still half an hour left, you guys gotta wait for the big surprise. Meanwhile, 
Gordon and Darren made their way to the rooftop, confident in their setup. Even if Batman came, he would never be able to sneak in. If Phantom Kid still wanted to steal the cat's eye emerald, there was only one way to go, and that was to force his way in. One man against thousands of police officers, something that even Batman would not be able to do. I don't think so. Barbara thought otherwise. Leaving aside the question of whether Batman could do it, as it is a subject that was painful to mention, Phantom Kid is the matter to be discussed here. These days, she had studied countless videos of Kid stealing Adam Star to finally conclude that Kid was a criminal who was extremely good at gathering information. Starting from the moment he showed up, to throwing the flashbang, and finally fooling Gordon, every move seemed like it had been expected in advance. Also, how did Kid know what Aaron looked like and sounded like? Maybe through some news reports? Yet, Aaron's common tone of voice is not something that can be easily imitated. This only meant that Kid had done extensive research, long beforehand. His research was so meticulous that any pedestrian one happened to bump into while walking down the street was expected to be Kid in disguise. So, without our knowledge, I think Kid already knows about all the arrangements made here, no. Maybe he is among us by now, Barbara said with a serious face. What makes you think that? As Gordon asked, he knew that his daughter was intelligent, sometimes he would account for Barbara's analysis of certain cases. Really, it's just a hunch. There was no way Barbara could prove, without evidence, that Phantom Kid was here. Gordon remained silent for a while. Is Kid really here already? Or will he appear in a bizarre way again? That would all be revealed in half an hour. This is the Gotham Gazette. We are now within the coastal confines of downtown Ireland. Across the camera is John Daggett's private collection. You can see a barrier has been set in front of it by the GCPD. We can't get near there. Outside the barrier, a female reporter began her work a short while ago. Mr. Daggett and the GCPD received a teaser letter from Phantom Kid at the same time. And according to what the police have just revealed, the teaser letter has been cracked and Kid will show up in half an hour from the direction of the Atlantic Ocean. Dozens of media outlets have sent reporters to the area to broadcast live. In addition to thousands of the audience present, the buzz is enormous. What do you guys think? Will Phantom Kid show up on time? There are so many cops here that I probably wouldn't even look inside if it were me. So, you're not him. I believe in Kid he'll show up. I don't think he would have put out the teaser letter if it wasn't for his confidence. In the crowd, several students discussed, and, if Barbara had been here, she would have noticed that these were the same students who had been talking about Kid in class the other day. There were many similar students, all excitedly discussing what kind of performance Kid would put on today. Thirty minutes went by quickly, and Gordon stared gazing at his watch. The hour hand had stopped at nine and seconds, are measured now by his heartbeats. One, two, three, the trailer is over. At last, chapter 18, who said that waves mean ocean waves. Three five chapter, enjoy. Aside from the thousands of people waiting for Phantom Kid on the shore, tens of thousands of people in Gotham City were watching what was going on here via live broadcasts from dozens of media outlets. At Wayne Manor, Bruce and Alfred were also watching the live feed. Alfred, it's time. I hope we didn't make a mistake deciphering the teaser letter. For no apparent reason, Bruce was a little worried. Don't worry, sir, Inspector Gordon is on the scene. I'm sure that even if anything does go wrong, he will successfully catch Phantom Kid. Alfred was relieved. They had done their part and left the rest to the police. He had never wanted Bruce to be Batman under any circumstance. Not for the sake of dealing with the Joker, nor Phantom Kid. Neither of these conflicts had to do with Bruce. On the shore of Midhorn Island, Matheson smiled proudly after seeing his watch set at exactly nine o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to my show again. The moment the time arrived. A magnetic voice came from all directions. Gordon would never forget that voice for the rest of his life. It's Phantom Kid. Where is he? The moment they heard the voice, everyone, including Gordon, turned their eyes to the south, the direction from which the waves were beating over. However dash, there was nothing floating above the vast view of the sea. In addition, the weather tonight was surprisingly good. So, 
even in the darkness of the night, they could see clearly. This led to the question that was on everyone's mind at the moment, whether Hale is Phantom Kid. Helicopter Squad. Any sign of Phantom Kid? Gordon immediately used his walkie-talkie to contact the helicopter pilot. No, sir, nothing so far. Report. No anomalies in Sector A. No anomalies in Sector B either. No sightings in Sector C. At this point, the officers in each area also reported back to Gordon. Hey, I knew you guys would interpret waves as ocean waves, but it's mostly because Daggett's collection hall is so well located right on the beach, which probably wouldn't be the case if it was on Midtown Island, Uptown Island, or even the Diamond District. Matheson snickered while, once again, speaking out to tell people to look in the right direction. Guys, why are you looking in the opposite direction? The people looked back in surprise and sure enough, a white figure was clearly visible in the sky behind them. Oh my, it's Phantom Kid. So he can really fly, don't be silly, that's a glider. The crowd erupted, and the appearance of Phantom Kid always gets people excited. Helicopter squad, turn around, the target is in the opposite direction. Gordon shouted as he picked up his walkie-talkie, Roger that, sir. Attention all stations. Phantom Kid has appeared. All men, hold your positions and do not move without my orders. At the first opportunity, Gordon gave his orders. He hasn't appeared from the direction of the sea level. Why? The entire GCPD was confused. This was not what had been promised. Could it be that Kid violated his own teaser letter? Sure enough, our previous interpretation of the teaser letter was wrong. On the rooftop of the collection hall. Barbara looked in the direction from which Kid was flying and suddenly realized. Barbara, have you unraveled the true meaning of the teaser letter? Aaron said, in disbelief. He was in total confusion. Look carefully at Kid's direction. What's 13 kilometers away in a straight line? By this time, Gordon had also figured out what the problem was. So he reminded Aaron, who was a bit slow. That direction I remember is Gotham Broadcasting Corporation. The wave. Radio station. I see, he was talking about radio waves. Aaron instantly came to his senses, cringing that he hadn't understood it sooner. The three helicopters turned around the first time they received the order and headed in the direction of Phantom Kid. The situation was very unfavorable to Kid, because it was on air currents that gliders could fly in the sky, and the helicopter's propellers would stir the air currents around them making it very difficult to control the gliders, just by getting close to Kid, and the slightest mistake would cause them to fall straight down. Kid, look out, the helicopters are coming for you. At the sight of this scene, a young girl in the crowd shouted in alarm, causing the surrounding crowd to notice that scene. Young lady, thank you a lot for the warning, but don't worry, they won't be able to catch me. The charming voice of Phantom Kid emerged putting the minds of the worrying ignorant teenage girls in a state of hypnosis. While GCPD was righteously upset by this scene, how on earth could he dare to throw such mockery at the face of the police? Initially, I wanted to perform in front of everyone, but it's too bad that the police won't let you into the pavilion. To extend the helicopter's view, Gordon had localized them over the dividing line of the sea, where shallow water stops and deep water begins, which is far from the land. And so, Kid had a few dozen seconds to run away, although it wouldn't take long for the helicopter to catch up to him at such incredible speed. But how could Matheson just escape like this? His voice seemed to have magical powers to it and his regretful words instantly drew the empathy of the crowd, as soon as they were uttered. That's right, we came here to see Phantom Kid. Why shouldn't we be allowed in? Let us in now. Did you hear that? Kid needs us. His audience beyond the barrier, countless voices yelled in protest. This is private property, you can't go in. The officers maintaining the barrier could only resist with all their might and it was lucky that Gordon had arranged for the maximum number of men to be here, otherwise they would have been breached by the overflowing crowd. Humphrey, as a wise man once said, the people are the source of our strength. Matheson smiled at his win. Now he can go to the next step. Only three helicopters were seen gradually approaching the location of Phantom Kid. Two of them surrounded him from both sides, forming an obstacle, less than 30 meters apart from each other. While Kid remained calm, hovering over the collection, Phantom Kid, 
get any closer and you might fall to the ground from the aerial turbulence. At that moment, Aaron picked up a loudspeaker and shouted at Gid, land towards eleven o'clock if you want to surrender. At that, he saw that the white figure in the sky actually did fly in the direction of eleven o'clock. Attention A team, this is Jim Gordon, Phantom Kid has conceded defeat. Now immediately lift the barrier. At this point, Gordon's voice rang out over the intercoms of the entire GCPD crew. On the rooftop, Gordon was shocked. He didn't give that order. It was Phantom Kid who did. No, that wasn't me. Execute the order immediately. Gordon was about to speak but was straight away interrupted by Kid's voice. Thus, the barrier was officially lifted. Chapter 19, Hide and Seek. 4-5 Chapter, Enjoy. Boom. Just a moment after the barrier was lifted, a loud bang came from the air. The figure of Phantom Kid exploded without warning, followed by a thick cloud of smoke that enveloped it, making it impossible to see what was going on inside. What's going on? Is Kid dead? Impossible. It looks like Kid detonated himself. Kid wouldn't kill himself. The sudden shock caused the crowd to almost riot. But they soon started cheering. Four. A second explosion sounded. This time one of the windows of the collection was shattered, accompanied by the announcement that Phantom Kid had got in. Ladies and gentlemen, please follow me into the venue for the performance and then let's play a little game together. The lucky winner who can find me first will be granted an unforgettable gift. No, block the door. Don't let the crowd break in. Gordon yelled, and the GCPD officers hurried to carry out the instructions. Many having forgotten Gordon's earlier order unknowingly straying away from their initial posts. The collection hall structure was simple, but the overall specifications were large. The corridors were very long and there were a number of small aisles. The various teams appeared to be in their respective positions, but in fact, they were separated from each other, especially as Kin would occasionally imitate Gordon's voice and give various orders, completely messing up the police layout. It's not good, Jim. Barbara's gone. Gordon looked around and, sure enough, Barbara had vanished from the rooftop. By then, he immediately concluded that she went looking for Kid. As soon as he headed to search for his daughter, the walkie-talkie in his hand lit up. Report sir. This is Team A. Uh. A large number of civilians have gone around the sides of the building, smashed all the windows, then invaded the hall. We can't stop them from storming in anymore. The leader of Group A tried desperately to hold off the rioting tide of people at the main entrance, but could only stop a small portion of the crowd. He couldn't help but report the bad news to Gordon. He was hopeless. The frightening excitement on the faces of everyone in front of him intimidated the police barrier. How could there be so many mad fans when this was only the second time that Phantom Kid had ever committed the crime? In fact, Matheson hadn't had many fans who were truly fanatical about him yet and the reason for this was entirely the work of red magic. The nature of this magic itself can provoke human emotions very easily, plus one of the two magic charms that Matheson had refined yesterday was to make his voice more persuasive and confusing. So, after only a few speeches, Matheson had managed to stir up the nerves of excitement in the masses. But it wasn't really about being able to control emotions, it was a kind of guiding them, much like the job of most show hosts. Only this one was supernaturally empowered by his red magic. Forget it. There is no use in blocking it now that it's done. Lead the team outside now, block all the exits, and open immediate fire as soon as you see Phantom Kid. However, that wasn't the only thing that went wrong. Team B spotted a figure that looked like Kid. Whereas, in fact, it was not, until they got closer that they confirmed it was a dummy. Report. Team C has also spotted a dummy of Kid and there are two of them. Report. Group D. The various groups found a lot of Phantom Kid dummies that didn't move but were filled with gas, meaning that the other dummies, which were originally hidden under the carpet, could appear at any moment and attract most of the attention. Especially after the crowd had rushed inside, countless people would assume the dummies were Kid as soon as they saw them and jump at them crazily. The real Kid, Matheson, on the other hand, had quietly arrived at the sightseeing hall, by now dressed in a police uniform. Look, there's Phantom Kid. Arrest him now. Along the way, 
Whenever he met up with the GCPD police, Matheson would make the first move, pointing at the dummy in the distance and shouting. At the sight of the iconic white cloak and high-brimmed hat, all the officers rushed forward, completely ignoring the fact that Matheson was a suspicious person acting alone. He hadn't just infiltrated the collection a few hours earlier to set up the dummy. He hid in the pattern of the floor instantly inflatable dummies, which were so small before they were activated they were almost impossible to spot. At this point, Daggett's private collection was in a state of chaos. And the word private was no longer relevant. One would really wonder what Daggett would do once he knows about this situation. Wee woo wee woo. Suddenly, a sharp, rapid alarm sounded. It's the infrared alarm system that's been triggered. It's downstairs, let's get down there. Phantom Kid, you're done. Hearing the alarm, the police officers, who were being played into a headache by the countless dummies around, burst into joy and rushed downstairs. Not only the police, but the civilians who heard the alarm also rushed there. After all, Kid had said that whoever found him first, would get the gift of a lifetime. Matheson smirked and pressed the button in his pocket once again and then quietly made his way up to the first floor. Wee woo wee woo. Another alarm emerged. No, not a single one, but a whole fourteen. The second wave of alarms kept ringing, non-stop, for the next minutes. This alarm was triggered in every collection room. The police officers looked at each other, with not a single clue what was going on. Did Kid clone himself to be able to enter all the collection rooms at the same time? Damn it. Daggett never told us which collection room the cat's eye emerald was placed in. Otherwise we could have just held one place now. Inside the sightseeing hall, Gordon's face was ugly as hell. He slammed his fist heavily into the wall. For the second time in his life, an unspeakable sense of frustration had arisen. In a state of full tranquility, Matheson moved as fast as lightning, running quickly up to the first floor just as the police were largely concerned with the ground floor. In turn, he investigated all the collection rooms and the end result was all that Matheson had expected. Sure enough, the cat's eye emerald is not in any of the 14 collection rooms at all. After running through all the collection rooms, Matheson found no trace of the cat's eye emerald. When I stepped in before, it was not convenient to enter the collection rooms to check inside, so I was just speculating, but now my guess was proven correct. With a playful smile, Matheson estimated the time of all the policemen who had split into fourteen teams, and entered the collection room one by one. At that moment, once again. He descended unnoticed into the first floor's lobby and pressed the last button in his pocket. In an instant, the collection hall lost its light and was covered with darkness. Chapter 20, The Perfect Disguise, 5-5 five five Chapter, Enjoy. Damn. Why did the power go out again? Aaron's roar echoed throughout the entire hall collection. This time, the protection of the power distribution room was the police's top priority in order to ensure that Phantom Kid wouldn't have a chance to make a move on the electricity system. But now that the power was out, this only proves one thing, Barbara was right, Kid actually snuck in here early in the morning and blended in with us. He had quite enough time to do everything for his setup, all he had to do was arrange a dummy outside to attract the crowd. But who exactly did he pretend to be? It's clear that all the squads are configured in numbers of three or more, and, even for toilet breaks, they have to move in unity. So, which part of the process went wrong? Gordon could never figure out where Phantom Kid's breakthrough was. Suddenly, a familiar figure flashed through his mind. There was only one person who suddenly showed up alone, who could win the trust of all the GCPD personnel, and who had set everything up without knowing it. Does that mean it's but how is that possible, if the person is kid in disguise? Then, his, disguise is terrifying, can the helicopter squad hear you? What's the situation outside the pavilion? Did they spot Phantom Kid escaping? In any case, the most important thing was to first confirm if Kid was still here. Sir, we haven't found any sign of Kid, he should still be inside. Hearing this, Gordon was a bit relieved. The helicopter pilot was basically either flying in the sky or landing to do maintenance on the helicopter alone, or refueling it, so there was no need to worry about kid imitating their voices, as there was no chance of them making contact. 
Since it was confirmed that Kid was still inside, it meant that he hadn't stolen the jewel yet, or he hadn't found a suitable way to get out yet and had to buy some time by cutting the lights out. Team F, what's your status there? Can you restore the power supply? Please answer once you copy. Copy, sir. The power distribution box has been destroyed by the explosion and it will take at least half an hour to repair the lines. What about the backup power supply? Copy, this place is not equipped with a backup power supply. Well, it was certain that lighting would not be restored any time soon, but Gordon was not completely without a plan to deal with the current situation. S team, it's time for you to make the move. The so-called S-Team was made up of dozens of elite police officers selected by Gordon, each equipped with night vision goggles, specifically to deal with the current situation. And the man leading the team was none other than Gordon himself. The dozens of elite policemen wearing night vision goggles were divided into two teams, searching the upper and lower floors respectively. As for the remaining hundreds of policemen and thousands of spectators, some chose to stay where they were while others chose to turn on their mobile phone torches and follow them to find Kid. Meanwhile, on the ground floor of the collection hall, in an enclosed corridor that connects the left and right collection rooms, a pretty young girl with a beautiful figure appeared. Despite the fact that she was wearing a pair of high heels, she walked with muffled steps, as if she was trying to avoid everyone's attention. There's definitely something wrong here. Barbara stared at the corridor full of contradiction. With all that intense training he had gone through before, night vision was indeed one of his abilities. So even in the dark, he could see objects within a certain range. Yes, Barbara was the subject of Matheson's disguise this time, midday, while resting on the beach. The familiar figure he had seen was none other than Barbara. Barbara did not go straight to Gordon but chose to familiarize herself with the surrounding roads first as Matheson did, in a true detective fashion. The thief needs to plan an escape route, while the detective has to deduce the thief's escape route and then design a pursuit route. Often, the nature of this conflict works like this. The first thing that Matheson was reluctant to do was to disguise himself as a woman, but he was too familiar with Barbara to have any trouble fooling Gordon. As for the ordinary policeman, it was a piece of cake for him to fool them. In addition, everyone had the impression that Phantom Kid was a male, so it was even less likely that Barbara would be suspected at all once seen Matheson in disguise. Besides, this place was not a good place to sneak into, and there was really no better choice than Barbara. So, when Barbara wasn't looking, Matheson quietly glued a transmitter on her clothes. That's right, the one that Phantom Kid's worst enemy likes to use, Conan Edogawa the small tech prop manufacturing book that he got from the system's novice gift package at the beginning contains all the tech manufacturing methods from the universe of Detective Conan. Such pieces of equipment allowed an underage schoolboy to kick a football ball that was more powerful than a bomb, to a range farther than the one of a sniper rifle, and then ride a skateboard that is faster than a sports car that could additionally be charged during the day and used at night. Matheson knows the method of making all these tools, although it was quite a shame that some of them cannot be recovered to be reused because of the lack of raw materials. Anyways, after installing the transmitter on Barbara, Matheson waited for the right moment, and, finally, he stunned Barbara and hid her in the cabin of the yacht under the Gotham River Bridge. In order to perfect his disguise, he had to take Barbara's clothes off. How could that be possible? Although Matheson never hid his attraction to beautiful women, Barbara was his childhood friend, and so, he would never think of doing anything to her while she is in a coma. He simply pulled off Barbara's coat and put his own clothes over her body to protect her from catching any cold. Going back to our scene at the hall, Matheson, who is wearing Barbara's face above his own, withdrew his gaze at the corridor. He had now almost figured out the secret of the place. There were not just 14 collecting rooms in Daggett's collection, but there existed a 15th, a secret room. If I'm not mistaken, the mechanism should be here. Every skilled magician is a master of mechanisms. Setting up secret doors is something they only play with, and this place was certainly no match for Matheson. He stepped on his heels and walked to the middle of the corridor, the point where the collection rooms at the left and right are joined on the first floor. 
According to the plan, they were directly in front of a rotunda in the center of the building, then, with his back turned to the direction of the hall, facing the curved wall, Matheson reached out and tapped on the right side at an arm's length. Rumble rumble. Sure enough, after knocking, the wall in front of him quaked, and the secret room where Daggett's real collection was stored opened. However, when the secret door was completely opened, Matheson was shocked. A human figure had appeared within his eyesight. Chapter 21. Meeting Catwoman Again. 1-5 Chapter. Enjoy. You really did find your way here. Before Matheson could say anything, it was the person hiding in the chamber who spoke first. It was a sexy voice. A voice that Matheson knew very well. Catwoman, Serena Kyle. I never expected you'd show up here, Catwoman. In the blink of an eye, Matheson washed away the surprised expression from his face and replaced it with a confident cold face, saying in Barbara's voice, HMPH, you won't have to maintain that disguise in front of me. Phantom Kid, Serena snorted coldly, are you going to ask me again how I can see through you? There's no use to even think about it. The only person who can unlock the secrets of this place, other than its owner, is the expert thief who can do it. No matter who you disguised yourself as, as long as you are the one who opened the secret door alone, you must be Phantom Kid. Speaking of which, Serena stared Matheson up and down and sket. What I didn't expect is to see Phantom Kid obsessed with females in such a perverted way. Your skin is so nice. Not gonna lie, I'm a little jealous. It wasn't as if Matheson expected to be able to hide from Catwoman. He was merely trying to be sneaky. After all, it was unlikely that the GCPD would find anything unusual here, apart from Kid. Furthermore, Although it wouldn't be a challenge for Gordon to crack the mechanism and gain entrance with his intelligence, his work ethic binds him. Hence, he wouldn't even think about trying to capture Kid in such ways. I don't mind sharing my own skincare routine if you'd like. So, beautiful Miss Kyle, did someone hire you to snap the cat's eye emerald again this time? Instantly shedding his disguise, Matheson changed into the costume of Phantom Kid, and Serena stared at him intently trying to get a slight glimpse at this magical trick of swift changing. Serena was called Catwoman, not only because her body is as flexible as a cat's, but also because her eyes are as bright as a cat's. She could see far more clearly in the dark, allowing her to maneuver more easily and comfortably at night than Matheson. However, no matter how amazing Catwoman's eyesight was, she still couldn't see exactly how Kid managed to turn into another person with a pull and a flip of his clothes. Yes, I did get hired, the cat's eye emerald is already in Catwoman's pocket. You wouldn't want to snatch a cat's eye, would you? Serena said, making a rude face, her voice trembling slightly, making it sound both nice and heartbreaking. Oh, Miss Kyle, your acting skills are just not good enough. I think the man who hired you is Daggett. He wants you to stop me from stealing the jewel. Am I right? The moment Matheson saw Serena he knew why Daggett wasn't here. It wasn't that he didn't care about his gems at all. It was that he had Catwoman as a secret weapon. Generally speaking, there were only a few famous thieves in Gotham. The strongest ones had gone into retirement in Arkham, and none of the rest was really as good as Serena. Phantom Kid had been making a big name for himself lately, but he was still a criminal newcomer at the end of the day, the kind who avoids killing, and in a city like Gotham. He wouldn't even rank as the new criminal star of the year. Unfortunately, what Daggett didn't know was that Phantom Kid had already fought Catwoman and was the winning side. There was no way Serena would tell Daggett about this because she dreamed of getting the Purge program and would do anything for it. Hence, she couldn't let Daggett doubt her abilities. Bang! It wasn't Serena who responded to Matheson. It was the gun in her hand. Hey! Miss Kyle! Don't you think you are overreacting? I haven't even snatched your eyes yet. Matheson had long been on guard, he expected this attack and dodged it with a smooth dash of his body. Hey! Don't you forget we have a beef, now to settle the score. The last time, you stole Adam's star, which caused me to almost get shot by my employer's men indiscriminately. It took a while to calm their anger, not to mention my current employer wants me to kill you in addition to protecting the gem. Exclamation mark. Bang. 
Another shot was fired, and Matheson obediently retreated outside the dark door, using the corner of the corridor, and the chamber, as cover. Miss Kyle, the sound of gunfire will soon attract the police and by then, I'm afraid the GCPD will have captured two wanted criminals," Matheson said as he pulled out his poker gun and listened to Serena's breathing to determine her stance and location. Do you think there's only one secret door to get in and out of this secret room? The police will come, but you'll be a corpse by then. Serena looked triumphantly. The mechanism of the secret door is wonderfully tied together with the door to the collection room. When the secret door opens, those two doors into the corridor will automatically lock, it will still take a little time for the police to get in, and that's enough time for you to shoot me a few hundred times with your gun, right? Matheson said what Serena hadn't said. Ha ha, you're right, for some reason you seem to know me quite well, and I really don't want to kill you. Hum, is it my charm that has persuaded you? Wow, even under these circumstances, you're actually in the mood for such jokes, TSK. I started to like you a little. Serena's A's were confused. She didn't know what kid is up to, with numerous cops banging on the door outside, and the only exit guarded by herself. He would be shot dead as soon as he would appear, merely a small opening of the door, hardly opened, would make a blind man a sharpshooter. The only way out was to force his way into the secret room, otherwise, there were only two outcomes, to be killed by Serena or to be taken away by the police. At this point, the same process was going through Matheson's mind, only that he came to a very different conclusion from Serena's. He took out a special playing card made of an extremely special material, which was small, heavy, hard, and resistant to heat. He had only one special card. By stuffing this special playing card into the poker gun, the preparations were complete. I have only one chance. Matheson had a crazy idea, one that was unrealistic but still possible. Not a big deal, I'll take a bullet. Taking a deep breath, Matheson's A's brightened and his ears flicked, listening to Serena's breathing. Then, there were seconds of dead silence. Finally, with a flash of light in his eyes, Matheson stepped inside the hidden door in an instant. Bang! Bang! Serena had been waiting for him for a long time and naturally pulled the trigger. And, for a split of a second, within the room, two gunshots echoed. Chapter 22 The Gift of a Lifetime 2-5 Chapter Enjoy A strand of hair floated down from Serena's head, and she froze in place, dumbfounded, unable to believe what she had just seen. Phantom Kid is actually able to use a gun. Ark. It didn't seem like anything extraordinary, but the problem was that the bullet he used was special. Still, with the gun he was shooting playing cards out of, and not just any playing card, he shot just a second before, Serena and Matheson had fired at the same time. She hadn't expected Kid to be such a good marksman, with a miraculously accurate calculation. The playing card collided with the bullet Serena had fired, and the inexplicably sharp playing cards had sliced the bullet into half. After slicing through the bullet, the poker's momentum continued unabated brushing past Serena's face and cutting off a chunk of her hair. Miss Kyle, it looks like you've lost to me once again. Taking advantage of Serena's loss of focus, Matheson quickly closed the distance between them and snatched her weapon. Yes, you win. So what are you going to do with me? Serena said helplessly, spreading her hands. She was Catwoman. A thief, not a hero. In fact, she was much less a thief than some nonsensical chivalrous man. To think that she would have such a response, to embrace death, to act generously, was insane. If you come as a winner, you have beaten your opponent. If you come as a loser, you surrender or run away. That's what a wise person would do. Yes, we agree that she had accepted Daggett's offer and promised to protect the jewel. But she isn't willing to put her life on the line to do so. Not even for the purge program. Well, you know what? Miss Kyle, sometimes it's hard to be too wise. I thought you were going to jump at me without thinking. It was a relief for Matheson too. Something like bullet poker cards belongs to the world of fantasy. And if he hadn't practiced them in simulation before, he wouldn't have dared to use them. As soon as Matheson's body stepped through the hidden door and entered the chamber completely, the door closed automatically. The mechanism was activated and the two doors into the corridor were automatically unlocked. 
Meanwhile, in the collection chamber, Gordon was about to have his men blast open the lock, yet the door suddenly opened by itself. Be careful everyone, two different gunshots sounded from inside. It's likely that Phantom Kid is in a fight with someone. The enemies are armed, so be careful not to get hurt. Alarming his team, Gordon took the lead, maintaining a ready stance to shoot, as he slowly made his way into the corridor. Bit by bit, he moved forward, and by the time he reached the dark door, he happened to meet with the team from the other collection room, neither side having spotted Kid's whereabouts. What is this? Has Kid disappeared out of thin air? Some of the officers exclaimed. No way. There must be some kind of hidden door or something here. Spread out and look for any mechanism that could trigger it. And be careful to act within the boundaries of law. Aaron said dismissively. He didn't believe that people would somehow disappear. Phantom Kid. The police are already outside. It will only take a few minutes before they find out about this place. And when they do. Serena tried to make the smile on her face look more natural and friendly. Well, then, Matheson hummed and tied her last knot, he looked at it carefully for a few moments and was pleased with his craft, he confirmed that even an escape master would need quite a bit of work to get out of this tie. I mean, you could have done it without tying me up, we could have joined hands. After all, we are peers, aren't we? You even said I was your senior last time, do you remember that? And I know where the secret passage is here where you can just escape. Serena was helpless, wondering how she could get Phantom Kid to change his mind. This is the cat's eye emerald from Daggett's collection, nice, it's beautiful. Matheson ignored Catwoman's plea and instead searched in the chamber, quickly finding her target. Catwoman screamed in her mind. What kind of knot was this guy tying? And why was it so hard to undo? She had been tied numerous times, but no matter how firm a knot was, she could free herself from it in less than three seconds. It was only the knot that Matheson had tied that gave her a feeling of helplessness. There is a saying that the treasures in this secret chamber just are not of the same quality as the dozen or so hidden in the rooms outside. And, in addition to the cat's eye emerald, there was a lot of hard currency stored mostly gold, with some antique relics, there were also a few gems worth more than gold and the cat's eye emerald, not as nice as the cat's eye, but all of them were of the finest quality. Unfortunately, Phantom never does anything other than what he writes in his teaser letters, I will come back for another visit when I'm interested in something else, listening to Matheson talking to himself on the side, Serena couldn't help but roll her eyes, saying that he will come back whenever he wishes to. Matheson is talking as if Daggett's private collection wasn't so hard to be infiltrated, but, again, this is Phantom Kid we are talking about. Miss Kyle, what do you seem to have something against me? No, no, why would I oppose you, I think you're right. Serena was startled and obeyed her inner thoughts. Strangely enough, despite being tied up by Kid, she couldn't hate him. Even the shot she had just fired had settled her feud with him over the Adams Star incident. She accepted that she was not as good as him, this time. So, after this deal, she decided that she will just avoid him if she happens to encounter him in the future. Whoever wanted the title of Gotham's number one thief could have it. She knows how good he is. He did not initiate these crimes to play around. It's a pity, isn't it? The jewels are beautiful but they don't quite match this necklace. They're both beautiful separately, but they have to be combined together. Matheson removed the cat's eye emerald from the necklace and only then nodded in satisfaction. Oh, by the way, didn't you say you would give the person who found you first, a gift of a lifetime? I don't suppose anyone guessed your identity before I did. Suddenly, Serena remembered Matheson's declaration from earlier, she didn't ask for any precious gift. She just wanted him to untie her before the police arrive and arrest her. Well, Miss Kyle, you've reminded me that I did say that. Matheson mused, seemingly embarrassed. Unfortunately, I didn't think anyone would actually be able to spot me. I don't have anything on me but this cat's eye emerald. I'm sorry. I can't give it to you. There are quite a few treasures in this room, but unfortunately they belong to Mr. Daggett and I have no right to give you one of them. The corners of Serena's mouth twitched, were these human words? So the cat's eye emerald already belonged to your family? That's okay, I don't need any treasures, I just need you to help me. 
The words stopped abruptly because Matheson suddenly reached up to lift Serena's chin, while the other hand removed her mask, revealing Serena's facial features. From Catwoman's perspective, Phantom Kid smiled wickedly as his face pressed even closer. What does he want? Kiss me forcibly? What kind of gift is this? Serena's heart beat faster as she remembered that Kid had snatched Adam's star from her chest. Will he do the same to me now? MMM. She felt Kid's hand on her shoulder and couldn't help but blush and close her eyes. It wasn't so much because of the kiss he was leaning into, but the fact that her hands and feet were still tied had given her the impression that her situation resembled to bondage. Who can stand such a thing, after a while? The imaginary rough kiss did not happen, even Matheson's hand left her shoulder, Serena opened her eyes in confusion. Phantom Kid had disappeared and the secret passage had been opened. At the same time, the secret door was also opened by the police, and Gordon and the others rushed in, catching a glimpse of Serena with her hands and feet bound, and the necklace around her neck. Precisely, a necklace with a card on it. Chapter 23, The Second Mission's Reward 3-5 Chapter, Enjoy, I'll take the cat's eye emerald. Besides, this necklace is my gift to Miss Kyle for being the first one to find me from Phantom Kid. After reading the contents of the card, Gordon clenched his fists. Within a few minutes, a message came from the helicopter squad saying that a man had suddenly appeared on the beach dressed to match Kid's features, the man had jumped into the sea after appearing and had then been lost. Three helicopters were patrolling the sea, and since Kid didn't carry any diving equipment, theoretically it wouldn't be long before he had to come up to the surface to change his air, but in reality, he didn't. Maneuvering around, the maintenance crew also happened to have the wiring repaired and the lighting system restored. The surroundings were as bright as day. Only that everything has been restored too late, once everything ended, twice in a row. The entire GCPD crew had been played by Phantom Kid, and Gordon felt a deep sense of powerlessness. Yes, compared to killing. Stealing is indeed not a particularly bad type of crime, unless it is a state's secret that was being stolen. However, the rampant acts of Phantom Kid had infinitely increased the nature of the crime. For his charisma was so terrible that, once people began to pursue him as a criminal, the social order was seriously disrupted. It's really Catwoman. Even though Phantom Kid ran away, it's always nice to capture another wanted thief. Aaron was not as frustrated as Gordon and smiled happily when he confirmed Serena's identity. Aaron, wrap up the team. Gordon walked out of the chamber without looking back, appearing sad and disappointed. He knew that in a few days Catwoman would break out of prison again, or be bailed out by some unknown wealthy owner. In short, Gotham had no idea how many criminals hiding underground needed the presence of people like Catwoman to help them accomplish their shameful business. Only, Gordon knew in his heart that he couldn't reveal this kind of thing publicly. Because eight years ago, these crimes had been out in the open, and he had spent so many years hiding so many messed up things into the ground, that he prefers to let them stay buried in the earth forever. Meanwhile, after jumping into the sea, Matheson dived down the current into the Gotham River until he reached the location of the hidden yacht. For nearly an hour, Matheson didn't even poke his head out of the sea. Not because he was actually able to shut his breath for that long, but because he relied on the second magical charm he had made. This magic charm was designed to give one the ability to breathe underwater for a short period of time. One of the few buff spells in red magic. Once on the yacht. He immediately changed into the clothes he had already prepared and then headed for the Merchant River Basin. For the next few hours, the GCPD would surely be searching for himself with all their might on Downtown Island, and it was not safe to stop at the Gotham River. Sometime later, the yacht pulled up somewhere in the Merchant River, near Gotham's old town, a distant counterpart to the Edinburgh district, where the GCPD's headquarters were located. Matheson was in no hurry to get back, not forgetting that there was a young oracle lying inside the cabin. From the deck down to the cabin, there was Barbara, asleep. It had only been a few hours since Barbara had been stunned, and Matheson was absolutely confident in his ability to control the amount of drugs he used. It would take another ten minutes or so for Barbara to wake up. It's really thanks to you this time, 
Barbara. Matheson walked over to the sleeping Barbara and gently stroked her hair. Having spent so many years with Barbara, and being such a charming beauty, would Matheson be human if he didn't have some sexy thoughts? Besides, Barbara had always been a lonely weird guy among her classmates since she was a child, and her only partner has been Matheson, and maybe her brother James Jr. Everyone knows that Matheson and Barbara are inseparable, even Barbara's father, Gordon, looks at Matheson in all sorts of different ways, maybe they are trying to avoid attention or drama but, for a variety of reasons, the two haven't become an official couple yet. This, of course, has something to do with Matheson's initial ambition, to become Gotham's top thief, but that's not the point. It really isn't, after a few minutes of admiring Barbara's sleeping face, Matheson estimated that it was about time that she would wake up and slipped a card into Barbara's hand before turning to leave. Driving the yacht near the GCPD, Matheson abandoned the ship and disappeared into the darkness. Just after Matheson left, Barbara opened her eyes momentarily and sat up. The clothes she was wearing were no longer her original ones, but that was the least of her concern. There was just an inexplicable sparkle in Barbara's eyes as she stared at the card in her hand with the head of Phantom Kid on it. Beautiful Miss Gordon, I apologize for borrowing your clothes without your consent, so I have compensated you with a new outfit that I hope you will enjoy. Sincerely, Phantom Kid. Back at Phantom Kid's stronghold, Matheson changed back into his normal clothes and walked into the basement. Time to check out the system rewards this time. He opened up the system and checked the panel. Sure enough, the little exclamation point appeared again in the host section. Press to take a look. Stolen treasure. Cat's eye emerald. Treasure value. C. Difficulty. Medium. Magnificence rating. B. Special note. Using a transcendent ability will result in an enhanced magnificence rating scale. Reading this, Matheson frowned, but when he thought about it, it wasn't hard to sort out. For a simple example, both magic tricks and red magic can achieve mind-blowing effects, but magic tricks obviously cannot match the convenience of red magic. After all, red magic does not require a lot of props and ample preparation. The visual experience is also very different. Therefore, the two methods must necessarily be accompanied by different evaluation systems. While enjoying the convenience of red magic and being able to complete tasks more easily, the corresponding requirements will also be a little higher. So, if he wants to increase his magnificence rating, he either mustn't use his transcendental abilities and rely on his intelligence and wits to win or continue to use his extraordinary abilities, but he needs to win the attention of more people. Having processed this notion, Matheson had some feasible solutions in mind, he even thought that he could use different things depending on the actual situation. Moving on to his long-awaited system reward. Final rating, B. Reward, all of Carlos's combat experience. Carlos, from the world of the wanted order in existence that is considered the king of assassins, mastering countless supernatural marksmanship techniques with his strongest ability being bullet time. The reward includes what Carlos has learned throughout his life, including bullet time, and is given to the host in a memory inheritance mode, so you can master it without practice. Chapter 24, Bruce wants to come back. 4-5 Chapter, Enjoy. This reward is a lot less useful than last time. Matheson was a little disappointed. Those shooting techniques in the Wanted Order are actually quite similar to the ones in the Phantom Kid's repertoire. His playing cards aren't worse than those bullet turning tricks, and are way more enjoyable. The only tactic that works is bullet time. Although this time slowdown ability has many limitations, it is still a very useful skill. Until Matheson manages to learn time stop magic. This is just the thing to use as a replacement. The last fair improvement is that his fighting skills have significantly increased. The assassin training is not just about playing with guns. Close combat is also very much a part of it, and it's not just fist fighting that one learns, but also killing techniques that finish enemies. After hiding the cat's eye emerald, Matheson left the stronghold and headed back to his real home. Of course. There were a lot of costume changing and route detouring along the way. Meanwhile, inside Wayne Manor, Bruce sat on the sofa in silence. 
his eyes constantly blinking as if he was struggling with something important. Master Wayne, the news broadcast is over, and Phantom Kid is won, Alfred reminded. I know, Alfred, Bruce said with a deep voice. Have I become stupid? The teaser letter said an invitation to the wave and I honestly thought it was the ocean's wave. I can't believe I overlooked the fact that Gotham Broadcasting also happens to be on Downtown Island. Phantom Kid has won this time. The old me would never have made such a cheap mistake. With all due respect, Master Wayne, the kid who appeared in the sky in the first place was just a dummy, and even if we had guessed the correct teaser, we wouldn't have been able to catch him. Alfred was very serious, he did not want Bruce to question himself again over this trivial matter. But at the same time, there was a hint of relief that Bruce might finally go back to the surface and see sunlight. Or, to be more accurate, go back to the surface and remain in the darkness. No, Alfred, you don't see the point. Bruce shook his head as he stood up on his crutches. His long period of inactivity combined with various injuries left over from the past had left him with an almost numb right leg. The whereabouts and degree of his injuries are still unknown, as he was reluctant to go to the hospital to have it checked out. Phantom Kid is very different from what we thought he was, he's not a simple thief. Bruce's words were tinged with vague apprehension. Gordon's no match for him, I think. You think it's time to bring him back? Alfred interrupted. I'm sorry. Master Wayne, but I don't think it's a good idea. Gotham needs you, but it needs your resources, your contacts, your wisdom, not your life. What Gotham really needs is Bruce Wayne, not Batman. Alfred was thrilled. He was now grey-haired. Although he was only a butler, Bruce had been raised by him. In Bruce's mind, Alfred had become almost the equivalent of a father. Similarly, Alfred, who has no wife or children, had long regarded Bruce as the person he cared for most. Rachel said she would come back to me the day Gotham no longer needs Batman, but she died. Alfred, you know what Rachel has meant to me. For eight years, Gotham didn't need Batman, but I've also lost the meaning of my life. You can't always stay in Gotham. Alfred suddenly became harsh, which reminded Bruce of the time when Alfred had raised him after his parents' death. Alfred was just as harsh then. Look at the world and you will find countless good things to do. Do you remember before everything happened, before Batman was born? You left Gotham and disappeared for seven whole years, and I never wanted you to return to Gotham because all you remember of it is pain. Stop it, Alfred. Bruce suddenly yelled, regretfully, and then kept silent. Make an appointment for me to go to a hospital tomorrow to have my leg checked and see if it can still be cured. With those words, Bruce returned to his bedroom with his crutches. Which hospital do you want to go to? Alfred asked as he looked at Bruce's back. The one I used to go to. Of course, Dash. Blagate Prison. The massive prison that stood on Blagate Island, had the reputation of being both the hardest prison in the world to break out of and the easiest to break into. It is a forbidden place in Gotham City, second only to Arkham Asylum. Today, a new visitor entered the place, Serena Kyle, nickname, Catwoman, has committed multiple jewel thefts, has over ten arrests but has successfully escaped each time. Her first escape was when she was 16 years old, an infamous thug. Jim, you've given me a big issue today. The head of Blagate Prison frowned. Gordon, who was escorting Catwoman himself, replied. But she's never been to Blagate, has she? You know, put her in a normal prison and she'd slip away within days. I'd only be comfortable if she was with you, here. But Blagate Prison never holds female prisoners. Gordon calmly said. The Dante Act stipulates that under special circumstances, male and female prisoners are allowed to live together. Well, well, it's just a kitty, not one of those weirdos from back in the day. In addition, Blagate doesn't release its prisoners. I suggest that she be given a single room. Oh, I understand. After all, the prisoners here are all cruel men. No, Gordon shook his head, because she'll cripple all the other inmates. After leaving Blagate Prison, Gordon didn't go straight home but drove to the GCPD, not because he liked working late but because the GCPD policeman on duty had called him not long ago to say that Barbara was in the station. If it hadn't been for the escort of Catwoman, he would have rushed back to the GCPD. Dad, 
As soon as he got back to the police station, Barbara ran over and hugged Gordon. Father and daughter looked at each other without uttering a word. Seeing that Barbara was safe and sound, Gordon was relieved to know that the previous Barbara he met was a fake, phantom kid disguise. If kid had dared to hurt his daughter, Gordon would have done anything to shoot the devil. Fortunately, kid didn't hurt Barbara. The next day, all of Gotham's major media outlets turned on Phantom Kid like crazy. Two high-profile crimes in a row, both successfully stealing high-value gems, and a dress that was a total eye-catcher, dominating the front pages of all the news. Archie Gotham University, in one of the classrooms, Matheson sneezed, drawing a blank stare from his table mate Barbara. Chapter 25, Suspicions, 5-5 Chapter, Enjoy. The weather is very good these few days. How did you catch a cold? Matheson sneezed several times in quick succession. His nose still red. Barbara said helplessly. Maybe it's because I took a cold shower yesterday and went to bed at night without a blanket. Matheson found himself an excuse after swimming in the cold seawater for over an hour last night. How could he not catch a cold? He would be lucky if he didn't get a fever. After all, the magic charm only allowed him to breathe like a fish, not make him as resistant to freezing as a fish. I mean, don't look for a lame excuse, okay? I've known you for over ten years and I've never seen you take a cold shower. Barbara leaned in close to Matheson and stared into his eyes. You didn't go swimming in the middle of the night, did you? At that, Matheson's thoughts stuttered. Did Barbara know something? He maintained his calm and said with a confused look, What are you talking about, who will go swimming in the middle of the night, and even if one goes to the swimming pool, it is not guaranteed for them to catch a cold? You fool, who are you calling a fool? Barbara said angrily. Well, anyway, I'll be fine tomorrow, so don't worry about me, said Matheson in a soothing tone. No one is worried about you, you devil. Barbara's face blushed for a moment, as she said angrily. At this, Matheson hemmed, whoever just blushed now. TSK, the relationship between you two is good, but can you stop flirting in the classroom? There are still plenty of single people here, like me. At that moment, a dissatisfied voice interrupted the conversation between the two. Matheson turned around to see a pretty, wavy-looking girl sitting behind the two. Daisy, Barbara said in surprise. What are you doing in school? Actually. I was the first one into class today, but you guys ignored me. Daisy expressed how hurt she was. Weren't you planning on graduating early and going to work as an intern for the female astronomer program? Wow, you guys won't believe me when I tell you, Jane. Oh that's my current internship tutor, she likes to study some weird things, like Norse mythology, she seems to think those are true, it's all those rainbow bridges. Thunder gods, evil gods and such. I'm sure you all know that. Daisy sighed. She was already beginning to wonder if her tutor's PhD was fake. Yes, she was Daisy Lewis, an intern with Thor's girlfriend, Jane Foster. Daisy had just followed Jane's internship a few months ago. Matheson and Barbara had met Daisy when they first started college, and the three were considered close friends. Like Barbara, Daisy was not well liked for similar reasons. Barbara was a top computer genius. Daisy was a superb student, almost always ahead of her time in any course she took, getting scholarships every year, and even graduating early from Gotham University after only two years. At this time, Matheson was far more popular than either of them and was extremely popular at the school. He was handsome, a magician, a good sportsman, funny, and thoughtful. At first, Matheson didn't know who Daisy was until she mentioned Jane's internship, only then Matheson remembered who she was. The other day, Jane told me that she seemed to have picked up some unusual waves and was going on a trip to New Mexico. Hearing this, Matheson's eyes twitched. Thor, the god of thunder, was going to be exiled to Earth soon. Then the Great War in New York should not be far away. Although he was in Gotham, near New York. The Chaitori army should not be able to reach it, which did not lightly concern him. He just didn't know exactly when Thor would be dropped down to Earth. After all, it was normal for a researcher like Jane's to be delayed for months or even half a year at a whim. That's why you didn't get along with her? 
Matheson asked. Oh, never mind, Jane said she had to go to her tutor, an old man called Kiwig or something like that, and it would take about ten days. So I was given the time off in the meantime, and I didn't have anything to do, so I came to school to have some fun. That should be Eric Selvig. Matheson's mouth twitched, that was how Daisy was. Despite her superior intelligence, she occasionally revealed her natural nerd nature. The three chatted for a while until the class began. What do you think of that beach on the south coast of downtown Ireland? What do you think of the view? Barbara asked abruptly. Matheson was instantly alerted to the fact that, as far as he could remember, he had never been there with Barbara. So why would she suddenly ask such a question? Barbara was already suspicious. Had he revealed something yesterday? But he had never been in Barbara's presence awake, she was always asleep when he was around. Even after extensive thinking, Matheson couldn't think of what had made Barbara suspicious. Is it because he had a cold? Simply because of that? Downtown Island Beach. It's always been a tourist destination, and, from the promotional map, the scenery there is very beautiful. Speaking of which, we haven't been there yet. Matheson pretended not to hear Barbara's implication and said, What? Do you want to go and have some fun? Let's go together sometime. Barbara was speechless for a moment and was wondering if she had really suspected the wrong person. Matheson didn't look like he was acting. And she had already tested him several times today, without success. She imagined Matheson's as a heartless criminal. But he didn't look like the smart and witty kid. Wrong. Kid was so good at disguise that even the people who knew him best couldn't see through him, so who knew if he was putting on this look on purpose? Barbara sized up Matheson suspiciously. She still feels that something is wrong with him. Whoa. You guys are going to downtown Island Beach? Are you going on a date? Daisy intervened once again into the conversation between the two. Trust me. It's a couple's holiday paradise, especially if you sunbathe there. It's so comfortable, I tried it once. She had a point, it was indeed a cozy place. Matheson agreed. Having experienced it just yesterday, Daisy turned to Barbara and winked at her, teasing, Barbara, are you finally brave enough to take that step, or did Matheson come at you first? Barbara covered Daisy's mouth. This display of excitement made Matheson look astonished, even as the eyes of the entire classroom turned to them. Miss Gordon, what are you doing? From the podium, the professor looked at Barbara with a kind look. Chapter 26 Take the initiative, Barbara. 1-5 Chapter Enjoy. No, you haven't made it clear to Matheson by now. After class, Daisy took Barbara aside and whispered. Matheson was curious, but Daisy glared at him and wouldn't let him follow her. So he had to go ahead and leave school first, his classes were calm and relaxing. And, so, while he had plenty of time, he'd always practice red magic. Daisy, has anyone ever told you that you would get beaten for throwing random guesses at me? Barbara raised her small fist, threateningly. Besides, I have nothing to tell him. Hey, whatever you say, it won't be me who regrets it eventually. Daisy bristled. What do you mean by that? Barbara wondered. Geez, are you really stupid or just acting like one? I thought my emotional intelligence was low enough, but I didn't realize you were worse than me. Daisy faced herself. Don't you forget how popular that guy is. He's the one who gets the most letters every year on Valentine's Day, and you're not even a little worried. Worried about what? Barbara still didn't understand what Daisy was trying to say. Okay, well, let me be frank with you then. Aren't you afraid that one day Matheson will have a girlfriend? A girlfriend? Who? Barbara asked without any second thought. Seeing how you're reacting now, maybe you're a slow thinker, after all. Daisy gazed at Barbara and said, I don't know which girl is going to take Matheson's heart. I only know that it definitely won't be you, with the way you're acting right now. Why? Would I want to be his girlfriend? Barbara asked aloud spontaneously red-faced. If you raise your voice any louder, the whole school is going to hear you. Daisy hastily gestured for Barbara to keep her voice down. Don't you dare say you don't like Matheson. I... I don't. Well wow, if you keep acting tough, then I'm going to tell you the harsh truth. Daisy's expression was suddenly serious. Fang is a very good man and it's hard for any girl to resist his charm. 
But do you know why no girl has dared to pursue him until now? Here, Daisy even referred to Matheson by his family name. The answer is, you. Daisy pointed at Barbara, because you were always with him whenever and wherever you were, and everyone thought you were a couple. That's why no one tried to seduce Matheson. But it's clear to anyone who knows you that you're not together yet and sooner or later that will be known to everyone and, when that happens, how many girls do you think will come looking for him? Believe me. No man in the world could stand the temptation unless he was gay. If it weren't for the fact that you're my bestie, I might have gone down on him already. I can tell he treats you differently than he treats others, but it doesn't seem to be the kind of affection that lovers have for each other so you'll have to take the initiative or you'll lose him sooner or later. After hearing Daisy's words, Barbara's mind was blown. She really hadn't thought that so many people would like Matheson, let alone that even Daisy had actually had her eyes set on him. Did she really have to take the initiative? No. What she needed to find out before making her move was, what kind of feelings did she have for Matheson? More importantly, she now also suspects that Matheson might be Phantom Kid. How could the daughter of a police chief be in a relationship with a thief? Ugh. Barbara shook her head. What the hell was she thinking? She wasn't even certain if Matheson was Phantom Kid or not. Did you really ever like Matheson? Suddenly, Barbara glanced at Daisy with a confused look in her eyes. Yeah, I have no reason to lie to you. But I am not thinking about it anymore. Because of me? Of course not. Why do you think that? Daisy looked at Barbara in wonder. I can't see that this little girl is possessive, still. No one else can like Matheson when you are always around him. Ah, Barbara was speechless, and she understood at this point that she seemed to have misrepresented herself. Actually, it's because I'm obsessed with another guy. No, to be precise, he's my idol. He's really handsome. I've never seen anyone that attractive. At this point, Daisy's eyes were full of sparkles, clearly, in a helpless obsession with the idol she was talking about. Barbara's mouth twitched as she watched. Is there really such a person in Gotham as you say? Barbara suddenly had a bad feeling about this. Hey, Daisy. When you say idol, you don't mean. That's right. My idol is that super thief who recently made his debut, Phantom Kid. At the moment, Matheson was oblivious to the fact that the two women were talking about him. He was now preoccupied with his magical meditation. Although red magic is enhanced by magical meditation, the effect was not very strong because the magic of the red which is almost always passed on to the next generation through the bloodline. The enhancement of magic power from meditation is almost trivial. Akiko Koizumi, for instance, basically never cultivates her magic power, but instead exercises her magic control skills directly. This is why it is said that the witch loses all her magic power when she sheds tears. But, after all, Matheson does not have the bloodline of the witch. He is even born without any magical powers. As a result, only through meditation can he improve little by little his magical powers. Fortunately, many low-level red magic spells do not require much magical power. Only a tiny chunk and various ingredients, such as the two magic charms that Matheson made before. Of course, it's not as if he is a master of magic. He can do anything he seeks by merely reading a magic book. Time passed, nearly two weeks, since the incident of the cat's eye emerald. Daisy was picked up by Jane Foster a few days ago, and Matheson knew that. In a few months, they would encounter the God of Thunder, yet he said nothing. He was not afraid of Batman in his prime, but to get involved in the Asgardians' matters and conflicts. He doesn't have that confidence, but what does that have to do with him? Even if a butterfly effect causes Thor to be killed by Loki, maybe, one day, he would be so strong that he might visit Asgard's treasure trove, but not now. Only, as Daisy came to say goodbye, Matheson noticed her, inexplicably, waving to Barbara, and wondered what it was for. It probably had something to do with the frequent whispering between the two women, which Matheson didn't pay much attention to. At this point, Phantom Kid had also been out of the scene of crimes for over a month, committing two major crimes in a row. Adam Star and Golden Green Cat's Eye had taken Gotham by storm. The GCPD has never given up its search for Phantom Kid, but, unfortunately, 
Nothing has been found so far. All they can hope for is a third teaser letter to be sent. Unexpectedly, one day, the police would have to rely on a criminal to volunteer the location he was heading to, in order to catch him. Because, in Phantom Kid's case, it was really hard to figure out his plans. As it turns out, Gordon and Bruce's fears were not unreasonable. The last week has seen a number of copycat crimes committed by both clueless teenagers and known criminals. Although all were eventually arrested and jailed, it was foreseeable that more copycats would emerge in the future. Inside the GCPD commissioner's office, Gordon is busy with all the work at hand, with a perturbed mind about the future. However, a call from the mayor of Gotham City made Gordon's work even busier. Chapter 27, The Specified Mission is Triggered. 2-5 Chapter, Enjoy. Mayor, this is Jim Gordon. Any instructions? It was the day Gordon received a call from the mayor. Jim, word has come from above that a heavyweight is coming to Gotham for a visit in a while, and I've decided that you will be in charge of security. The GCPD will cancel all regular missions for the meantime and prepare for her arrival with all their might. It's not just the GCPD. The FBI and CIA will also be sending their elite personnel over to assist, and there will be a number of high-level officials from Washington as well. Jim. This mission is very important, and if anything goes wrong with her, it could lead to a serious diplomatic issue. Gordon listened in confusion. She, a woman who needs such a grand protection team, and a foreign official. Who is this big shot? Jim, she's in a very prestigious position. You must be careful. The mayor's voice tone on the phone was extremely serious. I'm sorry, sir. Forgive me for taking the liberty. But who is this important person? Her name is Elizabeth, and I'm sure you understand very well what that name means. With that, the mayor hung up the phone. Gordon froze in place, he couldn't believe what he had just heard. GCPD, everyone, assemble urgently. Within a few days, a news story that shook the whole country spread through the streets. The Queen of England was visiting the United States, and it was in Gotham City. The date is July 20th. Five days later, Elizabeth the longest reigning queen in the history of the United Kingdom, and one of the most powerful women in the world. Definitely a heavyweight among heavyweights. Gotham City simply exploded with excitement as countless people were able to catch a glimpse of the legendary queen in the flesh. The mayor mobilized all the manpower he could to make sure that her visit to the United States was a success. At Gotham University, Countless students were talking about the event. Young people are often very interested in such things. Naturally, Matheson was among them, but his interest is not the same as the others. Because, in his eyes, he didn't care about the Queen of the United Kingdom or her special visit to the United States, nor did he care why she was in Gotham. In the long English letter about Elizabeth, only one certain unnoticeable sentence, in the Gotham Gazette, caught Matheson's eye. It is claimed that on this visit to America, Her Majesty Elizabeth will still be wearing her beloved necklace. A necklace. There are many necklaces in the United Kingdom's royal collection, but the one most loved by the Queen and worn on most formal occasions, the Tamil Ruby necklace. Market value? Priceless. Worn by Elizabeth at her coronation. This necklace has been with the Queen for half a century and its shine remains undiminished, making it one of the world's most precious gems. The Adams Star, although expensive as the largest sapphire, is not the most valuable sapphire. The Tamil Ruby is a truly priceless gem. It must be rated in the system as B at least, and in addition to the elite police elite agents from the GCPD, FBI and CIA involved in the protection, there will also be the UK's own agents along for the ride. If necessary, the army might even be deployed. As seen in the first rewards, the more difficult the theft is, the more precious the treasure is, and the better is the reward obtained. As for the magnificence level, daring to steal the Queen's royal necklace is like declaring war on a country. Even if it fails in the end I'm afraid it will shock hundreds of millions of people. Maybe the magnificence level will be filled, straight away. Matheson was a little excited. But when he thought of such a huge lineup of bodyguards, he still couldn't help but feel a little frustrated. The specified mission is triggered. Do you accept it? Just as Matheson was struggling with whether to take such a huge risk or not, the system spoke. This was something unprecedented. 
and Matheson was so surprised that he hurriedly opened the system panel to check. As soon as he opened the panel, a pop-up window appeared in front of him, containing the same thing the system had just asked about, only with an additional button to check the details. The Tamil ruby, carried by a queen of the UK, had been nourished by the country's luck for decades, causing it to mutate. It can prolong one's life when worn for a long time. A considerable amount of magic power is detected within the Tamil ruby. If the host steals it, the system can extract the magic power and turn it into the host's own power. Initially, it is judged that it can bring the host's total magical power to sea level standard. What a deal, is he dreaming? What Matheson needed most today was precisely the magic power, and the sea level standard might not seem high, but that was exactly the level of Akiko Koizumi in the system evaluation. Only during the special period when the moon is full can Koizumi Akako's magic power peak to B level. As for Matheson, his powers are not even E level right now. This is definitely the best reward that can be obtained so far. Warning If the host fails to steal it, it is likely to face imprisonment. The risk is very high. Please consider at your own discretion. Yuhu, Matheson wondered. Isn't it usually the system that forces the host to complete the mission, even if it results in various punishments? How come you are reminding me that the mission is risky and I have to consider it at my choice? I'm a lucky guy, definitely a lucky guy. Doesn't the system usually despise its own hosts or something? But, I have to consider carefully, otherwise, if caught in jail, a lifetime of fame can be ruined. Matheson rested his chin against his head and fell into deep thought. Hey, Matheson, wake up. Suddenly, a deafening roar came from Matheson's ears, almost scaring him to death. Hey, Barbara, what are you yelling so loud for? Matheson woke up with a start and turned to Barbara with a confused look on his face. Will you even hear me if I don't yell that loud? What the hell were you thinking today? You've been so distracted since school and you haven't come back to your senses, even when you got home. Barbara squinted her eyes and looked dissatisfied. And what's with a newspaper in your hand? Won't you let go of it already? You are hooked by some actress you read about, aren't you? At that, Matheson wiped the vain sweat from his forehead, not knowing how to explain. Technically speaking, Queen Elizabeth's personality is relatively approachable and popular on the internet. It even won't be an exaggeration to say that she is an international superstar. Matheson broke into a smile and replied to Barbara. How can that be? Do you think I am that kind of person? Barbara was full of suspicion clearly not believing what he was saying. If you don't believe me, take a look at the newspaper, this is the Queen of the UK, not some actress. Matheson turned the newspaper upside down to prove his innocence. Her Majesty the Queen? Speaking of which, my father has to be involved in her protection. The GCPD has given up almost every task except criminal cases these days. Barbara managed to get Matheson's attention. But what does this whole Queen's visit thing have to do with you? It doesn't have to shock you for so long, does it? Chapter 28 What comes around goes around 3-5 Chapter Enjoy I was wondering if something would happen when Queen Elizabeth came to Gotham. Matheson laughed ironically. She's the Queen, mighty protection must surround her. What sort of thing do you think will happen to her? Barbara asked in amazement. Pointing to a specific sentence in the paper, Matheson said, Look. It says here that the Queen wears the legendary necklace, Tamil Ruby, when she travels. Let's see, now. Hasn't there been a recent appearance in Gotham of a thief who specializes in stealing large gems? You mean Phantom Kid? Barbara covered her mouth in surprise. That's the royal necklace of Queen Elizabeth's family that we are talking about. It's essentially different from the Cat's Eye Emerald and Adam's Star. Would Kid really dare steal that? That's what I thought. No matter how daring that strange thief was, he couldn't possibly offend a country directly. Matheson was secretly relieved that he had finally managed to divert Barbara's attention. But, in fact, the reason Barbara did not continue the conversation was not that she believed what Matheson said, on the contrary, she thought very seriously about the possibility of Phantom Kid taking action. For some reason, Barbara's instincts told her that, even if Phantom Kid wasn't really Matheson, there would be at least something that relates them. Still, 
Barbara didn't want to believe this. With all her might, she wanted a chance to prove that Matheson wasn't kid. The easiest way to do that would be to have Matheson and Kid appear at the same time. If Kid really had his eye on the Tamil Ruby, then the teaser letters should be released soon. When that happens, I'll invite Matheson along to see Her Majesty Elizabeth. Thinking about it, Barbara gave a sneering smirk that sent chills down Matheson's back. Hey, wait a minute, Matheson suddenly noticed something very weird. Barbara, if you were just wandering off, then how did you get in my house? And why do you have its keys? I didn't hear you knocking on my door, huh? It was an awkward situation for Barbara. Why did she have the keys to Matheson's house? Obviously, she had secretly made a copy. She had thought that Matheson might be hiding some of the tools he uses as Phantom Kid to commit his crimes. And since she hadn't heard any noise, she sneaked into Matheson's house, knowing at this time that he usually wouldn't be there. By this time of the day, Matheson would have gone to the stronghold to train, under the excuse that he had a new magic teacher and was learning new tricks. He had often done this in the past ten years, so Barbara did not suspect him. But it is impossible for Barbara to find anything in Matheson's house. Everything related to Kid had been moved to his stronghold in the Edinburgh district. Matheson's considerations were proven to be correct, Barbara is suspecting him. Anyway. Barbara unlocked the door and invaded the house. Who knew that such a quick glance would reveal Matheson sitting on the sofa reading a newspaper with a puzzled expression on his face? Thinking of Matheson's unusual behavior at school today, Barbara subconsciously rushed over. It was an embarrassing moment. It could only be blamed on the fact that the two were simply too familiar with each other. So familiar that they were completely familiar with each other's presence. Otherwise, if it was a random person who had sneaked in, Matheson would have heard their footsteps before they reached the door. Ah, uh, I actually knocked on the door, but you didn't hear me before I came in, Barbara said stiffly. As for why I have the keys to your house, of course, you gave it to me before. Did I ever give you the keys? You hadn't given them to me? I don't remember any such thing. Maybe you've forgotten? Matheson, Barbara. Matheson stared at Barbara with a gaze of doubt that made her heart pound. Well, maybe I forgot. Then, said Matheson as he withdrew his gaze. He guessed that Barbara was mostly trying to investigate him, but couldn't say anything about it. In any case, he wasn't worried that Barbara would see anything suspicious around. It was only this incident that alerted Matheson to the fact that he let his guard down too easily with Barbara and that, sooner or later, things may go wrong. He had to change his habits now, even in Barbara's presence, he should never forget his poker face. Geez, it's getting dark now and I'm hungry, so forget about all the irrelevant stuff and get cooking. Barbara shouted while pointing at Matheson. Barbara, this is my house. Matheson's eyes popped out, what the hell was she doing? Geez, it's not the first time I've eaten at your house. And you know I love your oriental cooking the most. The food in Chinatown is too expensive and it doesn't taste as good as yours. Barbara pulled Matheson up by the hand and pushed him into the kitchen. Does your father know that you are going to eat at my place tonight? I talked to him before I came. Meanwhile, Gordon was busy at work, outside Gotham City Hall Plaza. Queen Elizabeth was coming to Gotham for a visit and this place was a must. It was quite empty. But, on the day of the Queen's visit, it would be so crowded that no one could imagine which kind of people would be present. That's why it's so important to secure the area, with snipers from the GCPD on the heights of every building around. Tens of thousands of police officers are located in every street and alley around the city hall. The main road is even directly arranged with a large number of GCPD trained honor guards, neatly standing on both sides of the road until the end of the avenue. Jim Gordon Gotham's only light of justice. I've heard great things about you for a long time. At that moment, a young woman in her late thirties, dressed in a tidy suit, approached Gordon and initiated a conversation with him, seeming to praise him with her words. If I'm not mistaken, your excellency is Agent Clarice Starling of the FBI. I've heard a lot about you. Gordon raised his head to look at her. The only people who could have entered the square at this point in time could have been sent by the FBI or the CIA to assist. By this time, 
Both sides should indeed be arriving soon as well. Only the CIA had asserted that it won't send a female agent from their side. So, it could only be someone from the FBI. Hasn't Agent Bob arrived yet? Starling asked. Not yet. It's still about half an hour from the time agreed on, Gordon replied. Ha, huh, how true about the CIA, Starling referred sarcastically. The FBI and the CIA had always looked down on each other, not only because of the massive conflict between the two agencies in recruiting personnel but also because the CIA would often interfere with the FBI's missions during international operations. Within the borders of the country, the CIA is ruthlessly suppressed by the FBI. The two sides had a long history of tearing each other apart, and it was only a norm to mock each other now. Gordon had seen it all too often and had neither sided with the FBI or the CIA anyway. Do people from the FBI only say spiteful things about others behind their backs? At that moment, a magnetic voice broke in between the two of them, and at a cursory glance, he looks like a middle-aged man. Chapter 29, A Luxurious Lineup 4-5 Chapter Enjoy. You're finally here, Agent Bob. Looks like the CIA has a sense of timing after all. As soon as the middle-aged man appeared, he was met with a cold stare from Starling. In the face of the FBI's malice, Bob, who was an elite CIA agent, was not polite. He replied with the same spitefulness. No matter what my mission is, the timing for me is the most important matter, coming early or coming late may spoil things. While the two were spitting weighty words at each other, Gordon seized the opportunity to take a closer look at them. Bob was a CIA elite who had carried out countless high-risk missions and had never failed once. His skills were absolutely top-notch, and his temper seemed quite good. Although he was exchanging sarcastic insinuations with Starling, the expression on his face was quite kind and friendly. Bob is relatively ordinary looking. He is 5.6 feet, 173 centimeters, tall. His most noticeable feature was probably his large nose. On the whole, Gordon's impression of Bob was not bad. As for Starling, she was much younger than Bob, and, although she wasn't quite an elite agent in the FBI, she was no less famous. She was the most widely known agent in the FBI. Of course. She was also competent enough, else, she wouldn't have been brought in to assist in Gotham's protection effort. The reason for her low position was other than her ability. Gordon could see that although these two were unforgiving towards each other, they didn't really have any ill faith in one another. Their interaction seemed like a usual friendly communication between the FBI and the CIA. Agent Bob, I've heard that you have long been thinking of retiring. How come you're still continuing to work in the Intelligence Bureau? Could it be that the CIA has no one left to take on beside you? And that's the reason why your director refuses to let you retire? Starling smiled affectionately. Actually, this is the last mission I'll be on since my request for retirement was approved, Bob returned the same smile. After I retire, I plan to run a pen shop, and I've even found the perfect location for it. However, in contrast to the CIA, it seems like the FBI can't carry out tasks alone such as protecting Her Majesty Elizabeth. You are supposed to send your strongest personnel, right? Ha, huh, you're quite right. But I'm confident enough to carry out this task more than anyone else. Weariness appeared in Starling's eyes. But I've heard that you haven't caught the criminal who started the case that made you famous until now. Hannibal is no ordinary criminal. And, sooner or later, I will find him. I am convinced that I am the only one in the world who can catch him. Starling was not shaken by Bob's words. Instead, she cut to the chase. Hey, I suppose so, M. Starling. Not many people in the world would dare commit murder in front of a queen of a country. So, this mission shouldn't be as intimidating as we imagined. Rather headlessly, the two agents' aggression faded. They actually began to communicate in a normal manner. I'd like to wish Agent Bob a happy retirement in advance here, Starling smiled. So, you two, that's enough small talk, let's get to work. Gordon stepped forward and interrupted the agents. In this situation, the GCPD cooperated with Bob and Starling to arrange various arrangements. Consider any possible situation and give a plan to deal with it. During the discussion, Starling's abilities really showed up, 
and Gordon was quite impressed by her calmness and resourcefulness. Bob didn't think as widely as Starling but was always able to fill in the gaps. On the other hand, in London, the UK, Queen Elizabeth was about to board her plane, accompanied by a team of highly trained bodyguards, or MI7 agents. However, Her Majesty herself seems to be dissatisfied with these bodyguards. Pamela, Queen Elizabeth's sad voice emerged. Immediately, a middle-aged woman appeared in front of the Queen and respectfully said, Your Majesty. I am here, may I have any instructions? You are the head of MI7, and you are arranging the protection star for my trip to Gotham. This time, is that correct? Yes, your majesty. Those present are the most elite agents of MI7, they will be sure to protect your majesty. Hey Queen Elizabeth laughed softly, the most elite? Is it really? What about Johnny English? How come I don't seem to see him here? At the name, Pamela was shocked, she gritted her teeth. As she said, Johnny is not capable enough to carry this burden. In fact, he would be the least reliable agent in the seventh branch. Your Majesty's safety is of paramount importance. How can he be allowed to? That's enough. Pamela, Queen Elizabeth snapped. I'm not going to be bothered with your dislike for your own men. All I know is that Agent Johnny served heroically in Asia recently, and during his service, the elite as you call them, didn't seem to do a thing. I have decided to make English the head of my guard for this expedition. Do you have any objections? Facing the Queen's gaze, Pamela, in a cold sweat, could only nod and say, Your Majesty, I have no objections. Pamela winked at her assistant, who left in a hurry to find Johnny. Within minutes, a middle-aged agent with a naive appearance, in extreme enthusiasm, showed up in front of the Queen. With me, there will be no surprises on this journey. I assure you, your majesty, he said, beating his chest with excitement written all over his face. This entrance was not really the right match for the calmness of that situation, but the queen was not disappointed by it, on the contrary, she liked the lively feeling. It made her feel tens of years younger. The queen set off for Gotham, the world-famous city of simple folk. Meanwhile, just after the queen's royal plane took off, a modest suit shot with a sign Royal Gentleman on was lit. It's midnight in London and all the suit shops are usually closed at this time but this one. What's even weirder is that the early next morning, the suit shop put up a sign that asserted it would be closed for several days. Matheson was now torn, wondering if he had made the right choice. Because, in the end, he chose to do it anyway. He decided to return the cat's eye emerald to its owner before sending out the third teaser letter. Oh, of course, it wouldn't be Daggett. He was a bad man who was definitely considered to have caused a lot of harm, however, one wouldn't call him evil. He had even gone so far as to collaborate with Bane and, eventually, died at the latter's hands, which was shameful. He didn't feel any guilt at all for stealing from Daggett. But, not long ago. A new piece of news made him change his mind. It turned out that a cat's eye emerald belonged to a mine owner who later lost his reputation and all his assets, as a result of a serious mine collapse. It was also that accident that allowed this rare emerald to see the light of day. Unwilling to lose everything, the mine owner put the emerald up for auction, only to end up in the hands of Daggett. It was sold for $20 million at the auction, which is an astronomical price. The owner was expected to use the money to make a comeback or, at least, just retire. But the aftermath was far from that. Chapter 30, Exploited, 5-5 Chapter, Enjoy, because just after a week of the auction of the cat's eye emerald, the mine owner died all of a sudden. The cause of death was said to be a heart attack caused by excessive alcohol consumption. No news has been released to cover what happened to the owner's $20 million inheritance after his death. All that is known is that the mine owner had a daughter in her 20s, but it appears that some unknown factor caused her to be disinherited. There is only a very small report that the mine owner's daughter claimed that her father was not a heavy drinker and did not even drink much in general. But the mine owner's sudden death by drunkenness was justified by someone who said that the shock of bankruptcy can easily change a person. Yes, that someone was a lawyer hired by Daggett, and it was this lawyer who was responsible for disinheriting the mine owner's daughter and for forcing her to take a break from school because she lost her financial resources.
Gotham City, East District, the most chaotic and filthy area of the city, is home to over 90% of Gotham's poor and homeless. It is also the birthplace of countless talents from Arkham Asylum. Deep in the ghetto, in one of the most broken huts, Pamela curled in a corner, her hands hugging her knees tightly. She was afraid to run outside because she was too pretty, and in the chaotic East District, the prettier the woman, the more dangerous it was for her. The weak wooden door, which creaked with the slightest breeze, gave Pamela no sense of security. She was constantly afraid that the next moment a pack of perverted animals might break in. Bang, bang, bang. Suddenly there was a knock on the door that made Pamela tremble with fear. She shivered against the door, expecting to be able to block a possible smash. Is that Miss Eileen in there, please? Pamela didn't dare answer, although the voice at the door was warm and friendly, that didn't mean she could open it unsuspectingly. Because, in addition to the gangsters who might come to the door, Daggett's people might also arrive. She had seen enough of those ugly faces already, so she refused to pay any attention to the people at the door. I'm not one of Daggett's men, I'm here to help you. Outside the door, Matheson spoke softly, and after waiting for a long time, yet still not getting a response from Pamela, he had to renounce the idea of her opening the door. First, he slipped an envelope into the crack of the door, then he stepped back a little and said, Miss Eileen, I am sorry for what you have been through, so I am here in good faith to return your lost property. If this comes to Daggett's attention he will surely turn on you again. So get out of Gotham. The envelope contains a ticket to New York in addition to your belongings. Hearing these words, Pamela looked puzzled, she could not understand at all what the man outside was saying. Looking down, she saw that there was a white envelope sticking out from under the door. Pamela took the envelope in disbelief and opened it, only to see that inside was the cat's eye emerald that her father had put up for auction. As the man at the door had said, the envelope contained not only the gem, but a boat ticket to New York, and a thousand dollars in cash. Not much, but enough to make Pamela's eyes go red and cover her mouth. Thank you. At this point, Pamela couldn't say anything else but those two words. Of course, she already knew who the person at the door was, and she was aware of the trends about phantom kids stealing the cat's eye emerald. You're welcome. You can reach the docks directly from here to the south. You don't have to worry about the road. Those punks can't hurt you. Oh yes, the clothes you're wearing now should be too old. I've brought you a new set of clothes, but there's no way for you to take a bath though. Matheson put the large bag in his hand on the floor and said, There's no way to get clothes through the door, and I know you wouldn't trust a stranger now, so I won't be in your sight. Pamela listened quietly and, after a while, she heard footsteps moving ever further away. And, soon, all sound was lost outside. After a few more moments she cautiously poked her head out and there was indeed a bag of clothes outside the door and also no one in sight. Even the sounds of the fights and brawls that used to be there every night had disappeared. Pamela pursed her lips and decided to trust Matheson for once. Lifting the bag and going back inside, is this actually just the right size? After changing, Pamela was surprised to find that the clothes fit her quite well. Phantom Kid, what an amazing person. The ship's departure was tonight, and there was no time to lose. So, Pamela casually packed up and walked out the door, running towards the docks. The journey was indeed peaceful. At first, Pamela was a little worried, but she soon put her mind at ease. When she reached the dock, Pamela suddenly stopped. Her face was hesitant and she kept looking around as if she was trying to find someone. Miss Isley? Are you looking for me? Without warning, a warm voice rang out behind Pamela. The voice had a magical power to soothe the anxiety in one's heart. Pamela turned her head back as Phantom Kid crossed her eyes. Even though she had seen many pictures of Kid, it was the first time she had seen him in person. For a moment, Pamela was so captivated by the appearance of Phantom Kid that she was mesmerized. Ahem, Miss Isley? Matheson reminded with a couple of light coughs. Ah, I'm sorry. I was so rude. Pamela's face blushed. Never mind, Miss Isley. I'm glad you were willing to meet me precisely. With a gentle smile, Matheson dropped to the ground one knee, like a gentleman, and slowly took Pamela's hand. He, 
then gave her a soft kiss on the back of her hand. Kid, Mr. Kid Pamela blushed as she drew back her small hand with a pounding heart at her words, calling him Mr. Matheson froze. Then came to his senses. No one knew the thief's real name, so they had to call him Kid for his first name. You risked your life to steal back my father's relic from Daggett and to help me leave Gotham. I am forever thankful to you, Pamela said with a serious blushing look on her face. It looked like Pamela had thought that Phantom Kid had stolen the gem to bring her justice. Matheson shied. He hadn't even known the story behind the jewel when he first stole it. Yet, he allowed the wonderful misunderstanding to continue. I know that sooner or later I'll be chased by Daggett if I continue my stay in Gotham. But what can I do when I go to New York? This gem has caused my father's tragedy, so I don't want to keep it anymore. There was confusion in Pamela's eyes and that was why she didn't run to the docks in one breath. That's an easy matter to handle. There's a man in New York called Tony Stark. Take the cat's eye emerald to him and explain everything. He'll buy the emerald and won't do what Daggett did. As for Daggett, you don't have to worry too much about him. Matheson pointed out a clear path for her. Hearing what Matheson said, Pamela finally put her mind at ease. Woo woo. At that moment, the whistle sounded in the direction of the dock, and the cruise ship was set to sail. That's not right, there's still ten minutes before sailing time, right? Pamela panicked, who would have thought that the cruise ship would leave early at this time of year? It would be nice not to be late at the usual time. Don't be afraid, I'll take you up. Matheson gave Pamela a reassuring smile and took her hand and ran to a building nearby. Going up to the top of the building, Matheson turned his head and asked, Have you ever experienced what it's like to fly, huh? Pamela was confused. Remember to hold me tight. Matheson picked up Pamela by the waist and started sprinting in the direction of the dock, ran to the edge of the roof, and leapt off. Ah! Pamela screamed in fright. Both eyes squeezed shut and both arms wrapped tightly around Matheson's neck. Ha ha. Miss Isley, don't be afraid, we can't fall. Hearing kids teasing, Pamela slowly opened her eyes and then was shocked speechless by the sight before her. She was actually flying up in the sky herself, with an unobstructed view of Gotham at night, looking down at the people like ants and blurred lights flickering everywhere. It's beautiful, Pamela murmured. Yeah. It's beautiful, even Gotham's nights can be beautiful sometimes. Listening to Matheson's words, Pamela turned her eyes to Phantom Kid's face. What kind of face was underneath the monocle? Matheson's hands were wrapped around her, and, at this point, she could remove Kid's glasses with just a flick of her hand. Pamela was curious about Kid's real face, but she knew it was Matheson's biggest secret, so she didn't do it. Instead gazing at Matheson's face with her eyes fascinated. It just seemed that no woman in the world could resist Kid's charm. Unknowingly, Pamela's face got closer and closer to Matheson's, only to end up kissing him on the cheek! Exclamation mark. Matheson's eyes instantly widened, was he? Being taken advantage of? Chapter 31. The FBI Informant. 1-5 Chapter. Enjoy. On the Dock. In the shadow of countless containers, Matheson looked at the distant cruise ship departing and gently touched his cheek. He started considering a variety of possibilities. When Pamela found out that she was flying in the sky, she could have been scared to open her eyes, or may not have been able to stop screaming, or have been fascinated by the thrill of soaring in the sky. He expected all of these possibilities to happen but one. He never expected Pamela to be so bold as to kiss him. Coming to think about it, not even Barbara had ever done that after she reached the age where she started to understand romance. However, I feel pretty good. Matheson's heart was full of joy. In any case, I have done my best, the rest now is up to Pamela herself. Although Tony Stark is considered Matheson's enemy, his character is guaranteed to remain the same, even after becoming Iron Man. He is still bold, charming and easily attracted to girls, but he would never do something to Pamela. When the cruise ship disappeared from sight, the cat's eye incident was officially dealt with. Matheson once again changed his costume and calmly left the docks. Late that night, work at Gotham City Hall had also come to an end. Thank you both for your help. I'll send someone to help you arrange a place to stay later. Gordon said to Starling and Bob. 
However, our time is rather limited, the environment may not be too good. All I require is a bed to sleep on. It is not the right time to be picky when carrying out such a mission. I will not trouble you, guys. Bob gladly accepted, as he mentioned. He did not have any higher requirements for food and lodging. Gordon nodded, then turned his eyes to Starling. Women, at times, could be particularly picky. I'm not a spoiled little girl either, but I have some things to do before I rest. I need to be excused for a while, Starling said lightly. Does Agent Starling have something to do in Gotham as well? Bob's eyes narrowed. Don't insist too much, Agent Bob. This is a CIA matter. If you need a hand, the GCPD can help, Gordon offered. Thank you but no. I can handle it alone. With all due respect, Agent Starling, Gotham is dangerous at night. Yes, I've heard that many times. But is it any more dangerous than Hannibal's restaurant? Starling ruffled her hair with a flash of reflection in her eyes. To her words, Gordon had to give Starling the temporary address that the GCPD had arranged for her, so she could go there on her own after she finished her business. Soon, the cab arrived near Gotham Avenue, only three or four blocks away from the Penguin's Iceberg Restaurant. By the time the cab was at the nearest crossing to the Iceberg Restaurant, a black car suddenly pulled out and followed the cab. Turn left at that fork in the road ahead and stop when you reach the third traffic light, Starling said to the driver and the bearded white driver as he nodded his head at once. This was Penguin territory, and he couldn't wait to get out of it. The black car continued to follow, always keeping a distance from the cab. After Starling got out, the cab quickly left the area, and the black car stopped just in front of her. Now at this time, there was not a single pedestrian on the street, and vehicles were also scarce. Starling opened the passenger door naturally and sat in. Only then did the car move to a hidden location. How did the mission go? At this point, Starling turned to the driver's seat, only to see a young woman sitting on it. Everything is going well so far, boss. Coral Pot does not suspect me yet. The woman was no other than the Penguin's current secretary, Marvy Brandon. In fact, Brandon is not her real surname, but a forged identity. Her real name is Muff Jean Angers, an Anglo-American and the real identity is that she is an informant the FBI put next to the Penguin. Starling is Marvie's direct supervisor. Very good. In this case, did you find a clue? At that, Marvie's mood sank. Cobblepot is very cautious, he hardly let me into any important places. I got very little information. Well. We expected that the Penguin wouldn't be the second largest gangster in the country if he was really that trustful. Starling wasn't surprised by this. You've only been with him for two years. In addition to that, it's really impossible to win Cobblepot's trust completely. Then tell us what information you have obtained, no matter how small. Yes, boss. Next, Marvy told Starling about her experience of working at the Iceberg restaurant for the past two years, which of course included the secret trip to the Iceberg Exchange with Phantom Kid. Phantom Kid. That great thief who has recently gained fame in Gotham. Starling pondered for a moment. He has nothing to do with what we are going to investigate, not to mention that you have not seen his true face. This information is of little use. Boss. There is one more detail that I think is very important. Marvel suddenly said seriously. Two years ago, when I first came, there were still a lot of homeless people in the East and Edinburgh districts, but every once in a while, their numbers decreased degradingly. It was not obvious in the first year, but the situation this year is much clearer. Hearing the words of Marvy, the corner of Starling's mouth rose as a brilliant light flashed in her eyes. That's enough. That's enough information. He must be here. Marvy, you continue to work undercover beside Cobblepot, and always pay attention to your own safety. Starling put her hand on Marvel's shoulder and cautioned. Don't worry, boss, I know how to protect myself. Marvel nodded. After the intelligence report, Starling got out of the car, and the two left in opposite directions. Meanwhile, over the Atlantic Ocean. Queen Elizabeth's exclusive plane was flying high in the skies. It will reach Gotham in ten hours. Your Majesty, please don't worry. With me here, you can enjoy this trip in peace. With a smile on his face, Johnny told Elizabeth, Ha ha ha, yes, well, 
then my safety is in your hands. The Queen laughed heartily and was satisfied. Early the next morning, Gordon, Bob, and Starling left on time, and the entire GCPD was out, waiting for Queen Elizabeth's arrival at the airport. The Mayor of Gotham was also waiting there. Generally speaking, when the leader of a country arrives, the airport will delay the operation of other flights to avoid accidents. Although Elizabeth is the Queen, she does not consider herself to have particularly a big frame. So, at her request, Archie Goodwin International Airport will not delay any flights or give her any special treatment. In turn, this gave Matheson a golden opportunity. Chapter 32, The Third Teaser Letter 2-5 Chapter, Enjoy Matheson pretended to be an airplane cabin cleaner, carrying cleaning tools and running around the tarmac, in fact, it can't exactly be considered a pretense, because he applied for a temporary job here a few days ago part-time for a week, and will also get paid $1,500. He has been working here for two days, and one can tell already that the cleaner's task is very hard. Before a flight is about to take off, the cabin must be cleaned very well in a very short time. What's even harder is that the water used for the cleaning has to be refueled by Matheson. Every time he has to clean, the airport was fairly 100,000 square meters big, and the water pipes were not available anywhere nearby the planes. So, every time his bucket was empty, he had to run to the terminal building below to refuel it. With dozens of trips back and forth every day, Matheson felt that his physique may have become a lot stronger. Queen Elizabeth's plane soon landed, and Gordon and others went up to greet her, but none of this had anything to do with Matheson. He kept cleaning the passenger cabin, he was completely disconnected from the noise surrounding him, he truly turned into a relentless cleaner. The highest level of disguise is to really become your disguise. Coincidentally, the airliner that Matheson is cleaning is the closest to the landing position of Queen Elizabeth's plane. After quickly cleaning the cabin, Matheson lifted the cleaning tools and subconsciously went in the direction of the Queen's special plane. The impeccable fluidity and naturalness of his movements, his sweaty head and slightly trembling arms due to hard work, make everyone who sees him unconditionally believe that this is a poor man who is hustling for his livelihood. Stop, who are you? This is the Queen's royal plane, which is managed by the royal attendants and does not need to be cleaned up by you. Matheson did not hide his actions, so he was stopped by the Queen's guards at that moment. Yes. Sorry. I don't know. I must be too tired from work. I had a hard time finding this job. With seamless acting, Matheson reacted as a normal person would, and in the face of dozens of armed guards staring at him, Matheson even began to speak incoherently. I don't believe that the person in charge of the airport would not tell you that this tarmac is not allowed to be approached, so it is necessary for me to suspect your identity. At that moment, a black man came out from the Royal Guard, wearing the uniform of MI7. As soon as this black man appeared, he gave Matheson a sharp gaze. No, sir, I'm just a janitor. Matheson looked flustered as his face paled for a moment. Hey, Tucker. Suddenly, a man appeared who was dressed exactly like the black guard. When this man appeared, all the UK guards looked at him and seemed to be the leader of these people. It was Johnny. One of MI7's most qualified agents and head of security for Queen Elizabeth Strip. Let me take a look at this man. Oh, poor you, look at your sweaty head. You must be very hard working. Johnny looked up and down at Matheson, and there seemed to be some sympathy in his eyes. Seeing that you are only in your twenties, yet you are engaged in such a dirty occupation as a cleaner. Your family must be in very difficult conditions, and may not even be able to pay your tuition for school. Matheson was astonished. Where did this crappy guy come from? Oh, no, he must be that shrewd agent. I'll let his stories cover up for me. Tucker, you're being too hard on this kid. You have to realize that a few years ago you were just a kid his age, only you were much luckier than he was to join MI7 and befriend me, Johnny said to Tucker in a reproachful tone. But, sir, how do you explain his presence here? Ha! Huh? Johnny laughed softly and pointed to the plane that Matheson had just cleaned. Tucker, you've been following me around for a few years. 
How come you don't even have this observation power? This cleaning boy came down from that plane, which means he just finished cleaning the passenger cabin there. I guess he must have worked too hard and forgotten about the fact that Her Majesty would land here. Johnny even looked at Matheson with a rather approving gaze. Then, the habit of cleaning made him subconsciously walk towards the nearest plane, which is here. Look at his hands. They already show signs of trembling, which indicates that his work is by no means false and has been working here for a long time, and I believe that no thug would commit such an act. After listening to Johnny's reasoning, Tucker dropped all his wariness of Matheson. He, Johnny's assistant and biggest admirer in MI7, was convinced of Johnny's words. The sudden change confused Matheson for a moment. He no longer knew how to respond. He was previously prepared to tell his lies, but now it seems that none of his words can be used. So, sir, could I leave now? Matheson trembled. No matter what, the play must be accomplished successfully. Wait, Johnny called out to him. I can appeal to Her Majesty and ask her to grant you permission to clean this aircraft, but only the exterior, and, as payment for your services to the Queen, I will give you $10,000. Matheson. What else can one say about this? Sure enough, as soon as Johnny introduced the poor man, Matheson, the Queen immediately agreed to his request. Of course, searching his body was inevitable. And this was totally acceptable for Matheson. He immediately began to clean the outside of the plane with his tools. Although Matheson was present, not very far away from Gordon, who was talking to Queen Elizabeth, no one suspected a thing. They did not pay much attention to him. After all, everyone has seen the search process he went through. Moreover, Johnny was the one to grant him access. How can anyone oppose the elite agent of MI7? He would never do things that will attract wolves into the house. Is this the royal Tamil ruby necklace? It really is so beautiful, Starling exclaimed. Women, well, always have no resistance to beautiful jewels. Elizabeth smiled benevolently. Yes. It has been by my company for decades, just like my child, concentrating all of his magic power into his ears, Matheson enhanced his hearing and clearly heard the conversation of several present people. Speaking of gems, I suddenly remembered something, Bob said thoughtfully. I heard that Gotham has recently given birth to a weird thief who specializes in stealing precious stones, am I right? The mayor of Gotham and Gordon looked at each other. This is undoubtedly the biggest scandal that has happened to the Gotham police this year. No one wants to talk about it. Gordon stepped in and said, Yes, this person calls himself Phantom Kid. His whereabouts are a mystery, and his identity is unknown. Agent Bob, why are you bringing this up? Starling frowned. Actually, it was also you who reminded me when you referred to Her Majesty's Tamil Ruby which is one of the most valuable gems in the world. I was wondering if it could be. At the word, Gordon's heart thumped, while others were not so sure of the answer to this, he thought to himself. Yes. It is very likely. This. Can't be right. If Phantom Kid dares to steal the Queen's necklace, he will be subject to be wanted by the United Kingdom and the United States. A thief who has just ventured in Gotham. Do you really think? has the guts to do so. Starling could not believe he could do it. In fact, even Bob himself could not believe so. He was just thinking about the possibility. Report to the Queen. There seems to be something stuck on top of the plane. It seems to be a card. Chapter 33. The Queen's Challenge. 3-5 Chapter. Enjoy. Following the guidance of fate. Q will finally set foot on the land to reproduce the prophecy. When L commits an unforgivable sin. He is replaced by the most gracious G. B can only make the final decision because the cunning M is ready to pierce K's heart. Phantom Kid, sincerely, Johnny was the first to rush and read out the contents of the card. Gordon was instantly frozen in place as if he was struck by lightning. Kid actually came. How can he? How dare he? Although he had only encountered him twice, Gordon did not know much about Phantom Kid. It's the janitor. Starling and Bob locked on the same target immediately and asked about the agent who found the card. Where has that cleaner just gone? Faced with the two senior agents' aggressive aura, the agent hastily replied, he said he ran out of water and had to go refuel his bucket, then left. He left about a few minutes ago. No more than two minutes. 
At that, Starling and Bob looked at each other, and again, in unison, rushed in the direction the agent pointed. I knew there was something wrong with that guy. At this point, Tucker also came to his senses and followed them. Instead of chasing after him, Gordon took out his walkie-talkie and issued an order, immediately block the entrances and exits of the terminal building, and strictly forbid anyone dressed as a janitor from leaving the airport. Once found, regardless of whether they are a man, woman or child, immediately arrest them. At this point, only Johnny was still frowning and thinking, Phantom Kid. He was able to sneak into the airport unnoticed and put a teaser letter on the heavily guarded plane. How on earth did he manage to do it? Gordon noticed Johnny's situation and mistakenly thought he was blaming himself for letting Kid in. So he stepped forward to offer some relief. Johnny, you do not have to blame yourself too much, Phantom Kid's craftiness, I know well. He is extremely proficient in disguise, pretending to be a janitor without any flaw. Even I would fall for it. Johnny laughed easily and said, I'm not blaming myself, but I'm thinking about this phantom kid. Wait, what did you just say? Pretending to be a janitor? Gordain was puzzled and asked rhetorically, the janitor from minutes ago must be kid in disguise. You would not have failed to see it, right? Oh, oh, this? Of course, I see. Johnny said, with embarrassment highlighted on his face. In fact, the first time I had seen him, I knew something was wrong. This is really strange. Then why did you still oppose Tucker and let Kid clean the plane? Gordon wondered. Listen, Commissioner Gordon, I studied for a while the mysteries of the East, where there is an old saying that says the best way to catch a turtle is to let it crawl inside the urn itself. What? Is an urn? A kind of container. The terminal by now, had been issued a full lockdown by the GCPD, including the entrances and exits of the airport. It was completely blocked. Starling and Bob sprinted all the way downstairs. Agent Bob, you really got it right. Not only did Phantom Kid dare to steal the Queen's jewel, but he even dared to put the teaser letter under all of our noses. Starling was breathing heavily. Her eyes were flickering and she was still having a hard time processing what had just happened. This! Bob smiled awkwardly. He also did not expect this thief to be so professional. Regardless of this all, let us quickly find this guy. With that, all the cleaning staff of the airport were caught in front of Gordon, however, none of them was Phantom Kid. Recently, a new part-time worker has arrived. He, he is now missing. Maybe he is Phantom Kid. The person in charge of airport cleaning was sweating profusely while telling Gordon the truth. After such a big incident, he will likely lose his job. Were you not ordered to refuse any job applications at the time being? The mayor's face was gloomy. Does such a low position airport head dare to ignore his orders? This will undoubtedly cause him to lose face in front of Queen Elizabeth. Not even that, the whole country's face will be covered with mud on usual days. We are indeed well staffed. We do not need to recruit more people, but since Her Majesty is coming, even if she asked the airport to do everything as usual, there are too many things that needed to be prepared to treat her the right way. It was necessary for us to recruit temporary workers, the person in charge said with a bitter smile. Uck, Gordon sighed. Blaming the others won't benefit the situation. He pulled the mayor, indicating that keeping the queen distracted and entertained is now the top priority. Gotham's mayor was strong-minded. He instantly calmed down and invited the queen. Your majesty, I know that what has just happened frightened you. But I promise that Phantom Kid will not appear in front of you, because we will catch him before then. Now, please forget about this trivia and let me introduce you to the city of Gotham. Hey 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 who knows why Queen Elizabeth laughed softly. You are too nervous, I have lived for so long. Yet nothing happened to me. I have been sent assassination letters more than once. A mere thief threatening to steal my necklace won't be enough to scare me. As for Phantom Kid, I think he is an interesting person. I've heard of you, Commissioner Gordon. You were once a special soldier with great military exploits. After retiring from the army, you came to Gotham as a police detective and solved countless big cases. At this point, the Queen suddenly named Gordon and the FBI's Starling, known as Hannibal's arch nemesis. That's the world's most fierce ogre, still chased around by Starling. 
Bob, the CIA agent, has positively reported many of his missions within the UK. I trust his skills. Gordon was surprised. He didn't think that Queen Elizabeth actually knew every bit of information about all of them. He had thought that the Queen would not care about citizens like them. On our side, we have MI7's elite agents and my royal guard. Elizabeth's wrinkled face showed a playful smile. I trust you will protect the jewel, and solve the riddle of the teaser letter. It should not be a difficult task, if Phantom Kid can steal the Tamil ruby in front of so many powerful characters. Then I'm fine with it as a gift to him. After saying that, the Queen's eyes were filled with fire. They seem to be ignited for an upcoming war. This, looks like the Queen is not only not angry at all. She is very enthusiastic. She even finds this fun. Meanwhile, in the corner of the waiting room, three people wearing high-grade suits had been seated, among them, two men and one woman. One man was middle-aged, while the two others were young. All three wore the same pair of headphones. Exy, Roxy, do you hear me clearly? The middle-aged man suddenly said. Yes, Phantom Kid issued a teaser letter. The two said in unison. Chapter 34, Undercurrents. 4-5 Chapter, Enjoy, Q, L, G. B, M, K. The teaser letter highlights these six letters, and I think the key to cracking it lies here. Exy said, do you still need to say this? It's so obvious that no one can miss it, the question is how to crack it. Roxy rolled her eyes at him. I just haven't thought about it yet. It doesn't mean I don't have any ideas of what it could mean. Forget me and speak about yourself. Have you cracked any of it? Exy was defiant. Stop fighting over this stupid matter. At this time, the middle-aged gentleman interrupted the two in a soft voice. His voice was so gentle and charismatic, revealing a sense of authority. Harry, what do you think? Exy asked. He and Roxy were agents of the same training program and were close to each other. So, obviously, they would not quarrel over a little thing. The middle-aged gentleman, also known as Harry, who is Exy's mentor, is also the strongest agent of the Kingsman. I've got some clues, but I have not quite unraveled the whole letter. I want to hear what you two think first. If we simply look at the quality and achievements of the agents, Roxy is undoubtedly far more qualified than Exy, especially in terms of knowledge. The gap between the two is particularly obvious. After all, before becoming an agent, Exy was just a punk who never went to school. It was all thanks to Harry to find him, training him, and teaching him. Else, he wouldn't even be even able to read what was written on the teaser letter. And so, Roxy took the lead and spoke up. I investigated that. Until now, Phantom Kid has committed a total of two cases, which means that there are two teaser letters sent out. Perhaps to his debut, the first teaser letter contained no riddles to solve. It was relatively straightforward. It was until the second letter that he began to set these riddles in a confusing way. Through the content of the second letter, it can be presumed for the time being that Phantom Kid likes to use the content of Greek mythology to set up riddles. Hearing this, Harry shook his head. Roxy went completely in the wrong direction. So, my guess is that L stands for Ladon who guards the golden apples, G stands for Galitis, B probably stands for Briz, and M I think is Minotaur, for K and Q. I have not found any correspondence to them. I think they can only be explained as king and queen. I think these two words refer to Her Majesty at the same time. Roxy's cheeks reddened slightly and said, Still, I can't figure out how to link every detail to the other. PFFT. Exy couldn't help but laugh out loud. Isn't that the same as not saying anything? Ah, what are you hitting me for? Roxy withdrew her fist and hammered into Exy's chest and said with a cold gaze, Now it's your turn. Look how violent you are, no wonder no man likes you. Seeing Roxy's violence, Exy hurriedly kept quiet and spoke out his insights. Actually, I think, we don't need to put in the effort to decipher Kid's teaser letter. Oh? This remark has brought up Harry's interest. Why so? Kingsman has been established for decades and has not appeared in front of the world. Even the royal family does not know of our existence. Then, no matter how smart Phantom Kid is, he cannot know that we are here. We know that his goal could only be the Tamil ruby necklace. Hence, we only need to keep a close eye on Her Majesty. Sooner or later, 
phantom kid will appear and find us already there, which is equivalent to us being in the dark and him being in the light. No suspicious person can escape our eyes. That's right. Harry nodded approvingly. When carrying out a mission, one's mind should not be rigid, as long as the mission can be successfully completed, it doesn't matter if you use some dishonorable means. This method is a bit stupid, but it efficiently works. Roxy. At this point, you are not as good as Eggsy. Roxy hummed, didn't comment, but also did not refute. It's almost time. Let's go find a place for our stay. Harry looked at his watch and said. The three of them got up and left at the same time. Phantom Kid's teaser letter has appeared again. Queen Elizabeth had declared war. Does Phantom Kid fear defeat? GCPD, FBI, CIA, MI7. And a whole ultra luxurious agent lineup present here to encounter him. According to rumors, the Secretary of State angrily denounced the acts of Phantom Kid beyond the scope of theft, and can even be considered a terrorist act if necessary. They may send the Delta Force. SAS is applying for entry to join the mission. What does this mean? On the same day, what happened at the airport spread across the country. Various kinds of news came out, some of extreme exaggeration. Even SAS and Delta were involved in their stories. These media outlets are really brainy. At Gotham, Bristol, in Wayne Manor, Alfred, what are you looking at? Bruce asked while doing push ups. In a recent month, he went to the hospital to check his right leg. He found out that the bone damage was extremely serious. The joint is softened to a negligible level, way beyond healing. So he installed himself a leg exoskeleton, which granted him normal mobility. Of course, the exoskeleton also strengthened his kicking power several times. During this time, Bruce often wondered if he should talk to Tony Stark and make himself a whole body set of exoskeleton armor. But he gave up the idea as soon as he considered that the arc reactor was difficult to make. Tony Stark can make a nuclear reactor in the size of a palm, while Wayne Enterprises has worked for two full years, yet, can only shrink the nuclear reactor to the size of the Bosnian stone sphere. That's right, Stark is not the only one making many nuclear fusion reactors, Wayne has already invested in a lot of such research, only that Wayne's technology is decades behind Stark. To manufacture a reactor that is small and stable enough, the slightest unintentional mistake may cause it to become a large nuclear bomb. This is why Bruce can only rely on himself, for now. Physical exercise is enough to restore his body functions and combat skills. Every day, he was doing 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, 100 squats, and a 10-kilometer long run. In addition, he wouldn't dare to turn on any air conditioning, no matter how hot the weather was. Yep, it seems that Bruce is a bit dramatic. However, his master's training was uncannily similar to the one he is doing now, other than the long run. He would sometimes multiply by 10 the number of push-ups, sit-ups, and squats. This makes his day so busy that he hardly has the leisure to pay attention to the outside world's news, which of course was the least of his concerns for the past eight years. Although Bruce hates to admit this, he is already 40 years old, and the deterioration of his body is inevitable at this point. Alfred keeps a sharp eye on all of these details, so, he didn't want Bruce to see the news about Phantom Kid, fearing that, one day, Bruce will gather his power to put on Batman's costume again. Just some trivial things, reporting on Her Majesty's visit here. As she delivered an appraisal to Gotham, Alfred tried to act as naturally as possible. Chapter 35, Accompany Me to Her Majesty, 5-5 Chapter, Enjoy. Alfred. Your thoughts are all written on your face. No need to say these words to perfume me. Bruce caught his breath and finished his thousandth push-up. This is not his limit back in the days, but his current body supports only this much performance now. So, tell me, what happened? Bruce stood up, grabbed a towel and wiped the sweat from his face. Alfred had no choice but to tell him about Phantom Kid. Who knows why Bruce was not even shocked at hearing this news. From the moment I knew that Queen Elizabeth would wear the Tamil ruby, I knew as well that he would not let go of this unique gem. Let's see what kind of riddle he has given us this time. Bruce took the paper from Alfred's hand and looked at Kid's teaser letter. Q. L. G. B. 
M, K, interesting, this time the teaser letter is much more cryptic than the last one, Alfred nodded and said, yes, Master Wayne, I don't have any good clue at the moment, what is the current location of the Queen, according to time calculations, Her Majesty should be in the State Guest House building now, meeting all the gentry, at night, there will be a grand banquet, inviting Gotham celebrities to it, including the heads of the upper class families, right? Bruce suddenly asked. Yes, sir. Did we receive an invitation? As a matter of fact, the Waynes did receive it, but you don't need to attend. Since ancient times, Wayne has never actively participated in political activities. This makes us hugely different from the Stark family. Wayne has always only focused on civilians and society, so you don't have to care about this banquet, Alfred said lightly. Don't say that Alfred. Queen Elizabeth is a good monarch, and I think it is very necessary for me to attend this banquet, so, go and help me to get ready, now, as you wish, sir, but I suggest you shave your beard first, of course, Bruce responded, and then proceeded to begin his physical exercise, Old Town, at Jim Gordon's residence. In the small townhouse across the street, Barbara took the Gotham Gazette, which she had just bought, and ran to the door of a small house, knocking vigorously on the door. Soon, Matheson opened the door and stared dead at Barbara, with his eyes halfway closed. Hi, beautiful and charming Miss Gordon, don't you know it's my nap time? Matheson was not expecting that. Just not long after returning from the airport, the news started flying all over the place. It's only been a few hours since the newspaper was printed, is the printing factory open all the time? Barbara didn't care about Matheson's question. She screamed at Matheson with an excited look on her face. Look, the third teaser letter from Phantom Kid has appeared, and it was sent to Queen Elizabeth. What you said a few days ago really happened. Matheson looked at Barbara waving the newspaper in front of herself and asked, So what? At that, Barbara raised an eyebrow, dissatisfied, what is that attitude of yours, this kind of thing was said by you, almost like a prophecy, are you not surprised at all, or is it, Barbara wrapped her hands around her head and asked Matheson with a low voice, you wouldn't have known all along that Phantom Kid would send out this teaser letter, Matheson felt the aggression in her eyes and couldn't help but sweat, this girl doesn't even try to hide her suspicions, now is not the time for a showdown, I have to think of a way to calm down Barbara and make her drop her suspicions about me, how could I possibly know what Phantom Kid would do? I just blurted it out the other day and I bet I'm not the only one who thought so. Matheson scratched his head and said innocently, I'm not a detective enthusiast, I am a magic lover, I don't have much interest in thievery. Why would this shock me? Perfect rhetoric. Reasonable. Barbara couldn't find any loopholes, she had no option but to agree. Well, I have to admit you're right. Anyway, come in, the sun outside is too dazzling. Naturally. Matheson pulled Barbara closer to the room. I heard you say earlier that Mr. Gordon is in charge of Her Majesty's security, so he must be very busy these days. I assume you haven't had lunch today. Barbara's face blushed. She was clueless at cooking. Not even stray dogs could eat the food she made, and Gordon was not at home these days, so she had to live on pizza. Originally, she wanted to come here to have a meal with Matheson but he was on a trip with his teacher to learn the fundamentals of magic. In reality, he went to work at the airport and came home late every day. After surviving on pizza for a few days, Barbara really couldn't eat it today. She was thinking about going out for a meal with the remaining pocket money, only to see a newspaper about Phantom Kid. At that point, she didn't even think about it and rushed to Matheson's house, regardless of whether he came back or not. As for Barbara's brother, James Jr., he usually eats in the high school's cafeteria. All this is to be blamed on Gordon's busy life. Despite that he is the director of the Gotham City Police Department, yet still lives in an old town's antique house. His family does not even hire a maid, and usually is strict at limiting Barbara's and James Jr.'s pocket money. Z. Matheson started the oven, brought a pan and poured oil to be heated, single-handedly broke two eggs to occupy half of the pan, then put three strips of bacon on the other side to be fried over medium heat, put two slices of toast in the toaster, the eggs and bacon are being fried, then cut a little lettuce for a simple salad, 
The combination of meat and vegetables is particularly important. Finally, he poured a glass of milk. In this way, a breakfast called lunch is ready. I'm afraid you're too hungry. This is the fastest thing I can cook, Matheson said thoughtfully. From the time he walked into the kitchen to serve the food on the table, a total of no more than five minutes had passed. Hungry Barbara, smelling the scent of bacon, eggs, and toasted bread, was appetized. Sure enough, you know how to cook, the bacon is fried until it is charred, and the fat is evenly distributed, smooth and not greasy. This is the best fried bacon I have ever tasted. After devouring her food, Barbara said with a satisfied look on her face. Matheson was amused. What are you talking about? Those who don't know you would think you're a may. HMPH. I am complimenting yet you're not happy about it, Barbara grunted. I'm not only here just to tell you the news about Phantom Kid. After a while, Barbara suddenly looked at Matheson, a pair of big eyes bright to the extreme. Matheson became alert. All of a sudden, when Her Majesty was coming, I wanted to go see her. It also just so happens that we do not have classes these days and, since you are home today, this proves that your magic lessons are also over. So, will you accompany me to see Her Majesty? Barbara stared closely at Matheson, with her eyes sharp, daring him to refuse her invitation. Additionally, I want to help Dad catch Phantom Kid. This. Well, okay, I will accompany you. I really can't say no to you. Matheson was planning to refuse stiffly but then thought that this perhaps is a perfect opportunity to eliminate Barbara's suspicions, and changed his mind. Chapter 36, Roxy's Analysis 1-5 Chapter, Enjoy As soon as she heard that Matheson agreed, Barbara immediately smiled with joy, as long as you are with me when Phantom Kid appears, it will prove that you are not him, Barbara thought, with her eyes fixed at Matheson. This look in her eyes. Why does it feel so wrong? Matheson wiped the sweat on his forehead. It's just that. Suddenly, Barbara was in the middle of a long train of thought again. If Matheson is really Phantom Kid, then what should I do? Expose him? Barbara shook her head. She could not bear the idea of putting her best friend to jail anyway. Well, yes, because of the pure and innocent friendship. Not for any other strange reason. But, because of Phantom Kid. Dad recently skips sleep and stays up late every night. He is already so old, sooner or later. This may be the reason he will pass, fall ill or even go away. But, again, maybe, Matheson is forced to do this kind of thing. At this time, sitting across the table, Matheson did not know that Barbara is carrying out such a complex mental activity. He only saw her starting to daze there again. I can't jump to conclusions, maybe Phantom Kid really isn't him, maybe it's all just my own blind guess. After all, I have no reasonable grounds to suspect Matheson. Women are really a combination of paradoxes. As for Barbara's last conclusion, she doesn't want Matheson to be Phantom Kid. This way she won't have to be caught in the middle of a dilemma. In the evening, the mayor will hold a banquet at the state guest house to welcome Queen Elizabeth. Then we will also pay a visit to see it. After thinking about it for a long time without any result, Barbara simply gave up on this subject. Anyway, nothing is clear yet and Matheson is currently still innocent. State guest house? Matheson kept quiet for a while, Barbara. Only diplomats and officials of high class are allowed there, isn't it? Even if Wayne wants to attend such a party, he needs an invitation, right? It doesn't matter. Her Majesty is very close to the people, so many celebrities were invited to the banquet. What a bold woman. This queen is really big-hearted that she is not afraid that a thief may be in disguise as a guest. Only waiting for the opportunity to steal her Tamil ruby? Hearing her words, Matheson said in his mind. Wait a second, we are neither invited nor celebrities. As soon as the words left his mouth. Barbara looked at Matheson with a contemptuous look that made him uncomfortable. Have you forgotten what my father does for a living? With him on sight. Are you still questioning if we are still allowed in? Are you sure this is really not a fake public benefit? Matheson was so tempted to say this line with Gordon's voice at that moment. Do not worry, I still do not know what my father has to say about this. I have long thought about how to convince him. Huh? I just hope you're not telling him that you suspect me of being Phantom Kid. Matheson rolled his eyes. 
Inside the state guest house, Gordon arranged manpower with care. The banquet was very large. It brought together the biggest figures in Gotham. Most importantly, according to Phantom Kid's past experience in crimes, the more people present, the more convenient it becomes for him to move and blend. Usually, it is impossible to detect Kid due to his ability in disguise and voice acting, unless he, himself, decided to reveal himself or had someone pulling his face, taking off his mask. But in this situation precisely, the party is full of big shots. In any case, the distinguished guests will not accept this kind of rude way to check their true identity, so Gordon simply cannot know who everyone is before Kid shows up. Therefore, Gordon has arranged his finest men with pure care even for the sake of that very thin possibility. He must do his best to ensure that, once Kid appears, his plans to escape will be futile. Starling and Bob did not interfere with the police arrangement at the state hotel. After all, Gordon is the landlord here. Besides, he is more experienced and informed about Kid than them. They put all their focus on interpreting the teaser letter, but for the time being, they had not reached a unified conclusion. Johnny and Tucker, on the other hand, accompanied the royal guard and followed the queen every inch of the way. On the other hand, three agents from the Kingsmen were lurking on a building not far from the state house, keeping a sharp eye on the surroundings. As long as Phantom Kid tried to escape, he would definitely be seen by them. What do you guys think? What kind of a person is Phantom Kid? Roxy suddenly asked, while holding a laptop in her hand, seemingly looking up for something. Eggsy looked disdainful as he said, What else can it be? A thief who is arrogant, greedy, likes to show off his magic tricks, and is addicted to the thrill of crime. Harry didn't say a word, just watched the two talk. This was technically the first assignment they had received and although the two had performed well enough, the difference between being a cadet and being an agent was not ordinary. Every conversation the two men had, every comment they made, was actually in Harry's eyes as a test. After all, only one of Exe and Roxy can end up staying in the Kingsman. I don't think so, Roxy shook her head. During this time, I carefully investigated all the information I could find. Phantom Kid is proficient in magic disguise, and voice changing. His physical quality is enough to compare with the world's top athletes. His common weapon is a special playing card or a special pistol that can shoot playing cards, and he is good at making various props, such as flashbangs or dummies. And he's very good at flying with gliders and is a master of psychological warfare. What's more, he is very charming and can manipulate countless people with every move he makes. Wow! listening to you talking about him. I feel that Phantom Kid is omnipotent now. Eggsy said with displeasure. Is there anyone who praises his enemy so much? Moreover, since he has such a strong ability to commit crimes instead of doing the right thing, wasn't my evaluation basically the same as yours? Well, well, before I discovered this, I might have said the same thing you just did. But now I have a different thought. Roxy stared at the information displayed on the computer screen, shocked. He returned the target of his second theft, the cat's eye emerald, to its owner not so long ago. And then, she proceeded to tell Pamela's story, leaving Eggsy in disbelief. When Pamela first went to New York, through whatever means, she eventually contacted Stark, only to grant him an extra gem to play marbles. Then, with Stark's help, Pamela entered New York University to study the Department of Botany, which is exactly what she majored in at Gotham University. It is worth mentioning that Tony also intended to use the media to announce Daggett's shameless acts, only to be shadowed by Queen Elizabeth's news. It is certain that Phantom Kid has nothing to do with Pamela and her father. So why does he return a gem he has finally stolen? Chapter 37, What Matheson is Unwilling to Accept 2-5 Chapter, Enjoy I think that Phantom Kid does not steal gems for the sake of money, Roxy said. What for, then? You think he steals from the rich to fund the poor? You think Phantom Kid wants to be Robin Hood? Eggsy asked. Well, I admit he does dress like Robin and did help Pamela with the cat's eye emerald. But, that was his second gem. What about the first, Adam Star? At his words, Roxy remained silent for a second, then started typing on the keyboard. 
After the Adams star was stolen, only one piece of information has been found, which is that Wilson Fisk in New York bought it for an astronomical price of $200 million. As for where he bought it from, it still remains a mystery to everyone. No one knows how Phantom Kid sold it to him. Here we have to praise Penguin's rules. The Iceberg Exchange's degree of secrecy is frighteningly high that not even the military's transaction encryption is not as good as his. This is why it is considered one of the largest black markets in the United States. People will only suspect now that there is a secret deal between Phantom Kid and Fisk but never place any doubts on him. Secretly and steadily, one could run deals and earn large loads of money, without bearing any responsibility. If the Penguin decides to act on the deals by himself behind the buyer's and seller's back, he could exploit some benefit. If he does this, he will not only risk offending his clients but also could cause the exposure of the exchange. If he was such a fool, he wouldn't have achieved such success today. Most of the time, the villain is often more credible than the good guys. Not because they are of good character, but because this leads to greater profit. Good reputation and bad reputation depends on who can bring the most benefit. These qualities are the ones that choose to preserve whose reputation. This is the wisdom of the Gotham mob bosses. As for some people who doubt that the Penguin will take the initiative to exploit the transactions of the customers, they truly suffer from a low IQ level. Therefore, no matter how much effort Roxy put into tracing the transaction records, she couldn't find the slightest bit of information about the iceberg exchange. 200 million. Eggsy was shocked. He sold it for such a high price. And you're telling me that he is not doing this for money? Let me ask you something, you suddenly earned a huge sum of 200 million dollars, what would you use it for? Roxy asked. What else would I do? I will stop working and enjoy life, Eggsy said consciously. Then why did Phantom Kid continue to steal the second gem? Eggsy froze, just half a month after Fisk bought the Adams Star. All of Gotham's old folks' homes, orphanages, and schools received anonymous donations one after another, adding up to a total of over $130 million. With anonymous messages coming from different sources, from all over the world, he still managed to use the same ID name. This shows that Phantom Kid is a highly skilled hacker. Even with my skills, I still failed to find out where he was. I had to contact Merlin. He was only able to guarantee that Phantom Kid is in Gotham. At this point, everything Roxy wanted to say has been said. Merlin's hacking skills are already considered the world's top notch. Even he couldn't locate him. This leaves me afraid to say that there are not many people in the world who can crack this case. In fact, Matheson himself is not very skilled in this field, but he has Barbara, his childhood friend, more than 10 years beside him. Breaking other people's firewalls may be difficult, but hiding their IP addresses so they would not be found by others is not a big deal. Matheson donated so much of the 170 million US dollars that he had exchanged from the Penguin for the Adams Star. After buying his villa, he only left 30 million US dollars in reserve. It was well thought out. Phantom Kid on the surface may seem glamorous, dashing, and unrestrained, treating money like dirt. Still, Matheson didn't know how hard it is to run such an errand until he actually tried it. It is well known that Gotham is a seaside city with many inland rivers. The temperature difference between day and night varies a lot. To meet the requirements of achieving safe gliding, one must be at least 40 to 50 meters above the ground. As the old saying goes, you can't beat the cold at high places. When it is late at night, wearing such a thin white costume in the sky, while facing the blowing cold wind, could freeze one to death. If you don't believe me, try it yourself. Phantom Kid really has a strong body, for that the last time he swam for more than an hour in the icy water, he was not even affected by it. There is also the puzzle on the teaser letter, which is racking one's brain all day. One wouldn't know how many brain cells were killed for Kid to come up with that enigma, but if this continues, Matheson's head will surely go bald. There are many invisible pains that need to be endured by Matheson. And all of this is for the sake of a pretense that lasts for 10 minutes or so. In order to achieve a wonderful performance. It is really a performance that risks his life. Matheson knows that the degree of danger present in the world of American comics is far above Conan's world. They are incomparable. For example, 
No matter how irritated Nakamura officers are, they will not shoot Kid, but Gordon's officers will not hesitate to shoot a provocative criminal. Therefore, Matheson is very cautious, he never reveals himself before causing a commotion, but very often his dummies do the job. They attract enough attention. Equipment and props were the biggest problem for Matheson. His family is not the Kuroba family and there isn't any world-class magician who could guarantee a lot of wealth. Even the legacy left by his predecessor can only guarantee that Matheson won't starve to death and the vast majority of that money has been assigned to pay his tuition fees. If it had not been for the fact that orphans receive subsidies from the government, as well as Wayne Charity Fund grants, Matheson wouldn't have even been able to afford the fabric of Kid's costume. In order not to be caught, Kid tailored his costume himself. After all, even buying a piece of white cloth was a bit suspicious. It is worth mentioning that the government subsidy has only been granted to Matheson with the help of Gordon. Otherwise, he would have been just another helpless and weak orphan. Special playing cards, poker guns, flashbangs, smoke bombs, gunpowder. It would be nice to find a way to buy these items contraband, but the price would have to be doubled. The most painful thing is the disguise of clothing. All kinds of clothing for men, women, and children must be prepared. High-end suits ranging from tens of thousands of dollars apiece to low-end two-piece welfare clothing of 9.9 .9 US dollars must be ready for use. Additionally, he had to stock one or two pieces of each, in case of emergency. He also has to go buy new clothes immediately according to his actual situation, and this is usually not cheap. His stronghold was even more urgent. Hiding things at home is the most foolish behavior to do. Thanks to Matheson's fast transfer, he moved everything on time. Otherwise, by now, Barbara would have found it. To conclude, Matheson is really poor. Else, he wouldn't have sold Adam's star. If it weren't for such a commemorative significance it held, he would really be looking down on this ugly big thing. This reason is really tacky, not so compelling and does not fit the identity of the Phantom Kid. Yet, Matheson struggled to achieve this business. If he didn't do this, he wouldn't have got the system's rewards, would have lost his only way to get stronger, and would have to hand his fate over to others in this world. This is what Matheson is definitely unwilling to accept. But then again, Matheson's conscience is left to suffer a bit. This is why he left himself the $30 million. Time flies. The banquet is about to start. Matheson and Barbara just left. On the way, Barbara tightly tugged on Matheson's hand, as if she was afraid that he would suddenly disappear. Matheson couldn't help but shake his head and laugh internally. Today is not the time to act. Why are you so nervous? Chapter 38 Bruce Wayne 3 5 Chapter Enjoy the celebrities who received the invitation arrived one after another. One by one, luxury cars drove into the parking lot. Hundreds of reporters gathered at the entrance taking pictures of big personalities. Even some celebrities from outside Gotham have decided to join tonight's banquet. Oh my god! It's Ms. Hansen, I didn't expect her to attend this party too. Look! Isn't that the Smiths? Even they are here. The reporters expressed their wonder every now and then tracing every detail with their eyes. At this time, a cool sports car, that was unmatched, stopped at the entrance, and a middle-aged man with a cane got out of it. As soon as they saw this man, the reporters in the room instantly fell silent. Is that, Bruce Wayne? Bruce has not been out of Wayne Manor for many years and was no longer familiar with the changes in Gotham. The reaction of the reporters has become all of a sudden so cold. Bearing in mind that, in the past, as long as he was on site, these reporters will act like sharks who have just smelt blood in the waters. But now, each one of them was mute. They haven't even attempted to take any pictures. Fortunately, Wayne had a strong heart. He ignored the coldness around him and walked straight into the state guest house. We didn't see wrong, did we? Only then did someone come back to his senses and asked uncertainly. Yes. This is Bruce Wayne. He's back. Oh my god. I thought he had passed away. It turned out that it wasn't that people had forgotten about Bruce. It was just that he had disappeared for too long. Reporters were so shocked that they missed such a good opportunity. Bruce Wayne's comeback is big news that can shake Gotham. It made Queen Elizabeth's presence trivial. After all, 
the Queen will leave after a few days' visit here, while Wayne is closely related to the city. I really didn't expect that Mr. Wayne would get out to breathe the same air we do one day. Not long after Bruce entered, he heard someone calling his name. He turned to look back and it was a charming young woman. Miss Tate, I didn't expect to run into you here either. Bruce seemed to have changed back to the original playboy. He was overnight, with a confident and charming smile on his face. Miranda approached Bruce, her gaze shining and her whole body exuding a sensual charm. Mr. Wayne, now that we met, it is the right time to take this opportunity to talk about the new energy plan. This is not the occasion to talk about business, Miss Tate. Bruce interrupted Miranda's words. Sorry, that was a slip of my tongue. I was just too anxious that I mentioned that plan. Miranda instantly remembered the purpose of this party. Then, I'd rather not bother, Mr. Wayne. As soon as the words left her mouth, Miranda went deeper into the venue on her own, giving up on continuing a deep conversation with Bruce. Bruce? At this time, Gordon who was closely watching every move at the state guest house, also spotted Bruce's figure and walked over curiously. Commissioner Gordon, it's been a long time. Seeing an old acquaintance, Bruce also was very happy. Back then, if Jim Gordon hadn't been in charge of his parents' case, Bruce wouldn't have taken the path he did. Oh, you're Bruce Wayne. One of the world's top super rich. Starling and the others also came over. Wayne's fame was so big that it was far from being limited to this small Gotham. He was an internationally known figure. It can be said that Bruce is the second richest person in the world at the moment, with the first being Tony Stark. He did not care about the business for eight years, so the revenue of Wayne Enterprises is not as much as before. It would be indeed difficult to catch up with Stark Industries. But also, he was far richer than the big companies such as UI Ruan, Pingo, and even Osborne. Bruce showed his ability to be a good sport, talking and laughing with Starling and others. Not putting the rich man personality up front made the crowd feel better about him. But in reality, Bruce's real inner thoughts were Dash. Clarice Starling, 31 years old, Fairfield supervisory agent, tracing the serial killer Hannibal Lecter for 10 years. She is suspected of having emotional involvement with Hannibal. Her father is a police officer that died while doing his duties. The rough experience honed her heart. She has ambition and patience and action, but her weaknesses are equally obvious. Bob He, 37 years old, CIA elite agent, proficient in more than 10 kinds of fighting techniques, often prepared with a variety of small volume weapons on his body. The best weapon he uses is that belt. His bodily abilities have also begun to decline from their peak, but his body is well maintained. Johnny English, 42 years old, MI7 veteran agent, often solves incidents in an incomprehensible way and has repeatedly turned the tide in a defeated situation. This person, I can't see through him for the time being, so I need to pay more attention. Tucker, 22 years old, Johnny's assistant agent keen observation and average fighting ability in general, he is a bit reckless. Quietly analyzing everyone in his mind, Bruce had already figured out many ways to counterattack them if they ever dare to cause him problems. He had nothing against these guys, it was just a habit. More importantly, Bruce thinks that Phantom Kid will definitely come to this party. Of course, this is not some unreasonable speculation. Through Kid's two crimes, Bruce has 10,000 reasons to believe that he will do sufficient preparation before his action takes place. Where will the Queen go in Gotham these days? What will she do? Will the ruby leave her neck? And how will GCPD arrange the manpower? This is the key information to decide whether one can get it or not. And at a mixed party, blending in is the easiest thing to do. Bruce does not believe that Phantom Kid will give up this opportunity. Therefore, it cannot be ruled out that Phantom Kid is one of the people in front of him. Meanwhile, Barbara dragged Matheson to the door. Who are they? I don't know. They look so young. Are they also invited celebrities? When did Gotham have such a young and successful couple? Are they a couple? It doesn't look like it. It can't be that they are trying to blend in, right? This is a state guest house. Trespassing is illegal. As soon as they saw the two, the reporters coiled at the door began to whisper, their eyes oddly analyzing the two Matheson. The two of them were sweating, 
Barbara could not hear the reporters, but Matheson did hear them clearly. Could they both really get in? I hope the headlines tomorrow morning will not be young man and woman trespass at the state guest house, messing up the Queen's banquet or something like that. Do you have an invitation, please? The concierge at the door stopped the two, as Barbara tugged on Matheson's hand to go inside, and asked, We are chapter 39. Have we met before? 4-5 chapter, enjoy. We are secretly dispatched by Commissioner Gordon. He asked us to hide among the guests to find out who Phantom Kid might be disguised as, in order to avoid Phantom Kid's attention. Please keep this a secret. Not waiting for Barbara to speak any further, Matheson pulled her away and whispered to the doorman in a serious tone. His expression immediately subdued the doorman to his will. On such occasions, the doorman won't allow any trespassing, even if he knew that Barbara is Commissioner Gordon's daughter. And, in the end, the doorman couldn't grant the medry. He was still suspicious of Matheson's words. It's okay. I know what you're thinking about. You can call Commissioner Gordon over to verify, but do not draw the attention of other guests, Matheson said fervently, expecting the man to believe him. But, eventually, this latter has sent someone to call Gordon over, and instructed them not to draw the attention of the other guests. If these two really cause trouble, then it would be just as well for Gordon to take them into custody. Hey, they really went to call my dad, but we're not even cops. We're definitely getting kicked out. In the midst of waiting, Barbara pulled Matheson aside and whispered in his ear anxiously. Matheson could not help but lose his smile. At the beginning, you said so aggressively that you'll attend the party. So, why are you scared now? Plus, you said you already thought of a way to convince Mr. Gordon, right? I. I wanted to convince him after we meet him inside, but you lied to the man now. You told him that we are special police officers. This situation is of a different nature. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, let me disappoint you. Your plan wasn't going to work. Even if you told him that you're Gordon's daughter, he's not going to let you in, and I'm even guessing that he might not even bother to call your father. How do you know that? Barbara muttered discontentedly. How did he know without even trying? It doesn't matter how I knew. Once your father comes later, you'll know if I'm telling the truth. Matheson said with a mysterious look. How come I didn't find out before? You actually have the habit of hanging people's appetite. Barbara curled her lips. You tell me, it's actually very simple. The first thing that the receptionist said when he stopped us was to ask if we had an invitation. Do you remember? Matheson had to satisfy Barbara's curiosity. Isn't it normal to ask that? Of course it's normal for a normal hotel to ask that. But this is a state guest house. They must have taken note of every guest, so everyone who came before us walked right in and none of them was stopped. And we were obviously not likely to be on the guest list. Yet they didn't kick us out in the first place and even asked if we had an invitation. Don't you think that's strange? At the time he asked. His gaze was shed mainly on you, which means he knew you were not invited yet didn't want to be too tough on you. So, he said that so that you can retreat. Hearing this, Barbara also felt that something was indeed not quite right. Then, the rest is obvious. Director Gordon must have guessed that you would come over and then notified the receptionist. Hence, the latter guessed after seeing you that you were Gordon's daughter, but because there was also the presence of an extra person, me. He was not sure of your identity. That's why he did not try to kick you out, following Gordon's orders. In other words, if I had just revealed my identity, he would have blocked us out of the door, Barbara said in a daze. Right, pretty sound reasoning, but I didn't think, Barbara, that you would bring along Fang. No one noticed Gordon's presence until his words emerged. He was looking at Barbara with a dark look. But it soon softened when he looked at Matheson. This poor child grew up to be a fast learner. He now seems to have developed an extraordinary mind. Unlike our own two children, the eldest daughter is severely biased, not to mention her social problems. The youngest son is naughty, mischievous, and never listens once talked to. I haven't seen you in a while, Jim, and I heard from Barbara that you've been busy lately. Matheson scratched his head, embarrassed knowing well that he was the real culprit in keeping Gordon so busy. This is not the place for you to be, go back home, Gordon scolded Barbara. Jim, 
Actually, I thought we would be able to help, Matheson said stiffly, after this long journey to make it here. He wants to go in no matter what, I know. You don't have to back her up with excuses. I've heard all about it. You were only dragged here by Barbara. Matheson looked at Barbara, signaling that it was now her turn to convince her father. Then, Barbara ran over to Gordon and pulled him away. Matheson only saw her whisper something in Gordon's ear. Only for this latter's eyes to widen in surprise and his lips to remain sealed. Even Matheson didn't hear exactly what Barbara said, but that didn't matter. Come in with me, you guys. Matheson and Barbara followed Gordon into the state guest house. What exactly did you say to your father? Matheson asked Barbara surreptitiously. Stop questioning me. Barbara blushed and shook her head. I just told you everything. And you have to satisfy my curiosity. It's not the same thing. Regardless of what Matheson said, Barbara just wouldn't tell him how she convinced Gordon. Fang, you are gifted with an immaculate reasoning ability. Have you ever considered joining the GCPD in the future? Gordon suddenly asked, and Matheson sniffed. Well, ah, uh, I haven't thought about it yet, after all. It will take me two more years to graduate. Matheson laughed dryly. Commissioner Gordon, these two are, Bob and others gathered in the corner. They do not like to mingle with those politicians and businessmen. They prefer to discuss the teaser letter's whereabouts. Gordon couldn't allow the two young fellows to go in with the big shots, so he brought them here. Starling's sharp eyes noticed at a glance that the two youngsters following Gordon aren't GCPD officers. Consequently, she had to ask. Only then, Gordon began to introduce both sides to each other. Matheson felt heavily anxious right after Gordon finished introducing him. The silence of the lambs, the spy next door, Agent Bean. None of them can be easily dealt with. T.L. These are the movies the above characters are from. Although he had already met with these people when he was disguised as an airplane cleaner before, it was only now that he could look at them and analyze them openly. It was also impossible to recognize them at once by name alone. You are an Oriental? At this point, English, or Agent Bean, walked up to Matheson and asked in an affirmative tone. I am of Chinese descent. Matheson nodded. It was nothing to hide. Have we met somewhere before? Agent Johnny asked, while rubbing his chin. Matheson's eyelids twitched. It's hard to believe that his disguise was discovered. Impossible. He pretended to remember that he saw him somewhere as well before, then apologized saying he had never seen Johnny before. Sorry. It was my misrepresentation. I once practiced martial arts in Tibet in the East for a while. In the words I learned, there is a mysterious power in you that makes me feel familiar to you. Johnny slowly spoke four words in Chinese. Matheson's pupils shrank slightly. He was horrified inside. Chapter 40, Deciphering the Teaser Letter. 5-5 five five Chapter, Enjoy, Ka, Mar, Cat, Chicken. Although Agent Bean's Chinese pronunciation was very poor, Matheson still understood what he was trying to say in an instant. Kamartage. Matheson never thought that the Tantric Temple where Agent Bean was practicing in Tibet might actually have some kind of connection with Kamartage. While maintaining his poker face, deep down, he was swamped with thousands of thoughts. In Agent Bean's movie, he often makes a lot of surprising and incredible actions. Is this one of them? But he does not have a sling ring. Nor can he draw a magic circle. So, normally, he should not be qualified to enter Kamartaj for practice. In reality, Kamartaj is certainly not like the movie. It is not simply three temples on a mountain. It is protected and well hidden by the use of many forces. Yet, where do so many of its students come from? The mysterious power. It's a familiar feeling. Is it because of red magic? With such a magical level, it's not surprising that Agent Bean had a feeling. After all, Agent Bean's level is not high enough to clearly perceive the difference between different magic systems. It's just that what he said is so vague. It looks like Agent Bean mostly had seen a Kamartage's mage with his own eyes, and then has been put under some kind of ceiling. As for the reason why his memory was not wiped, it should be because that temple is also one of Kamartage's affiliated forces. I don't know what you are talking about. Figuring out what was going on, Matheson shook his head and said to Bean, I think you must have mistaken me for someone else. 
When Agent Bean saw Matheson's sincere expression, he admitted his mistake, and immediately turned red. R, maybe I am mistaken after all. Agent Bean walked back to his original position. No one knew what the two men were talking about. Magic, for them, is a big subject. Kamataj only targets threats outside the latitude. Not even the New York War won't provoke them. Such a minor event won't be enough to alarm them. Even if Johnny's hidden identity was discovered, Matheson would not be deterred. Her Majesty has come out, at this time, the guests exclaimed by surprise, only to see Queen Elizabeth getting down from the exclusive suite downstairs, with the help of her maid. An old grey-haired man with hair was by her company. Looking about sixty years old, it was Queen Elizabeth's son Charles, a crown prince who could be boiled to death at any time. It's Prince Charles, he's here in Gotham too, but there was no news before our not even at the airport did I see him. Matheson moved his eyes and thought of something. The Queen is seated. All teams report on the situation. Gordon picked up the walkie-talkie. Report Chief. No anomalies. Now, close the entrances and exits of the state guest house, and strictly prohibit anyone from entering or leaving until the banquet is over. Yes, sir. Keep an eye on the guests' movements and report any suspicious movements immediately. Gordon and the others were located in the upper left corner of the venue, right next to the Queen's seat at the front. In the event of any accidents, the Queen can be protected as quickly as possible. Counting Matheson and Barbara exactly eight people, sitting at a table. In fact, most people are not seated, because the venue is divided into two major parts. The food only takes up a small half. Most of the place was mainly for people to dance. God knows why these celebrities always dance there when they throw a party, and how much of this food will go to waste. Anyway, Gordon and the others had thought the same as Matheson and sat down to eat. They worked all day without eating anything. Now that they have established much control, they should take a break to eat and drink. Who is the man who is talking to Prince Charles, the one with the cane? I feel like I have seen him somewhere. While eating his meal, Matheson secretly looked at Queen Elizabeth's table. He was surprised to find that besides the Queen, the Prince and the Mayor of Gotham, there was also a middle-aged man sitting there. After carefully searching for the memory in his mind, Gotham didn't seem to have such high officials who looked like him. No way, you don't even know the famous Bruce Wayne? Next to him, Barbara said with a surprised look on her face. It was no wonder that not two years after Matheson's transmigration, Bruce had announced his reclusion and completely disappeared from the newspapers. The current Bruce and his appearance eight years ago are very different slash it's normal for Matheson not to recognize him. He is not the kind of guy who grew up watching Bruce Wayne news. Matheson is not particularly surprised by Bruce's appearance. After all, he has caused a lot of trouble. Batman's comeback should be later than expected. After looking at the two, Matheson withdrew his gaze. He does not want to attract the attention of Batman. With his abnormal analysis and reasoning ability, he might find some clues and see through him. He has not shown his face for eight years, eh? How could I immediately recognize him as the rich Bruce Wayne instead of a cripple? Matheson said innocently. I think you're just so engrossed in your own affairs that you don't care about the outside world at all. Barbara shot him a blank look. This is true, for so many years, Matheson indeed did not pay much attention to other things, concentrating on developing his own abilities. These two kids have a great bond. Starling joked as she looked on with a smile at the two who were exchanging pleasantries. Commissioner Gordon, is it really a good idea to let them come here? They're still just kids. Bob said with some doubt, trust me, we can help a lot. Barbara stepped forward, full of confidence, and she deliberately lowered her voice. I know that the reason you are all gathered here is to catch Phantom Kid. And the biggest problem now is to crack the puzzle that Phantom Kid gave us with his teaser letter. I guess you guys don't have a good idea yet. That's why you're all here with sad faces. And that, too, is why we came here. A gleam of wisdom flashed in Barbara's eyes. You mean, you have deciphered the contents of the teaser letter? Several of the agents present were momentarily stunned, not knowing whether to believe her or laugh out loud. Only Gordon was a bit surprised, as Barbara had already told him about it at the door. Ah! In fact, 
I have not completely deciphered it. Still, I believe I am not wrong. Being stared at by so many top agents, Barbara's momentum was immediately broken. Tell us what you think, Miss Gordon, maybe we have a common thought. Bob showed a kind smile as he addressed Barbara. Barbara glanced at Matheson who gave her an encouraging nod. The puzzle in the last teaser letter from Phantom Kid was related to Greek mythology, so this time many subconsciously leaned towards Greek mythology again, where, in fact, you won't get the complete solution no matter how you try to read it. Greek mythology has absolutely nothing to do with this teaser letter. Instead, there should be a huge connection to Celtic mythology. There is only one most widely known legend in Celtic mythology and that is King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Chapter 41, Phantom Kid is among us. Well, it's pretty much the same as what we have just discussed earlier. Starling nodded, affirming Barbara's words. The target was the Queen of the UK, and to associate her with the Twelve Knights of the Round Table couldn't be more accurate. Let's start with what you think these particular letters represent. It was now that Barbara was really getting the attention of the agents. Following the guidance of fate, Q will finally set foot on the land to reproduce the prophecy. When L commits an unforgivable sin, he is replaced by the most gracious G. B can only make the final decision. Because the cunning M is ready to pierce K's heart, what exactly do Q, L, G, B, M and K stand for? There is no night beginning with Q in the Knights of the Round Table. So Q would represent Queen, which is Her Majesty. The phrase means that Phantom Kid will only appear when the Queen arrives somewhere. I don't have a clue as to where this prophetic land is. Barbara looked to Matheson as soon as the words were out of her mouth. She couldn't be the only one having a hard time. Everyone looked at Matheson and he had no choice but to continue adding. L and G should, obviously, stand for the two knights Lancelot and Con. The reason is simple. The only one of the twelve knights of the round table who committed a felony and was banned by King Arthur was Lancelot, and poise happens to be the quality for which Gun is best known. B is for Bedivere, I think. Why not Bowser? As Matheson spoke, Bean suddenly spoke up and interrupted him. He was from the UK and had grown up listening to the legends of King Arthur, and was undoubtedly the most familiar with the knights of the round table of those present. Although Tucker was also a UK native, the younger generation was rarely interested in those old legends anymore, and video games were their favorite activity. In this respect, Tucker didn't really know as much as Bean. I was hesitant at first as to which knight B would be, but the final decision made my mind up. Matheson uttered his reasoning without hesitation. The final decision refers to the fact that when King Arthur was defeated, he ordered Bedivere to throw the Holy Sword into the lake. But the Devere hesitated three times before making his decision. Having said that, Matheson also looked at Barbara, signaling with his eyes that the rest was up to her. Barbara bristled. What a petty man. Couldn't he see that he was talking so much to the point that he stole all the spotlights? The two younglings' small gestures caught Gordon's eye. When he thought of the other thing Barbara had just said to herself, he couldn't help but sigh. The last ones. M and K, let me do the rest. Starling smiled intellectually. The M refers to the rebellious knight Mordred and the K no doubt stands in for King Arthur who is king. The metaphor for piercing the heart is the Battle of Camlan, where Mordred pierced King Arthur's heart with a sword. There is another layer of meaning to this, King Arthur is rumored to possess the heart of a red dragon, which alludes to the queen's beloved object, the Tamil ruby. Hence, Mordred would be a reference to Phantom Kid himself. At the end of the speech, Agent Bob jumped in as well. So the interpretation of the last sentence is that Phantom Kid could have long ago disguised as someone who, at any moment, would suddenly steal the jewel. Just like Mordred, the timing, well, it's the land of prophecy as stated in the first sentence. In this way, the contents of the foretelling letter were sort of dismantled but not yet fully unraveled. Apart from not knowing where the land of prophecy is, what was the point of his mentioning the three knights Lancelot, Gun, and Bedivere? Gordon asked. Barbara blushed with embarrassment, glanced quickly at Matheson and said, that. We hadn't thought of either, it's okay. This was just good enough. Starling smiled gently. Sir, 
You should have solved all this already, Agent Bean's little fanboy Tucker suddenly asked Bean quietly. The reason you didn't open your mouth was actually because you didn't want to steal the spotlights, right? You should have already solved the parts of a letter that they couldn't solve. Now, it's time for you to speak, let them see how powerful MI7 is. The whole time, Bean has been sitting upright, listening to the interpretations of the crowd. But by all rights, Bean, as the most familiar of these men with the legend of King Arthur, should theoretically have been the first to unravel this information. Question mark. However, as Tucker whispered these words in his ear with an adoring look on his face, all that went through Agent Bean's mind were three big question marks. How was the teaser letter cracked? How come I still don't have a clue? However, in front of his little fanboy, Agent Bean must maintain a good image, although he knows nothing. He mustn't lose his charm. Bean smiled and quietly said, Tucker, we have to trust our allies a little more. They are all very smart, sooner or later, they will solve the rest by themselves. But won't that delay things? In case they couldn't solve it until Phantom Kid strikes. Oh, Tucker, you're still too young, Bean said with a fake sneer. Tucker looked at him with a confused look on his face. Do you think that's really all the information they've solved? Hearing that, Tucker was shocked and looked at Bean in surprise. My guess is that Phantom Kid has long since disguised himself as someone, maybe even among us. Bean pretended to tell the truth, and in Tucker's eyes, his own Bean old-timer was so serious, so wise, so... Ark. In short, admiration for Agent Bean filled Tucker's heart. I understand, sir. If Phantom Kid, who is hiding among us, hears that his teaser letter has been deciphered, he will probably change his plan temporarily, and then our time-consuming and laborious deciphering will be wasted. After hearing Bean's words, Tucker dared not speak up, but only looked at the others a little more cautiously. Time passed quickly, Matheson and the others had eaten and drunk enough. The banquet was coming to an end. The discussion about the land of prophecy and the three knights never came to a result that everyone agreed on, and as to whether anyone was hiding their thoughts, Matheson's opinion was similar to Bean's. He didn't think he was some being with some superintelligence, and the riddles were not so complicated that they could be easily solved. Both Starling and Bob were shrewd agents with a fine mind, and whether the teaser letter had been solved in its entirety by now, Matheson was not sure. But as a thief, it didn't matter if they had solved the teaser letter. Because even if they do, the letter in itself is meaningless. It was just a dummy, a distraction, for Kid to steal the treasure in front of them and then escape openly, without them knowing anything. That was Phantom Kid's style. That's how arrogant he is. Chapter 42, Barbara's Attack Obviously you said you were going to see Her Majesty, but instead, you didn't even dare to go up and kept sitting all the time. After the party was over, Matheson and Barbara walked home. Because of work, Gordon will be staying inside the state guesthouse for an extended period. Hence, only the two of them left. That's Her Majesty, the Queen. Many people in the world would be out of reach to meet her. How dare I go and talk to her? Barbara said in a bad mood. It's rare enough that we have looked at the Queen from such close distance. Matheson was silent and couldn't comment on Barbara's words. Then again, why are you still following me? Your house should be in that direction. As he walked on, Matheson suddenly turned back to Barbara. Although the distance between Matheson's house and Barbara's was no more than a kilometer, that wasn't enough reason for the two to walk along with each other. The two had come to a split path, sandwiched between their homes. I don't have my keys, isn't James Jr. home? He can open the door for you. There's a camp out at the high school today and he won't be home for a few days. Isn't it a day off today? It's just because it's a day off that the event is taking place. Otherwise, such campouts don't happen on school days. Is that so? Matheson looked at Barbara with a suspicious look, as far as he could remember when he used to go to secondary school. Things like camping events hardly ever took one day. After all, teachers needed a break too, didn't they? But since Barbara had said so, it wasn't entirely out of question. Well, you can ask someone to unlock the door for you. Look at what time it is now. The lock repair workers have already finished by now. 
And don't you think it's dangerous to let me go back alone this late at night? Matheson was tempted to say, it's probably not even more than 600 meters from here to your house. I can see straight into your house. Wait, why are your house lights on? Barbara was startled at his observation and turned around to see that, indeed, the lights were on, as bright as day. At her own house, Barbara silently grunted and decided to punish her brother after going back. She laughed dryly, uh huh, I just remembered that I forgot to turn off the lights when I left. The corners of Matheson's mouth twitched, what the hell does this girl want? Do you know that it's dangerous for a girl to stay in a single male's house? He wouldn't have minded if it were a normal situation, but things are different now, and he wasn't in the mood to mess around with Barbara. After all. The party had taught him how powerful his opponents were, and that Queen Elizabeth might not have only these guards on the surface, but that there might be some mysterious figures protecting her from the shadows. Although he already had a plan of action himself, he had to think about it extensively, especially with the presence of Agent Bean and Batman. God knows how far his red magic, luck, and intelligence could lead him to. Gotta figure out how to deal with those two. No matter how difficult it is to deal with other people, Kid could still find weaknesses through his common sense. The main thing to do now was to stay away from all shopping malls and furniture stores to not run into Agent Bob. It is better to scoop Barbara out of the way now, so she wouldn't disturb me. So, aren't you just going to book a hotel room for the night? Barbara? Matheson wasn't playing around. Should have she just clearly asked him to stay with her for the night? How can he say that to a girl? Is Matheson really this stupid? She couldn't just give up. Thinking about Daisy's words, not so long ago, when she said that Matheson is too slow and that she needed to take more initiative, Barbara gave herself a mental pep talk. Barbara, go for it. What I meant to say is, can't you just? Barbara suddenly looked cold and stared at Matheson with dissatisfaction. Dash dash. Nah, I can't. I can't just punch him. In suite 4406 of the Angora Hotel in Gotham's old town, Barbara's eyes stared blankly at the ceiling. She finally couldn't get the words out. Can't you just let me stay at your house for the night? Afterwards, Matheson looked at her with a puzzled look on his face as she stood there and said half a sentence before stopping abruptly. Matheson very kindly walked her to the hotel and got her a deluxe single room. Something's wrong, something must be wrong. Barbara sat up violently. Doesn't he have any feelings for me at all? No, if this was true, then he wouldn't usually let me stay at his place. Is it because I'm not that charming? Barbara pulled out a small mirror and took a look at herself. Well, I am naturally beautiful. I'm at least a high-spirited, intellectual goddess at Gotham University. How could I be less attractive? This guy must be blind. Looking down at her chest, Barbara frowned. These might not be very big, but it's a normal female size. Surely it isn't considered small, since the problem wasn't herself. It must be Matheson. Barbara thought with certainty. Maybe he's Phantom Kid. He is plotting something and doesn't want me to see it. That's why he's refusing my stay at his house. It is not that I'm not attractive enough. Tossing and turning, Barbara was never able to sleep, so she made a bold decision. She slipped out of the door and left the hotel quietly. Outside Matheson's house, Barbara approached the windows. The lights are off inside. Is he asleep already? Peeking from the window inside. There was no sign of anything suspicious. Her imagined scene of Matheson sorting through various Phantom Kid props wasn't there. Undeterred, Barbara climbed up to the first floor and peeked in through the bedroom window. Although Matheson had drawn the curtains, Barbara could still faintly see through the gap in the curtains that Matheson was lying asleep in bed. What the hell am I doing? Jumping down from the first floor, Barbara smiled to herself as her own suspicions came and went and the result looked like she was entertaining herself. What she didn't know, however, was that just a short distance away, on the roof of a building, Matheson was watching her with a pair of binoculars. Yes, Matheson had guessed early on that Barbara would come back to spy. No, to investigate him. So he had put a dummy on his bedroom bed as a way to confuse Barbara. The reason why he stayed here to confirm this is his fear that Barbara will just break in furiously. In case this has happened, at least, he will have had the ability to switch with the dummy. 
Looking at Barbara back at the hotel, Matheson jumped off the building to spread his glider and flew to the stronghold of Phantom Kid. The next day, just as the sun was rising, Matheson was awakened by a knock at the door. When he opened the door, it was Barbara. Barbara, with a dark circle under her face, stared at Matheson from the moment he opened the door without saying a word. Chapter 43, Robinson Park Queen Elizabeth is expected to stay in Gotham for five days, and yesterday's banquet was the first of them. The rest of the days were scheduled for Queen Elizabeth to visit Gotham's famous locations and the monuments one by one. The Queen is a Queen after all, her guide is a high-ranking official, the Mayor of Gotham. Led by the Mayor, Queen Elizabeth visited the Wayne Memorial, the Knights Dome Sports Complex the Statue of Justice, Cathedral Square. Almost all Gotham's monuments had been visited. The last few days had been unusually quiet in Gotham. Phantom Kid caused only hype but never appeared. Most people thought that Phantom Kid had mostly given up on the idea of stealing the ruby. After all, the Queen of the United Kingdom's necklace was not that easy to get a hand on. Even if he managed to steal it, it would not have been a good thing. The Tamil ruby necklace is a treasure that cannot be sold, and whoever buys it will face the hostility of the entire United Kingdom. The slightest misstep could spark a massive war. Even a Yakuza emperor of the Oyabun would not dare to bear such an outcome. And anyone with an average IQ would not believe that someone would really steal the Tamil ruby. To put it bluntly, sending letters threatening Her Majesty with some sort of assassination would be far more credible instead. Unfortunately, minds such as the one of Phantom Kid are not meant to be understood by normal people. At least, a small group of agents, including Gordon, Starling, and Bob, did not believe that Phantom Kid would give up the operation. Since the first day of the party, when several of them discussed the content of the teaser letter, they did not go through the issue again for the remaining days. However, Bob and Starling had quite confident looks on their faces and looked like they should have deciphered quite a bit of information. Gordon, on the other hand, was relatively deeply analyzing it. One could not tell how much information he deciphered so far. Only Johnny, Agent Bean, was quite calm on the surface as if he had it all under control. However, he is the most confused fellow out there. Tucker, on the other hand, had been able to push out some useful information based on the names of the Knights of the Round Table and their biographies, but unfortunately, they could not be strung together to form a valid answer. In Tucker's mind, even he had deciphered quite a bit of information, so Johnny must have deciphered the whole teaser letter long ago. As for the reason he didn't say anything was that, firstly, he didn't know who Phantom Kid had disguised himself as. Secondly, it was to test his ability. Agent English must have wanted me to solve the puzzle on my own. That must be it. Tucker thought so. Time has quickly passed and they are approaching the last day. Over the past few days, Barbara had always dragged Matheson around to the Queen on various excuses. Incidentally, she familiarized him with a number of fancy places he hadn't been to before, like the Night Dome Sports Complex. Matheson had no interest in sporting events and never felt the need to visit such places. According to the plan announced today, Queen Elizabeth will head to Robinson Central Park for a final stop by, before heading to the airport to conclude her visit and there will be live helicopter broadcasters from the air throughout their journey. Robinson Park is a major landmark that has existed since the founding of Gotham and has been expanded over the centuries. Even Gotham City has dedicated a park area to the development of this legendary monument. Her Majesty won't be here until after dark. What are you dragging me over here now? Inside Robinson Central Park, Matheson grumbled with a bored look on his face as he followed behind Barbara. It's such a nice place. Why can't we go shopping first, before the Queen comes? At the sound of her voice, Barbara turned back instantly and shot Matheson with a dangerous gaze. Ahahaha. You know what? It's also nice to get some fresh air. Matheson faked laughter. At his dry laughter, Barbara only regained her happy smile and continued to wander ahead. The longer I get to know Barbara, the more I think she is less and less like the Oracle in the original storyline. I don't know if it's just me. Matheson thought internally, always following Barbara's lead. Technically speaking, the park not only covers a huge area, 
but the scenery is also quite good, and both the Fingal and the Splendor rivers have streams running through the park. A well-established ecosystem is formed, with abundant vegetation and an environment that can't be beaten. After all, even Gotham's environmental villain, Poison Ivy, is fond of it. So it's clear how good Robinson Park is. The best part is that Robinson Park is open to the public all day long. You don't need to buy an entrance ticket to visit it. It's the perfect tourist destination. But, Matheson comes to this place at least three times a month. After more than a decade, he could wander the entire park with his eyes closed without even bumping into a tree. No matter how beautiful the view was, he had already got enough of it. Barbara just couldn't get tired of it. She always drags Matheson here two or three times every month. Only on the last occasion did Matheson come here of his own accord. He didn't know why Barbara liked it so much here and neither wanted to hang out anyway. Wouldn't it be a nicer option to go down to the beach to see the ladies in bikinis anyways? But he just couldn't resist Barbara and had to come along. Whenever he asked Barbara what she really liked about this disgusting park, she always laughed and didn't say anything. Forget it. I always end up coming here anyway, just to see if my previous layout here went well. Thinking about it, it's almost time to use that secret weapon. Matheson thought darkly and quickly followed the distant figure of Barbara. And so, the two of them spent the day wandering around the park with Barbara unaware that Matheson had finished confirming all his arrangements. As night fell, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth was about to arrive. By this time, Matheson had only visited two-thirds of the park, and for the sake of having a clear view of how big Robinson Park is, the two of them came here at eight o'clock in the morning. The Queen, of course, has no time to wander, she is here for one purpose only that is to be located in the very heart of Robinson Central Park. A huge statue of Gotham's first mayor, the man who founded Robinson Park. This is the most monumental site in Gotham. If Phantom Kid wanted to make a move, this and the airport were the only two places to do it. And so, Gordon concentrated all the police forces scattered throughout Gotham's districts here. A full escort for the Queen. Only the highway from City Hall to Robinson Park was littered with police cars, with all 10,000 or so of GCPD officers out in force. The GCPD's police car configuration is constructed of two officers per car, so there were a whole lot more than 5,000 cars whizzing down the road with sirens blaring incessantly. There were even a dozen police helicopters hovering in the sky. Gordon mobilized all the forces he could. Those who didn't know what was going on might think that a war is going on after seeing this scene. Amidst the countless black and white police cars, more than 20 all black cars were parked. These were the Queen's personal royal guard, with Her Majesty sitting in the bulletproof car in the middle. Where's Charles? Hasn't he set off yet? On her luxurious seat, the Queen asked in what appeared to be a disgruntled manner. The maid on her side replied, Your Majesty, we have contacted His Royal Highness Prince Charles, and His Highness said that he remembers the time and won't be too late. At these words, the Queen nodded, and her face looked much better. Although the Queen had stopped attending the banquet these days, Prince Charles had been invited to the banquet almost every night and had even drunk a lot of wine last night. This made the Queen very unhappy. Chapter 44, Barbara's Overthinking, It's Commissioner Gordon's Daughter. Agents Starling and Bob led a team of officers to Robinson Park first. The park's initial security team had been asked by them not to let anyone cross into the central statue area. After the incident at the airport, they understood that Phantom Kid never regarded these poorly supervised security cleaners as useless, they were the perfect subjects for his disguise. Even the strictly managed GCPD would find it difficult to stop Kid's infiltration. Therefore, it is better to keep irrelevant personnel away. The grounds within a hundred meters of the statue of Gotham's first mayor were completely cleared, an area that allowed a handful of people such as the Queen the prince and Gotham's current mayor to approach. The royal guard, for its part, was exactly at the 100-meter mark, forming a closed circle with a dozen police helicopters hovering around the statue and no tall structures present around them to allow Kid to use the terrain to find a way around the helicopters. The sky has become off-limits to Phantom Kid. 
100 to 500 meters further out. The area is surrounded by GCPD police. Although the Queen and the Royal Guard were not yet on their way, Bob, Starling, and the others also held this position without moving any closer. 500 meters away was the security team of the park itself. Although they were nowhere near as numerous as the GCPD men, they were there mainly to keep the surging crowds away. When it was revealed that Her Majesty was coming to the area and that it was likely that Phantom Kid would also appear, die-hard kid fans all gathered at Robinson Park, along with countless other tourists who wanted to see the Queen in the flesh. Tens of thousands of people jammed the large square 500 meters away from the statue. Isn't that Commissioner Gordon's daughter and her boyfriend? Suddenly, Starling noticed two familiar faces among the crowd jammed in the main square. It's them. I didn't think those two kids would actually show up. Bob smiled rather amusedly and motioned for one of the officers to go and let the two in. Agent Starling, Agent Bob. Barbara came running over with an excited look on her face. Oh, what are you doing here? On a date with your boyfriend, Starling asked with a smile as she approached the young good-looking girl, perhaps because both had fathers who were police officers full of virtue and justice. She felt an inexplicable closeness to Barbara. At this question, Barbara instantly blushed. Agent Starling, you misunderstood the situation, we are not in a relationship, much less dating. Oh, really? Starling looked unconvinced, she had been there before. How could she not see through Barbara's mind, not to mention her, even Bob could see that Matheson and Barbara's relationship was not a simple one. Ahem, Agent Starling, Agent Bob, Barbara and I are here to contribute our efforts to catch Phantom Kid. Matheson coughed. So, I ask that Barbara and I be allowed to stand in this position as well. It would be a very bad situation to let Starling ask any more questions like that. It's nice of you to have that in mind, but you're just kids. I think we are enough to catch Phantom Kid. There is no need for your contribution. Bob smiled with an affable face and politely declined Matheson's request. We can't guarantee that Phantom Kid will not use powerful weapons, so it's still dangerous here. You guys just stay outside and protect yourselves first, no matter what happens. As for anything else. Just leave it to the police and us. Barbara wanted to add something else, but even Starling echoed Bob's words. In desperation, Matheson could only retreat outside with Barbara. Only, as time went on, more and more pedestrians entered the place. It became quite crowded. Barbara suddenly had a death grip on Matheson's arm. Matheson looked down into her eyes and saw the determination and doubt in her eyes, and the deepest expectation. He knew that Barbara was hoping that he is not Phantom Kid. Matheson didn't say anything. He could only apologize in his mind, but now is not the time to tell her any truth. Silently counting the minutes in his mind, the time that Matheson had planned was approaching. It didn't take long for the Queen to reach the location of the central statue under the protection of the Royal Guard. Because the crowd was so large and had surrounded the statue in a full circle, hundreds of police officers had to force a path out for the Queen to pass. In fact, the best option would have been to go by helicopter, but the environment around the statue was not suitable for a landing and the Queen was not old enough or physically able to get down by a rope ladder. Hence, the crowd had to make way. So, one thing led to another. The crowd suddenly had to clear a path that was a few people wide. They had on either side to move a considerable distance from each other to form a path. Naturally, Matheson and Barbara's side had to be affected as well. Matheson watched the general movement of the crowd on either side carefully, simulating the movement of the people around him by pushing and shoving himself behind them. Barbara unconsciously loosened her grip a little because of the crowding. Seizing the moment, Matheson pretended to be pushed by someone and fell backwards in the opposite direction to Barbara, naturally releasing his arm from Barbara's grasp. Then following the flow of the crowd, Matheson gradually moved away from Barbara's position. He knew this would make Barbara even more suspicious of the fact that he was Phantom Kid, but he had a plan for the aftermath and might even be able to dispel Barbara's suspicions in one fell swoop. Matheson, Barbara exclaimed in a panic, scanning the crowd over and over. She bit her lip, still not able to tug him herself. In other words, Matheson, really was Phantom Kid. 
The thought sent a shockwave through Barbara's heart and her mind went blank. Barbara, I'm here. After shouting a few times towards Barbara's location and waving his arms a few times to make sure Barbara couldn't see his current position, Matheson instantly changed his costume and weaved his way through the crowd with his amazing flexibility. Without attracting anyone's attention, he slipped out of the crowd. Barbara Starling shouted, pulling the thoughtful Barbara back to reality. Agent Starling? I have overlooked the situation. I didn't expect so many civilians to gather here, when obviously there weren't many when you just arrived. Bob came over with an apologetic look on his face. It was dangerous to be in such a congested crowd, in case of any collective panic. It wasn't long after Barbara and Matheson had been separated that Starling spotted Barbara crammed into the crowd and let her in, but the young girl was so distracted that she didn't respond to any calls. When Barbara came back to her senses, she thanked Starling and then returned to her previous mood. She didn't say anything about Matheson possibly being a phantom kid. Coincidence. It must be a coincidence. It can't be that he broke free of his own accord. Barbara closed her eyes and prayed. Chapter 45, The Land of Prophecy Robinson Park, under the central statue Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth gave her final speech before leaving, while countless people listened in silence. Agent Bean and Tucker stood in the middle of the royal guard. Sir, there is no sign of Phantom Kid. Is he really going to show up today? Tucker asked Agent Bean quietly. He'll definitely show up. Agent Bean affirmed with a sneer. It's half past ten and we're expected to take off at half past twelve, if he waits any longer, I bet that it'll be more than a little difficult for him to make his move. Hell, he might even show up in the next ten seconds. Tucker was startled and started looking around warily. Take it easy Tucker, calmness is the quality that every agent should always maintain. Sir. You mean to say that Phantom Kid might have disguised himself as one of the people present? Agent Bean nodded. Maybe, maybe. You are Phantom Kid. Agent Bean suddenly reached out and pinched Tucker's face. But the mask wouldn't come off. Sir, Tucker rubbed his reddened cheeks. He wanted to cry but soon pulled himself together. The Royal Guard has been operating collectively since we arrived in Gotham, and there's no way Phantom Kid could have had the chance to disguise himself as any of us. So it could only be someone from the GCPD, or another civilian. Agent Bean agreed with Tucker's words. Sir, Tucker's sight fell on Barbara, she was not so far away, standing alongside Starling. The Queen had given special permission to several agents to enter the inner circle, including Commissioner Gordon. If I remember correctly, Barbara was with Matheson earlier, but now she's the only one left and Matheson is nowhere to be found. Is it possible that Matheson is? At that, Agent Bean snorted out to laugh. Don't worry, Tucker. I'm sure that Phantom Kid can never be him. Although he denied he came from the temple, I'm sure my senses can't be wrong. He's at least connected to it, and anyone related to that place can never be a bad guy. These categorical words and extremely confident look in his eyes made Matheson, hiding in the shadows, grateful. Sir, where exactly is that place? Tucker asked with a dumbfounded look on his face. It's a sacred place. I can't reveal too much information. Agent Bean smiled mysteriously, with a nostalgic expression on his face. Anyway, there's no way that Matheson could be Phantom Kid, and with so many people here, it's normal to get separated. There's nothing really to suspect. Tucker nodded convincingly and stopped thinking about Matheson. Soon half an hour had passed and eleven o'clock in the evening was approaching. The Queen's speech came to an end, but there was some dissatisfaction in her eyes. Why isn't Charles here yet? I thought he knew the time and wouldn't be late. His Royal Highness the Prince has arrived. At that moment, there was a sudden commotion in the crowd, only to see Prince Charles walking in to tell the Queen with an apologetic face, Your Majesty. There was some delay on my way which caused my late arrival. Vital state of national affairs are missed. Whenever a leader of a nation, like yourself, arrives late, Charles, your act today has disappointed me. The Queen's faint tone implied a sense of authority, as expected of the longest training monarch of the United Kingdom. On the surface, she appears to be an amiable old grandmother, but when she gets serious, the Queen's might could overwhelm people's breath. 
A look of guilt flashed across Charles' face, only to see him bend his knees and kneel down in front of the Queen with a penitent face. Get up, Charles, this is not the UK, I don't mean to be harsh on you, there is no need to blame yourself too much. Relieved by the Queen's forgiveness, Charles stood up and walked by her side, next to Starling. Barbara was staring intently at the necklace around the Queen's neck, checking her watch every now and then as she did so. What in the world is Matheson Phantom Kid planning? Damn it! I'm so useless for not being able to decipher the full contents of the teaser letter. Barbara clenched her fists, whether or not Phantom Kid was Matheson, she had to stop him. In the shadows, where no one knew, Matheson was also watching the clock ticking. Ten, fifty-nine minutes and 55 seconds, 10 colon 29 colon 25 dot pm, 56 seconds, 57, 58, 59, 11 o'clock, a triumphant glow bloomed in Matheson's eyes and he quietly pressed the button in his hand, click, there was a strange sound from above the statue, a slender black shadow fell to the ground in front of her majesty, making a loud boom, stirring up a cloud of dust, in a full shock, the Queen took a few calm steps back to safety based on the Black Shadow's landing point. It was obvious that it had been carefully calculated not to hit anyone present. Report, unidentified object spotted falling from the statue by the third unit. Are there any casualties, please? A helicopter reported to Gordon. No casualties, keep watching the statue to see if there are any other unidentified objects present. Yes. The dust cleared and the true face of the black shadow was revealed to the eyes of tens of thousands of people within the large square of the central statue. It was a sword, a sword that had been plunged upside down into a four-sided stone on the ground. Seeing this scene, Starling, Bob, Gordon, Tucker, Barbara and even Agent Bean's faces changed. So this is it, the true explanation of the land of prophecy. The sword in the stone that fell from the sky. Phantom Kid has made his move. Everyone realized this. Ladies and gentlemen, no one was seen, but the elegant tone was coming from all directions, none other than Phantom Kid's voice. This guy. Trying to play that trick again from last time? Gordon clenched his fists as he thought of the scene that day at the Daggett Private Exhibition Hall. Kid, kid, kid. However, unlike the policemen who were on the edge of their seats, Phantom Kid's fans on the outside were all excited. They took out their glow sticks and signs while cheering and screaming loudly. Those who didn't know of the scene would have thought it was some superstar giving a concert. Anomaly detected by Unit 5, an unidentified flying object approaching in the west. It's Phantom Kid. The walkie-talkie rang again. This time from the pilot of Helicopter 5. Gordon looked towards the western sky and, sure enough, saw white glider wings, he pulled out his binoculars, closely looked at Phantom Kid, and soon spotted the surprise. Unit 5, that's a dummy, fire directly at it and destroy it. Matheson watched everything with a quiet calculating smile as he put on his earplugs. Unit 5 straw Phantom Kid's dummy with a machine gun, and the dummy held up for less than a second before exploding. However, just as the dummy exploded, an ear-splitting grotesque cloud sound emanated from inside the dummy's body, spreading to every corner of Robinson Park. Chapter 46, The Dove Cuckoo, with a loud noise coming from the exploded dummy, a series of chirping birds emerged one after another, as a result of the explosion. Countless tree branches swayed in flocks of white pigeons flew out of the forest towards the central statue. From all corners of the entire park, Pigeons flocked in varying numbers and converged on the statue. Report. There is another large flock of pigeons flying over in the distance. The number is hard to estimate. More than a dozen helicopter pilots had the most shocking experience towards this huge flock of pigeons. It was as if they formed a white cloud in the dark sky, obscuring the entire sky. Of course, this was only an exaggeration. In reality, the pigeons were flying at a much lower altitude than the helicopters were hovering. By the time the huge torrent of pigeons approached the statue, the pilot's view was completely blocked from what was going on below. A sharp-eyed pilot spotted the pigeon's claws seemingly clutching something. He immediately realized that something was wrong and reported to Gordon. Report. This is the 11th unit, 
These pigeons seem to be clutching something. What? Gordon's brow furrowed as he watched the flock of pigeons fly over from a distance. It was more clearly seen from the ground level. Each pigeon was indeed clutching an unknown object in its claws. Gordon felt extremely anxious. The flock of pigeons was seen to quickly disperse in all directions as they reached the position of the statue, and even lowered their flight altitude. All of a sudden, the entire 15-meter space above the central statue square was filled with pigeons flying back and forth. A rough estimate was that at least tens of thousands of pigeons had converged on the area. Phantom Kid has actually trained so many pigeons. This is definitely not something that can be accomplished in one year or two. Which means he has definitely been preparing for this for at least several years. Starling pondered, could Kid's real identity be a professional pigeon trainer? But how on earth did he manage to train such a large number of pigeons in Robinson Park without anyone noticing? Starling felt a tremendous pressure. This phantom kid seemed far less simple than she had thought. Did he train them somewhere else and then migrate them here? But I haven't heard of any recent incidents of pigeons migrating in large numbers, unless they were transported by truck. But it's also impossible because since Her Majesty came to visit, every car entering Gotham, even the FBI's, was heavily inspected. How on earth did he accomplish this? Robinson Central Park covers a very large area. Hence it's not difficult to hide so many pigeons. It's not a problem even if their number increases a few times. But training flocks of pigeons was a different matter, and with tens of thousands of them flying in the sky. It was impossible not to attract people. It was a pity that Starling still guessed one thing wrong, that Phantom Kid had been training these pigeons not for just a few years, but for a whole decade. The reason that Matheson had been coming here regularly every month for over a decade was to train these pigeons in secret, and instead of grouping them together, he chose to do it in batches. His training of only a dozen pigeons at a time would appear to be just a young boy feeding the pigeons and would not arouse anyone's suspicion. Thanks to his seemingly natural affinity with all kinds of birds and animals, Matheson would not have been able to accomplish such a sensational training job otherwise. Hiding in the shadows, Matheson smiled slightly and pressed a button once more. You think I am done? A simultaneous whistling sound was heard as the stereos around the square activated. You thought wrong. After listening for a few seconds, Bob, who was experienced with pets, instantly spotted the matter. This whistling sound seemed to imply some kind of command, which was not addressed to humans, but conveyed to pigeons. Agent Starling, Barbara, watch out for those pigeons. Upon hearing the whistle, the tens of thousands of pigeons flying low in the sky received the command and threw down the object they were holding in their paws in an orderly fashion. After throwing down the mysterious object, the group of pigeons scattered in all directions and flew away towards an unknown destination. Why hasn't Kid appeared yet? Many of the young girls in the crowd who wanted to catch a glimpse of Phantom Kid complained in discontent and even more glared at their male companions with annoyed faces. I'm not Phantom Kid. How would I know when he's coming out? And why are you mad at me if Phantom Kid doesn't come out? Shouldn't you blame Kid? Countless men gritted their teeth and vowed to punish this Phantom Kid one day for putting them in such a situation. What's falling from the sky? Why is it still exploding? Where's all that smoke coming from? Cough, cough, cough. It's choking. There's a burning sensation on my face. My eyes hurt, and I can't stop the tears. Tear gas. Yes. This was the preparation that Matheson made every night without Barbara's knowledge. He had spent a lot of money making a large quantity of hypnotic gas at his stronghold, because it needed to be made so that the pigeons could easily hold it. Each tear gas grenade was condensed many times, so its effect wouldn't be intense. Yet, such a large number of small tear gas grenades, once exploded, still covered the whole square. No one was spared. The ordinary people, Unlike the trained GCPD police officers and the UK Royal Guards, could not do anything but cover their eyes and noses, even if they were affected by the tear gas, they ensured at least that they would not move around. The same could not be said for the tens of thousands of people, who were frightened, rushing in a panic. Some managed to run in the right direction out of the tear gas covered area, but many more crashed inside of it. The police defences, at a touch, collapsed. Damn it. 
I can't see anything. Gordon was beyond remorseful at this point. He should have prepared a batch of gas masks but he still knew too little about this monstrous bandit. All he could do was cover his mouth and nose as best he could and feel his way over to the queen's position. No matter what, protecting her was the utmost priority. Starling and Bob acted in line with Gordon, and so did Barbara. It's unknown whether if it was intentional or not, but the smoke was thinner near Queen Elizabeth, and after the Queen covered her mouth and nose with the handkerchief she carried with her, she was largely unharmed. Your Majesty, it's dangerous here, let's go. At this point, Prince Charles also covered his mouth and nose with his handkerchief and walked over to the Queen with a look of concern and worry in his eyes. Okay, Charles. The Queen nodded, no matter what unpleasantness she had just experienced. Her son was her own after all, and although she couldn't see into the smoke, she could tell just by the sound that the place was in chaos. It was not a place to stay for long. Charles approached the Queen and was just about to help her get on her feet when a hand suddenly grabbed his wrist. Prince Charles, Chapter 47, The Arrival Charles felt his hand being grabbed and was instantly shocked. And just as he subconsciously tried to restrain the man's hand, he stopped after hearing a man's voice. Prince Charles, there's tear gas everywhere. You shouldn't move without a gas mask. Agent Bean emerged from the smoke wearing a gas mask. The MI7 agent's kit contains the right pieces of equipment for almost any situation, including portable gas masks. The FBI and CIA actually had similar kits, but Bob and Starling hadn't brought them along. As soon as Johnny came out, he took the mask off his face and put it on Charles with a solemn look on his face. I'm sorry, your highness, but I only have one more unused gas mask on me, and that's for Her Majesty. So I have to ask you to use the one I've used. With moist eyes and a shaken soul, Charles put on his mask, while Her Majesty put on the other gas mask. Of course, he was not the real Prince Charles, but Matheson in disguise. He had been caught by Johnny's hand just moments ago and thought he had been seen through from the start. Hence, Agent Johnny spoiled Matheson's attempt to steal the Tamil ruby necklace unintentionally. Now that the two were facing each other, he couldn't force his acting skills. After all, he wasn't sure of Agent Johnny's abilities. And, in case he was dragged out with them for too long, he will surely not be able to get away from this situation. Agent Bean is really worthy of being an elite. As for the real Charles, of course, Matheson couldn't really do anything to him. He was just disguised as the Queen's maid to tell Charles the wrong time to leave. Prince Charles had been drinking a lot last night. A little more sleep was maybe just what he needed. So there was no way he could come over and spoil his plans. Johnny, what about you? Matheson had to keep up the charade and pretend to be concerned about Johnny. It's alright, Tucker should be on his way here soon too. He should have two masks with him as well. Johnny smiled calmly and indicated to the Queen and the Prince that he was fine, but even after a minute or two of waiting, no one approached the place. Johnny, we can't guarantee when that phantom kid will suddenly come here and steal the necklace. I think we have to get out of here as soon as possible. Matheson suggested, he mustn't drag on any longer. He heard several people's footsteps approaching their way but I can't follow you guys around and escort you without a gas mask, it would be too dangerous. Johnny was somewhat hesitant, why do you want us to remain here so badly? Are you really waiting for help or is it that you're waiting for Phantom Kid? Matheson suddenly stared at Johnny sharply, don't you forget that, besides being the prince, I am also the honorary head of the king's administered first heavy cavalry guard, am I not capable of protecting her majesty from a thief? No. No, no, your highness, I am Johnny English, my loyalty is clear for all to see, and there is no way I would betray her majesty. Johnny scrambled to defend himself. Charles, I believe Johnny, what you just said was a bit too much. Queen Elizabeth also began to speak up for Agent Bean. But Charles is right about one thing, we do need to get out of here as soon as possible. Upon seeing this, Johnny had to comply. Matheson smirked to himself so much for Agent Bean's luck. He managed to get close to the Queen and unwittingly stole the Tamil ruby necklace from her. He was just waiting to go into the smoke with the Queen so he could slip away. Sir, we can't let him go, he's not a real prince. Suddenly, 
Tucker came out of nowhere and shouted at Johnny. The waiter at the state house just called to say that Prince Charles is just now leaving. What do you mean? English was horrified and looked at Matheson incredulously. How did this guy really manage to look like Prince Charles? Was it really Phantom Kid? Matheson sighed, as expected from Agent Bean. The footsteps that have been heard coming closer moments ago have just arrived. That's right, we can't let him get away. At that moment, Bob and Starling also rushed in. Phantom Kid, you've got a lot of nerve. The Mordred in the teaser letter is none other than the son of the renegade King Arthur, and you're actually pretending to be Prince Charles. You adore looking down at people. Starling looked angrily at the Phantom Kid, who had shed his disguise in an instant, and sneered. For some reason, a sudden blast of night breeze blew over, blowing Phantom Kid's cloak and making it flutter. One had to admit that purely from a female perspective, Phantom Kid was indeed impeccably perfect. So, you're Phantom Kid. Your disguise was really impressive. I actually couldn't see any flaws just now. Queen Elizabeth had also noticed by now that the necklace around her neck had disappeared, and said to Matheson with interest, There are not many people present, but they are all the elites of the two countries. It is not an easy task for you to escape. Will you try to hold me hostage? The Queen was right. By now, Starling and Tucker had pulled out their pistols, while Bob pulled out his belt and turned it into a long stick with a casual flip of his hand. Agent Johnny performed a combo of some unknown fighting techniques, but none of them made a move, simply because the Queen was too close to Matheson. Matheson gracefully bowed towards the Queen and said, Phantom Kid has met Her Majesty. This is to make up for not meeting her in person before. And as for Her Majesty's doubts, Phantom Kid would never rely on taking hostages for a chance to get away. Now please, your majesty, stay away from here, otherwise, we will both be stuck in an embarrassing situation. Even if Starling and the others didn't dare to shoot in the direction of the Queen, there was no way that Matheson would turn and run away. Although he hadn't seen it in action, Matheson believed in Starling's and Tucker's marksmanship, exposing his back to them would be an absolute fool's errand. Seeing how serious Phantom Kid looked, the Queen actually did believe what he said and took a step in the direction of Starling and the others. The moment Starling's eyes drifted with the Queen's movement, Matheson immediately whistled. Phantom Kid, what do you want? Starling quickly shifted her gaze back onto Matheson. Beautiful Lady Starling, please don't get too excited. I'm just calling some friends over. You have associates? Sort of. If you insist on saying so, Matheson laughed lightly. The next second, a cooing sound resumed, and the pigeons in the sky quickly gathered on Matheson's side. How can these pigeons fly this fast? In just a second or two, Matheson's entire body was overwhelmed by the pigeons, making it impossible to see his silhouette. Without thinking, Starling fired a shot at the human figure behind the pigeons. Yet not even a single pigeon, let alone a human was hit. Snap. There was another snap of the fingers and the pigeons took to the air again, while Matheson's figure had long since disappeared. Chapter 48, Phantom Kid vs. Galahad. The pigeons that had enveloped Matheson parted in a flurry, and the figure of Phantom Kid disappeared without a trace. In addition to Johnny and the others present, a dark figure on the huge palm of the central statue watched over Phantom Kid. As Phantom Kid disappeared among the pigeons, the figure actually leapt off the statue and with a puff opened the cloak on its back, forming a gliding wing, like the wings of a bat. Matheson followed his original route and quickly left the central area of the park, out of the confines of the statue square and into a hidden wooded area. Barbara must have confirmed by now that I'm Phantom Kid, so she'll definitely be waiting for me in that area, and then I can carry out my plan to make Phantom Kid and Matheson two people once and for all. After confirming that no one was following behind him, Matheson turned around and moved forward to his intended location. However, when he turned back around, there was actually an extra person in front of him. It was an older handsome man in a suit and holding a black umbrella who appeared in front of Matheson. Hey hey, no way. How come even the king's men have popped out? Matheson had thought that Agent Bean's men were already troublesome, 
but he didn't expect there to be even more outrageous people. The Royal Gentlemen's Secret Service, established at the end of World War I by a highly distinguished duke, was nearly a century old. S-H-I-E-L-D was a stepchild compared to it. However, although they are both mysterious organizations hidden from the world's view, the overall strength of the Royal Gentlemen is much weaker than that of S-H-I-E-L-D, which is backed by the World Security Council and possesses various black technologies. However, in terms of the quality of individual agents, although the Royal Gentlemen are few in number, every one of them is at least two S-H-I-E-L-D agent of level 6 or above. In particular, Harry Hart, now the strongest of the Royal Gentlemen Galahad, whose battle performance in the film is definitely not below that of Hawkeye and Black Widow. It is also the man in front of Matheson Phantom Kid. The teaser letter was very classy, but unfortunately, using the legend of the Knights of the Round Tables legend, it was very easy to decipher, Harry said blandly. Following the guidance of fate, Q will finally set foot on the land to reproduce the prophecy. When L commits an unforgivable sin, he is replaced by the most gracious G. B can only make the final decision. Because the cunning M is ready to pierce K's heart, by the guidance of fate, you meant the planned royal itinerary. And once Her Majesty had set foot on the land, you activated the mechanism to make the long-prepared sword in the stone fall and reproduce the prophecy. In the playing cards, Lancelot represents the Jack of Clubs, which would also imply that the time of your action is at exactly 11 o'clock at night. Bedivere repeatedly hesitated three times before deciding to return the holy sword, so the key number is 3. Combined with Gon in the previous sentence, with the third letter in the logarithm being W, or West-West. Hence the dummy you use to gather the doves before flying in from the west, and now intending to escape through the woods west of the statue as well. These woods are so large that you are able to see through my escape route. You are really worthy of being a royal agent. After hearing Harry's complete interpretation, Matheson was not surprised at all but instead smiled calmly. Upon hearing the word royal agent, Harry's pupils shrank. Their existence was unknown even to Queen Elizabeth. How did this crossover Phantom Kid know about it? Phantom Kid, it looks like you have a lot of secrets. Harry stared deeply at Matheson, difficult to discern his appearance against the light, but the look in his bare other eye revealed confidence that was in control. That's the best compliment you can pay to a thief, Mr. Galahad. Did he actually even know the agent's code name? Harry's face didn't change as he continued. The terrain in these woods is complex, but there are only three routes that will lead to a successful escape from Robinson Park, using the statue as coordinates to the west. The first is to follow a southwesterly direction. After about two kilometers, the road will take you into the branch of the Splendor River. The second is to escape directly west, about three kilometers away. There is a watchtower from which you can fly directly out of the park on a glider. I thought you would have chosen to go that way. The last one is here, northwest, and five kilometers further back is where the Finger River branch is off. Oh? Then why did you choose to wait here? Weren't you afraid that I would actually go west? Matheson asked curiously. Harry had a strange feeling at this point. Obviously, he was in a position where he and Phantom Kid were in absolute hostility. But this thief didn't seem to be at all self-conscious of such a situation. Instead, he was here chatting like he had known him as a friend for a long time. He was not in a hurry, afraid that the army would come and block him to death. In fact, even if you choose the other two roads, you will not be able to escape just the same, because our people are spread over those spots, and I believe in their ability. Additionally, it was his agent's final exam. Those words didn't come out of Harry's mouth because of one thing he realized after meeting Matheson. They had completely underestimated this phantom kid. The odds of winning against him are hard to tell when pitting Eggsy or Roxy alone against him. You know, I've always believed in the saying. Harry didn't want to go on and was going to just show his hand. If you don't know your manners, you can't stand for yourself. Can you? Matheson said what Harry wanted to say, a phrase that only an English gentleman would utter. It was impossible for anyone to maintain absolute self-control when what they wanted to say was said by someone else. As a result, 
Harry lost his focus for a moment. Matheson seized this momentary opportunity and quickly closed in on Harry, trying to subdue him. However, unlike his previous opponents, Harry was able to regain his focus in just a split second. The knife that Matheson aimed at Harry's neck was blocked by an umbrella before it could fall. The umbrella spun around with a subtle force and brought Matheson's arm to the side. Matheson drew back in a hurry to avoid Harry's ensuing elbow strike. Whoosh! At some point, Matheson's index and middle fingers had clasped a playing card and flung it out as he closed the gap between him and Harry. Harry quickly tilted his head, and the poker card passed the side of his cheek, leaving a light red cut. Harry's eyes flashed with fear as he watched another poker card appear in Matheson's hand. Chapter 49, Bullet Time Phantom Kid, make sure to count the time. The effects of the tear gas have almost worn off. The GCPD's men will soon launch a full-scale search of the park. The longer you remain here, the worse it will be for you. Harry calmly raised the umbrella in his hand horizontally, in which the tip of it was facing Matheson. With a slight turn of the umbrella, a sleeping dart was shot out of the tip. Having seen the film, Matheson already knew that it was not an ordinary umbrella. He smoothly sidestepped the dart, but as Harry had said, it wouldn't be long before a GCPD search party would find this place, and then it would be really hard for him to run away. With a determined mindset, Matheson immediately threw out the playing cards in his hands. Eight cards in each hand bounced directly together towards Harry. After experiencing the sharpness of the cards once before, Harry didn't dare to be careless and opened his umbrella instantly. This was a special bulletproof umbrella that could not only block a rocket's blast but also allow him to see through it. Even so, the eight playing cards did not bounce off but instead nestled on the umbrella's surface. Harry could clearly see the playing cards on the surface of the umbrella and couldn't help but marvel at Phantom Kid's mastery in flying card skills. With a glazed look in his eyes, Matheson's hands once again turned into his playing cards. This time, he threw them out of the sides, instead of aiming directly at Harry. Harry saw through the back of the umbrella that four cards flew out from each side, bypassing the umbrella and continuing behind him. Matheson looked at first like a skillless gunman who aimed at his target's heart but missed it. There's no way he's making such a useless move. After the playing cards flew past the umbrella, Harry felt that something was wrong and, without thinking, turned round and spread the umbrella backwards. Sure enough, the poker card that had flown to the back magically turned, re-flown back aiming right at Harry. PFFFFFFFF. Eight cards were once again nested on the surface of the umbrella. Suddenly, a sense of crisis rose in Harry's heart. He rolled to the side intuitively and turned back to see that Matheson had flung the playing cards again. I don't think we'll be able to get rid of them any time soon without using any special tricks. Seeing that he couldn't take Harry down, Matheson thought. He took a deep breath. His eyes were strangely red and his heart was beating faster and faster. Boom boom. Boom boom boom. Boom boom boom. Matheson heard clearly his heartbeat getting louder and powerful. At the same time, his body temperature was soaring and fine beads of sweat were showing from his forehead. A normal person's heart rate is around 60 to 100 beats per minute BPM, and even during strenuous exercise, it is essentially between 160 and 180 BPM. It is rare for someone's heart rate to exceed 200 BPM. But at this moment, Matheson's heart rate easily exceeded 200 and was even approaching 400. As his heartbeat accelerated, Matheson sensed that the flow of time in the outside world was slowing down, and the movement of all objects was becoming slower and slower. Bullet time. The ability that Matheson was now using was the very same ability that he had been rewarded with earlier, the most powerful ability in Carlos' lifetime of experience. In a way, it was similar to inherent time control, allowing one's time flow to be distinguished from that of the outside world. However, bullet time was certainly more convenient than the heavily self-inflicted inherent time constraint. Matheson slammed the poker cards in his hand with force. From his perspective, the playing cards flew out at a slow speed, bit by bit towards Harry's position. After an unknown amount of time, 
The poker flew in front of Harry and stabbed him in the leg at an odd angle. Throughout the whole journey, Harry's body only moved two millimeters. Bullet time, lift. Beads of sweat dripped from Matheson's face and his red-filled eyes gradually returned to his normal color. Although maintaining bullet time was not as harmful to the body as inherent time control, a heart rate of 400 BPM puts a huge burden on the body all the same. It would feel as if you've just finished a five-kilometer run. Excuse me, Mr. Galahad, but I'll have to ask you to stay here a little longer now. Matheson bowed in a gentlemanly fashion to Harry. What did you just do? Harry looked at Phantom Kid with a shocked look on his face, a sharp pain coming from his leg, blood pouring out. During all his years of experience as an agent, he has almost been completely incapacitated for a short time himself. Matheson laughed and didn't say anything back. How could he reveal such a superb technique like bullet time? Farewell, Mr. Galahad. Matheson flung the cloak behind him so that it completely covered his body, only to see the cloak falling naturally to the ground, and the figure of Phantom Kid had disappeared. Exe, Roxy, Phantom Kid won't be heading your way. Soon the Gotham Police Department will be searching the park in full. We shouldn't remain here any longer. We will evacuate immediately. Harry gave the order to retreat to the two rookie agents, and then briefly treated his wounds to ensure that his movement would not leave any blood stains. Although a lot of blood had been left on the spot, there was no information about his blood in the official database, so he was not worried about his blood being collected by the GCPD. Dragging his injured leg, Harry's figure disappeared as well into the shadows of the woods. It didn't take long for Gordon to arrive with a large group of GCPD officers, accompanied by Starling. Sir, there are signs of a fight here. Several playing cards have been found beside a white cloak. It looks like Phantom Kid was fighting someone here not too long ago. One of the officers at the front reported after inspecting the area. Gordon and Starling went up in sync to check for themselves, and sure enough, they found signs of a fight and even the blood stain. This blood could be Phantom Kids. Where are the forensics officers? Take a sample quickly. Yes, sir. Two forensics officers from the GCPD stepped forward to take a blood sample. It seems that the path we chose is the route that Phantom Kid took to escape. Starling said as she gazed deeper into the woods. It wasn't long before they had as well deciphered the entire contents of the teaser letter. After all, Kid's plan had already been carried out before their eyes. And when combining everything that has happened, any fool could have understood the contents of the teaser letter. The three escape routes were of course also seen by Starling and the others. So they split into three groups. Bob and Johnny headed southwest and due west too, while Gordon and Starling headed northwest. But the truth was that, of all three routes, Matheson took none. Because he did not intend to leave Robinson Park now. In the dense forest west of the central statue, there is a small stone pavilion. Barbara was alone, sitting there quietly. Chapter 50, Who is Phantom Kid? Wow! A sound made by a foot on the grass broke the piece of the stone pavilion. The sound came from behind Barbara. Miss Gordon, I didn't expect anyone to guess my real escape route. You're much better than the FBI and CIA. Phantom Kid stepped out of the woods facing Barbara's back. But, why? Barbara didn't turn around, she ignored his words and asked in a clear cold voice. Phantom Kid. No, I should rather say Matheson Fang. At her words, he remained silent. Won't you say anything back to me? Is this how you wanted things to go? Barbara suddenly turned back to look at Phantom Kid angrily. Why are you doing all of this? Before asking me about the reason why I'm doing all of this, I'd like to remind you, miss, that you have the wrong person. Phantom Kid chuckled softly. I'm not the man you have in mind. Barbara's face flushed, then she reacted with shame and anger. Don't you dare to play dumb on me, Matheson. Wasn't it the person you liked? Could my investigation be wrong? Kid raised his chin in a puzzled manner as if the Matheson Barbara was talking about had nothing to do with him. I mean, you aren't confessing to me in a different way. Are you? Barbara narrowed her eyes at Phantom Kid. If you had been bolder before maybe I would have said yes, but now, you're a criminal. We, at that, 
Barbara's eyes darkened. Why do you think I'm Matheson Fang? Phantom Kid asked suddenly. Since you're going to play dumb to the end, I'll say it plainly. Barbara gave Phantom Kid a stern look. That day on the yacht in the Merchant's River, I had actually woken up a long time before you came. That's when you said thanks to you this time, Barbara Wright. Perhaps you didn't realize that although you didn't use your own voice when you said it, you very naturally addressed me as Barbara, so you could only have been someone I knew well, and you deliberately broke away from my hand when the Queen arrived, didn't you? Stop pretending, Matheson. You can't hide it from me even with a hat and glasses on. The expression on Phantom Kid's face remained unchanged, but deep down, he realized that it was at that time that he was exposed. Well Barbara, since you want to see my true face so badly, I'll just have to. Phantom Kid sighed and reached up to remove his hat and glasses. You said he was Matheson Fang. How is this possible? Just then a startled voice came from the woods next to them. The voice seemed to belong to some very old man. Johnny rushed out through the bushes in front of her and saw the small secluded stone pavilion. And, of course, heard the identification Barbara had just made. Johnny couldn't believe such a thing. Would even an heir of Kamartage do something like stealing? No, could it be that Matheson was not in fact the heir of Kamartage, or that he had betrayed them? In any case, Johnny who was somehow convinced that Matheson was connected to Kamartage, was speechless due to his shock. By coincidence, Johnny had led the group in pursuit due west, but on the way to search, he suddenly had a stomachache. Then after looking for a place to address his needs, Johnny found himself lost and then started wandering through the woods, only to end up in such a place crookedly. Then, he heard the shocking words that Commissioner Gordon's daughter uttered. The man he thought could never be Phantom Kid was actually Phantom Kid. Daisy. However, neither of the two people present paid any attention to him. Barbara couldn't help but exclaim out loud when she saw the face that Phantom Kid revealed when he took off his hat and glasses. Phantom Kid looked at her and smiled, saying, Surprised, Barbara? Can't I call you Barbara? No, I know very well that you're good at disguising yourself. You're actually pretending to be Daisy. Who is obviously doing research with Dr. Foster now, so how could she be Phantom Kid? After a brief moment of surprise, Barbara quickly calmed down. Well, Barbara, I'm actually Phantom Kid. Laughing, Phantom Kid suddenly snatched down his cloak and his appearance changed once again. This time it was Jim Gordon. Even the chief's police uniform was on him. Barbara grimaced. Ha 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 ha. Miss Gordon. I must say you do have a keen eye for actually suspecting someone around you, but the truth is that by then I already knew you were awake and the reason I said that was to play a little joke on you. It seems to have caused you a great deal of distress and I am here to apologize, Miss Gordon. At the sight of Barbara's outrageous reaction, Phantom Kid let out a hearty laugh before bowing solemnly to Barbara. I'm sorry, Mr. Fang. Phantom Kid, even though I have no clue what is going around, but I'd like you to raise your hands now. Johnny felt ignored and at the same time more confused. Originally Johnny was shocked that Phantom Kid's real identity was Matheson, but now, because of the many disguises he has just pulled, Johnny had no idea who Phantom Kid really was. Regardless, his pistol was pointed at Phantom Kid. Agent Johnny, after seeing this, can you still say such things? The unmistakably familiar voice came and Johnny's eyes instantly widened. Phantom Kid slowly turns around to face him, and that face has turned into that of the Queen. No matter how mentally prepared he was, Johnny still froze on the spot when he saw this face. So, goodbye to you both. Taking advantage of this, Phantom Kid quickly ran away. Barbara instantly rushed over to him. Stop right there, Matheson. You're going too far. I told you I'm not who you say I am. Who's going to believe that? Johnny's reflexes seemed to be delayed for a few seconds, and it took a moment for him to come back to their senses and rush after them as well. Between the three, one after the other, there was a chase through the woods. It was only a matter of time before Phantom Kid scampered between the trees and reached the road leading due west to the watchtower. Matheson, you can't get away. Barbara sped up as fast as she could trying to close the distance between herself and Phantom Kid. Barbara, what are you talking about? Why can't I get away? Suddenly, 
an unmistakably familiar voice came from Barbara's side, causing Barbara to freeze instantly in place and turn her head in disbelief. All she saw was that on the path stretching from the direction of the central statue, Matheson was running towards her turning her head again to look ahead. The back of Phantom Kid kept moving away. Chapter 51 Matheson's Plan Barbara, what's with that look on your face? Matheson asked curiously as he ran across Barbara. At this point, Barbara was still in unbelievable shock and couldn't respond. What are you looking at? Matheson followed her gaze towards the watchtower. Hey, that's Phantom Kid. In fact, the Phantom Kid that ran away wasn't really Phantom Kid. Or even a real entity, to be precise. After he noticed that Barbara was starting to get suspicious of him, Matheson had been thinking of some sort of measure. It wasn't until he saw a spell of red magic that could briefly create an illusion that his problem was solved. The effect of this spell was very simple and particularly weak. It created a phantom that clones his previous actions and last less than 10 minutes. The phantom could not speak, could not move freely, and did not even have a physical body. And so, Matheson could only control the direction towards which it could run. Otherwise, it will cause problems if it directly phases through trees. Now, you're probably asking why didn't he just create a whole actual clone? Well, do you think Matheson doesn't want to? There's no such spell in red magic. Not only that, even if there was such a spell, it is impossible for Matheson to cast that spell with his current magic powers. That's why Matheson had to lure Barbara into chasing him so that he could create a running phantom and choose a place to hide in the dense forest, because there are many trees that can obscure view. He wasn't afraid of being seen if he uses his magic at the corner of a random tree, and when using magic while wearing black clothes, the white phantom will undoubtedly attract the attention of Barbara and Johnny, making Matheson's true form even less likely to be spotted. Now Matheson pretended to be surprised as he looked at Phantom Kid running away. Matheson, there you are, that Phantom Kid is really not you. Behind him, Johnny had by now caught up and laughed happily when he saw Matheson coming from the exact opposite direction. His recent deduction had indeed been correct. What? Phantom Kid? Me? At that, Matheson opened his mouth widely, pointed at himself, looked at Johnny with an odd expression then at Barbara who was torn beyond belief, and then it was as if something had occurred to him. I was questioning the way you have been so weird the last few days, clinging to me to see the Queen, coming over to my house to for a meal, and inexplicably pulling my hand. So you really thought I was Phantom Kid? Matheson's tone was full of sadness and disappointment. We've known each other for more than ten years. And, still, you suspect me so easily? Is there even any basic trust between the two of us? All right. All right. I was wrong. This is not the time to talk about it. Mr. Johnny, go after Phantom Kid. He's getting away. Barbara glanced at Matheson awkwardly before pointing at Phantom Kid who was about to disappear at the end of her vision. Without any other word, Johnny went chasing after him. By the way, why did you suddenly come here? Alone? Barbara suddenly stared at Matheson. I just remembered that you're also obsessed with magic, right? That fits the profile of Phantom Kid. So, maybe what I have just seen was another magic trick like those transformations? You aren't still suspecting me of being Phantom Kid, are you? A drop of sweat dripped from Matheson's forehead he didn't have a good feeling about this situation. Who told you I came here alone? I just ran a little faster than the others. Matheson pulled out a card from his pocket, in which was written, Ladies and gentlemen, who love to be here, the unexpected situation that has just arisen has prevented you from seeing my performance. I apologize for this. So I have decided to run a second show at the Watchtower to the west of the central statue. I now kindly ask all those who have received an invitation to be there at midnight. From Phantom Kid calculating the time. It was indeed almost midnight. Barbara looked at the card suspiciously. You didn't write this now, did you? However, no sooner had the words left her lips, she heard noisy voices. There was a large crowd on the road where Matheson had come running, not as imposing as the tens of thousands of people in the square before, but at least in the thousands. Why did these people happen to be here? In fact, 
There was a short period of time between his and Barbara's dispersal at the Queen's entrance and his appearance under the disguise of Prince Charles, and it was certainly impossible for Matheson to have done nothing in that time. He took advantage of the time to quietly stuff the same cards in the pockets or bags of this group of people. Since all of these men were standing on the outermost edge, they would naturally run outside when the tear gas came into play, easily out of range of the gas taking effect. Of course, there was no complete guarantee, but at least many cards were put out by Matheson. There were quite a few people who didn't come here. The time was marked to prevent them from arriving too early so that even if someone came here first it would not affect the situation, and even if the police saw them they would only be able to deploy their forces near the watchtower. From the very beginning, Matheson had planned everything out. All the signs pointed to the fact that Kidd and Matheson were two people. Inexplicably, Barbara sighed deeply in relief. It seems I really misjudged you, Matheson. Barbara said to Matheson with an apologetic manner, but I didn't think that Phantom Kid could investigate me so thoroughly. No, I should say investigate my father so thoroughly. He knows everything that has anything to do with him. Me, you, Uncle Cash, Daisy, even the Stone Pavilion. The Stone Pavilion? What Stone Pavilion? Matheson asked dully, rubbing his head. Barbara's cheeks instantly rose in two red clouds. She almost forgot that Matheson didn't know about that. It was the place where Matheson and Barbara had first met, more than ten years ago. A little girl followed her father, who had taken a rare holiday, to Robinson Park. Then, as they were about to go to the watchtower, the old plot happened. The little girl gets lost and got separated from her dad in the woods. Fortunately, she did not encounter any danger, but rather stumbled upon a stone pavilion hidden in the dense forest. Then she saw a little boy in the pavilion who was dressing the wound of a pigeon. She was afraid to go out because she was hiding in the bushes. She also noticed that although the little boy was gently dressing a wounded pigeon, his face was filled with sadness. The little boy was Matheson, but the pigeons were not the reason Barbara suspected Matheson. After all, there are thousands of people who like to feed the pigeons in Robinson Park and Matheson is just one of them. It was just that everyone didn't know that Matheson was secretly training the pigeons. At that time, Barbara was very curious about the little boy who was very caring and inexplicably sad. Barbara did not appear before the little boy then, waiting until he left. She followed him out of the woods from a distance. From then on, Barbara had to visit the stone pavilion whenever she came to Robinson Park with Gordon. Sometimes she could see the boy and sometimes she couldn't. But each time Barbara hid from the boy's sight. Even after she grew older, Barbara would come here alone from time to time. After several months had passed, Barbara found out that the little boy had moved to her class and that they lived on the same street. Then the two became childhood friends as a matter of course. Barbara always thought that Matheson didn't know that she had spied on him at the stone pavilion and Matheson never mentioned it. Chapter 52, Sea Level Magic By the way, you went straight to see Phantom Kid, thinking he was me. So did you finally see his real face? Instead of pursuing the matter of the stone pavilion, Matheson asked her something else to change the subject. How could I? Barbara laughed bitterly. I thought that we could understand Phantom Kid's disguise well. Assuming that he could only disguise himself as one person at a time, or put two masks on at most. Because once one wears too many masks, the shape of their face changes and this may even cause them hypoxia. For example, in the Adams Star incident, he disguised himself as Officer Blake and Officer Cash, and in the Cat's Eye Emerald incident, he disguised himself as me. No matter who he pretended to be, it never exceeded common sense. But just now he made the switch from Daisy to my father in an instant in front of me, with an unbelievably natural change in face shape that didn't look like he'd put on a mask in advance at all. I wonder if he could actually shapeshift. Matheson smiled secretly. This craft was Kit's unique skill. Except that he couldn't change his body shape drastically. He could almost shift into thousands of people. It seems that Phantom Kid is really powerful. So, what did he tell you when you questioned him? At that, Barbara remembered that conversation from earlier and blushed. How could she tell him that? Nah. He didn't say anything special. A smirk flashed across Matheson's eyes. How could he not know what Barbara had said? So, 
Are you going to see Kid's second show? I'd be curious to know what else he wants to do now that the Tamil ruby necklace is in hand. Upon seeing more and more people making their way to the watchtower, Matheson asked Barbara with interest. Then of course I'm. I can't go for now. Barbara, who was about to say yes in one fell swoop, suddenly stopped and thought again of the scene earlier when she had confronted Phantom Kid and couldn't help but change her mind. It's not like we're going to be of any help anyway, we're just going to watch the action, rather than that, I'd just trust my dad and the others to catch Phantom Kid sooner or later, I don't want to see that thief laughing at me again. Barbara turned her head and grunted, but, weren't you always uninterested in Phantom Kid before? Why are you suddenly so taken with him? Matheson chuckled and said, I'm only interested because you've been talking about Kid every day recently. What did you just say? Barbara froze, wondering if she had just heard him wrong. What, did I say something wrong? You clearly did. Stop it, Commissioner Gordon should be here soon with a team as well. So, you wait here for him. I'll go first. Matheson said helplessly. He did not wait for Barbara's reaction before running off with the pedestrians towards the observation tower. This guy is still the same as always. He doesn't take care of people's feelings at all. Looking at Matheson's back, Barbara thought irritably, like a fool who could ever have a crush on him. Blending in with the crowd, Matheson hurried along while opening his system panel on the other side. Originally, he thought that when the Tamil Ruby arrived, the designated mission should be considered completed. But in fact, it was only halfway done. The cause given by the system was that, not all the threats are yet removed and that only once he returns to the stronghold that the mission would be completed. However, there was one advantage of the designated mission over the one kid personally chooses. The reward is divided into two parts, one is the value of the mission target itself which can be collected immediately after obtaining the target, which is equivalent to an additional reward. The other is the final reward given by the system. The extra reward for this designated mission is, naturally, the magic contained in the Tamil Ruby. The jewel had been worn by the Queen for decades and had been swamped by an entire country's aura, giving the Ruby many magical effects. Even when the magic of the gem is taken away, these effects will not disappear. For example, it gives the wearer a long and healthy life, which is one of the reasons why the queen has been able to live for so long and remain so energetic. The system had started extracting the magic power from the gem the moment Matheson put his hand on it, and now that quite a bit of time had passed, Matheson saw that the extraction was complete. After all, the system has always been deadly dull, naturally. There would be no beep or prompt after the extraction is complete, and it is impossible for Matheson to always watch the system panel. See rank magic power is extractable. Sure enough, a pop-up window appeared after opening the panel, showing that magic could be transferred to his body. Without any hesitation, Matheson directly clicked on extract magic power and immediately felt his magic power increasing in a matter of seconds. It had been multiplied by dozens of times. At least now, his magic power level was no longer below that of Akako Koizumi. It was just that his knowledge of magic was a little less. At this point, Matheson was finally able to use most of the red magic. After a while, Johnny rushed down to the watchtower and met up with the team of GCPT officers he had initially brought with him, but could never find any signs of Phantom Kid. Tucker and the others said as well that they hadn't seen Phantom Kid coming this way. It wasn't long before something even more confusing happened to him. No less than a thousand people gathered in the area one after another. And more and more were coming over. What's going on, sir? Tucker asked Johnny, at a loss for words. This might be. Johnny had no idea why these Gotham folk were running to this place, and it was midnight now. What kind of person would visit a park at midnight? On top of that, it wasn't that long ago that they had been covered with tear gas, yet they still had the audacity to hang around. Shouldn't normal people have already gone home? It's no wonder. After all, Johnny and Tucker, who were from THR UK, didn't fully understand the daily life of Gotham residents. Tear gas? What's that? Is it something scary? We only know scarecrows fear gas and someone's, who no one dares to say his name, laughing gas. 
Well, although these guys have been in Arkham Asylum for years, as a Gotham resident, it would be a shame to be irritated by such a scene. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your willingness to come here. Suddenly, the spotlights on the observation tower lit on at the same time, instantly making the area around the tower as bright as day. A white figure appeared at the top of the tower. His cloak was fluttering in the wind and his elegant and arrogant stance was clearly visible. The lights in the background added a sense of noblesse to this figure and mystery to his identity. This man needs not to be introduced. That's Phantom Kid. Chapter 53 The Legacy of Magic Remains Johnny. At that moment, a black car pulled up, and Queen Elizabeth got out of it. Your Majesty, what brought you? It's dangerous out here. Johnny hurried forward and bowed. What's so dangerous? I've heard that Phantom Kid never attempted to hurt people. The Queen seemed displeased with Johnny's speech. Surrounded by her royal guards, the Queen stepped forward and looked with interest at Phantom Kid at the top of the tower. Kid, Kid, Kid. As soon as Phantom Kid appeared on the stage, thousands of people gathered under the tower and immediately cheered frantically for him. Oh? It looks like Phantom Kid is very popular among the people of Gotham. The Queen watched the scene with considerable amusement. Johnny and Tucker stood by the Queen's side, unsure of what to say in reply. Looking at his fans, Matheson felt a sense of enjoyment. Despite the hardship behind maintaining such spectacle, the feeling of being in the spotlight was a real pleasure. The news that Adam Star has been sold spread like wildfire and the fact that he donated a huge amount of money under the name of the Magician of the Moonlight has also been exposed. These were things that even Roxy could find on the internet, and they were even less difficult for others to find out. It was not something that Matheson had expected to be kept under the curtains. After the story came to light, Phantom Kid's popularity was controversial. Some have seen it as a Robin Hood act of righteousness. But others say it is nothing more than stealing. It was not long after Pamela entrusted the Cat's Eye Emerald to Tony Stark, under the pressure of Iron Man, that Daggett had to return the original auction money to Pamela. Of course, the Cat's Eye Emerald remained in Stark's hands, so Daggett did not end up taking the blame for the murder of Pamela's father. Everything was the result of a mutual agreement. There was nothing Stark could do to punish Daggett. In this case, Iron Man can't solve it either, because Stark also lives in the system of capital operation, and he can't simply just break this system. Daggett had done a clean job, all evidence had been eliminated and it had been very hard to recover the inheritance. Although Pamela was reluctant, she, a young schoolgirl, was not even in a position to struggle against Daggett, who effectively controlled half of Wayne Enterprises. In the end, Pamela had no choice but to re-enroll in New York University, choosing to major in botany. This incident was undoubtedly a scandal for Daggett, and as the largest shareholder on the current board of Wayne Enterprises, one can only imagine the consequences. For a short period of time, Pamela was questioned every day by countless journalists about the complete story, yet in every interview, Pamela would never mention anything about Daggett as if she had no hatred towards him at all, just kept saying that her only real supporter was Phantom Kid. Since Phantom Kid's debut, both of his crimes have shocked the nation, and through the end result, it seems that this master thief is not simply stealing for money. On the contrary, the number of people who have been helped by him is beyond imagination. Robbing the rich to provide for the poor has apparently become a major label on Phantom Kid. Some have even already called him the Robin Hood of the 21st century. All in all, Matheson's reputation among the general public was getting better by the day. But in the eyes of the government, a crime is always a crime. And whatever the original intention is, righteous be it or not, it doesn't change the fact that it was committed. That's why the thousands of people under the tourist tower didn't just throw away kids' message cards but actually came out to support him after they found them. From just liking the handsomeness and magic of Kid at the beginning to becoming a real fan of his, Matheson opened his arms as if he was hugging the fans. This gesture immediately drew a crowd of women in the arena to scream, Phantom Kid. You have proven yourself by snatching the Tamil ruby necklace from my neck. Why didn't you leave the first time instead of letting people gather here? The Queen suddenly shouted at Matheson, 
Her voice was so loud that the crowd thought it was probably a young woman that was yelling. Her Majesty is joking, I am only very fond of this rare big jewel. This time, I have merely borrowed it to admire it closely, not to take it as my own. The elegant tone of Matheson's voice came down from the top of the tower. He was seen holding out his hand, with his index and thumb clasping a brilliant ruby right between them. Following what he said in the teaser letter, Matheson slowly raised his hand so that the jewel was facing the bright moon in the sky. The pale moonlight shone on the Tamil ruby, adding a hazy touch of beauty. Of course, there could be no Pandora gems hidden inside of it. Not in this world at least. So to the eyes of the crowd at the bottom of the tower, Phantom Kid was just seriously admiring the jewel. Now that my wish has been granted, it is only natural that the gem should be returned to its rightful owner. Matheson laughed softly. Then, your majesty, I shall now walk up to you and put this necklace back on for you. In this challenge, it is you who won in the end. And as I said, if you can get it, then it is fully yours. I can assure you that my country will not pursue you. At these words, the Queen shook her head. She thought that Phantom Kid was afraid to be the UK's most wanted criminal to say something like returning the jewel, so much so that she completely ignored what Matheson said about the way to return it. Oh my god, Kid, he actually. The next moment cries filled with shock rose up, as if they had seen the most incredible scene of their lives. Tap tap tap. The unusually clear sound of footsteps came from above their heads. When they looked up, a white figure was walking midair, as if there was an invisible step from the top of the tower to the ground, Phantom Kid walked down from above step by step. Nonsense. How on earth did he manage to do that? Was there a wire under his feet? No way. If there was a wire we should have been able to see it from the ground too. That's a real walk in the air. It was clear by the direction and angle of Phantom Kid's step down that there was indeed heading in the direction of the Queen. Some who couldn't believe it ran to this tower and kept looking up and down outside the protective circle of the Royal Guard, hoping to find a wire or something. Needless to say, they naturally came up empty-handed. I've long heard that Phantom Kid is a master magician, and when I saw it today, I can really say that his magic is marvellous. It's so convincing to say it's magic, the Queen exclaimed. Matheson laughed deep in his mind as he listened to the gasps from below. This is not the kind of circus magic that uses wires, but the real deal. Oh, yeah, red magic. Moreover, after his magic reserves rose to see rank, his control over magic power had also increased. In other words, he would no longer be in a situation where he unconsciously reveals his magic aura. So at this moment, when he was openly using magic, Johnny couldn't detect any auras round him. Chapter 54 Black and White's Meeting Under everyone's stunned gaze, Matheson walked confidently from the sky to the ground. Like an angel from heaven descending to earth, he crossed the protective circle of the royal guards from the air and headed towards the Queen. Your Majesty, are you satisfied with my performance? Phantom Kid made the most standard gentleman's bow to the Queen and asked with a light smile. Even with a circle of people around him from the Royal Guard, he never flinched for a moment. In terms of magic alone, what you have displayed today is the most stunning performance I have ever seen in my life. The Queen did not hold back the words of her admiration. In that case, I consider today's performance a success. Matheson bowed and looked like he was about to leave the place. Phantom Kid, didn't you say you were going to return the Queen's necklace? It was only at that moment that Tucker stepped forward and questioned. As soon as the words left his mouth, he saw Phantom Kid turn to him in wonder and say, It's already been returned to Her Majesty, look at what she is wearing around her neck. As the crowd looked, somehow the Tamil ruby was hanging around Queen Elizabeth's neck. The Queen held the jewel from her chest in amazement, and it did not take her much examination to know that it was indeed the real thing. If you excuse me, I will now return to the tower. With a faint smile, Matheson simply snapped his fingers and a cloud of smoke suddenly enveloped his entire body. As the smoke cleared, there was no longer any sign of his figure. Once they had shifted their look towards the sky again, they saw Matheson right in midair. Tap, tap, tap. In full view of everyone. Kid once again performed his magic of walking on air, and slowly, he made his way to the top of the watchtower. By then, Gordon, Starling, Bob, 
Barbara and the others had all moved over from other directions. A large black mass of police officers surrounded the tower in time for the last airwalk show. A dozen helicopters hovered over it, in an attempt to trap Phantom Kid on top. Ladies and gentlemen, standing at the top of the tower, Phantom Kid's voice reached the ears of everyone below. The helicopter propellers rattled loudly, stirring up the air currents at the top of the tower creating a strong blast of wind. The white cloak was floating wildly. Even in the face of such a predicament, Kid kept his poker face. Thank you all for watching, and, please, stay tuned for my next performance. Such an arrogant statement. As if he was sure he would be able to escape this time. And he even sent out an invitation to the next show. He simply had no regard for the police and agents present. Nowadays, Matheson does have enough capital to ignore these people. There won't be a next one, without warning, a low. Raspy voice came from behind Matheson, close at hand. Matheson's pupils clenched. When did this man approach behind him? Cautiously. He turned his head and what met his eyes was a dark figure. The man's chest was clearly marked with a bat. Batman. Having studied materials science, Matheson could easily mini materials on Batman's suit that made him drool. A black suit made of Kevlar and titanium, and a black cape made of special vibranium. The bat helmet, which covers most of his head, uses an impact-resistant synthetic graphite exterior and ballistic fiber plating, and the helmet contains a night vision camera, a thermal camera, a sonar. He's got it all. And the legendary utility belt around his waist. Matheson was almost drooling. It's Batman, he's back. In this instance, a bizarre silence fell over all Gotham residents present, civilians they were or GCPD. There was only one thought in their minds. Oh, my, he's back. Batman and Phantom Kid stood facing each other at the top of the tower, less than 10 meters apart from each other. The two were wearing black and white as if they were natural opposites, yet somehow they had a sense of inexplicable harmony. In terms of body type, Batman is a standard muscular man with a strong body, while Kid's is slightly thinner. In terms of expression, Kid's face always has a wicked smile on his face, while Batman's face is always expressionless. It was the essence of a poker face taken to the limit. Gordon looked at Batman's figure in a daze, muttering with joy and sorrow. After these encounters, Gordon had to admit that Kid was not a criminal that ordinary cops could deal with. He was no less difficult than the likes of the Scarecrow who had wreaked havoc eight years ago. And the only sort of good news was that Phantom Kid hadn't killed anyone so far. It's not a particularly vicious crime, but Kid's charisma is so strong that he can easily disrupt the social order and even lead others to crime. As the Commissioner of Gotham's General Police Department, Gordon could never let Kid act the way he wants. More than once over the past few days, he had wondered if he should relight the bat lamp, but in the end, he resisted because Batman was still the most wanted man in Gotham, the super criminal who killed Harvey Dent. Gordon didn't want Batman to come back unless it was absolutely necessary, because it would mean the two would be arch nemeses. Barbara wouldn't have as much on her mind as her father, she was nowhere near the future Oracle, she hadn't even served as Batgirl yet, she was only a college student who was a little smarter than the average person. At this moment, having seen her idol, she immediately cheered as if she were a teenage girl. Catch that wretched thief, Batman. Justice will prevail. Barbara shouted so loudly that even Matheson on top of the tower could hear her clearly. On which side is this guy on? Matheson said to himself. It was the only way to relieve a little bit of mental pressure. The one in front of him was not on the same level as anyone he had faced in the past. Even if he knew magic, Matheson didn't have any confidence that he could beat Batman for sure. But then again, how many people in the whole world would dare to say that they could beat the master of the game? Not to mention that there was no Superman in this world, and even if there were, there might not be another dawn of justice. Even if Matheson could win once at the expense of magical strength, it's hard to say that he will win facing Batman, as for killing Batman in once. Are you dreaming? The unremovable backlighting obscures most of the face. Only the left eye, mouth and chin are visible. It looks like that monocle was specially made. Just as Matheson was examining Batman up and down, Batman was also doing the same. 
Judging by the wear and tear on the skin of his chin, Phantom Kid's age is under 25, younger than expected. He's talented and hasn't committed an unforgivable sin yet. Maybe I can lead him back to the right path. Batman thought darkly as he gazed at Matheson. Chapter 55, Black and White's Collision Batman, I didn't expect you'd come back. After a long confrontation, Matheson smiled softly and asked as if he were a good friend he had known for a long time. It's not, for a certain gem I stole earlier. Is it? Phantom Kid's voice was soft enough that only he and Batman could hear it. He was implying that he knew Batman's true identity. Batman looked unchanged as if he did not hear Matheson's words. Phantom Kid, you have stolen the Adam Star, the Cat's Eye Emerald, and the Tamil Ruby in succession, they are worth at least billions of dollars combined. Batman stared at Matheson and said in a rough voice, although, in the end, you returned the emerald and the ruby to their owners, and most of the funds from the sale of the Adam Star were donated to countless people. This doesn't make your actions acceptable. Stealing was never the right way to show off your magical talents. At those words, Matheson froze, so that it was actually how he was portrayed in Batman's eyes. You are young and have really not done anything unforgivable so far. So if you stop there. I can leave you alone. Batman didn't seem to show much hostility towards Phantom Kid. He was like an elder who couldn't bear to see his junior go astray. Batman, before you persuade me to stop, don't you think what you did is even more unacceptable than me? Phantom Kid asked rhetorically in the face of Batman's persuasion. You ignore the law, ask for no evidence, and wantonly cross over the judiciary to punish sinners just to carry out what you believe to be justice. You don't care as long as the criminals are sent to the Blackgate Penitentiary by you. You don't regard the severity of the crime they committed, or if you have broken their hands, their legs, or caused them hemiplegia. Do you think that these heavy punishments are nobler than my behavior? It is not destined for a man who never obeys the law to make another of the same kind of bit. Phantom Kid threw back his cape. His gaze was clear and cold. Batman, what position exactly are you in to persuade me to stop? At the sound of his voice, Batman fell silent for a moment. He noticed the determination deep in Matheson's eyes and instantly understood that such a man cannot be easily persuaded. Since communication doesn't work, he'd have to rely on his fists. That sentence from before, was he suspecting my identity? Batman's gaze grew colder, and his entire figure was covered with an icy aura of slaughter. Invisibly, a heavy aura was affecting Matheson. If he hadn't known that Batman had taken an oath to never kill, Matheson would have thought that the man in front of him was a butcher who had walked out of a mountain of blood. Maybe you'll learn what's right and what's wrong when you're taught a lesson. As soon as Batman's emotionless voice dropped, he launched an attack. The multifunctional belt was activated and Batman threw his unique symbol at Phantom Kid. The bat dart, the black blade spun midair, reflecting a cold light clang. As the bat dart flew between the two, a playing card collided with it, making the sound of steel on steel. The impact was so great that the bat dart and the playing card flew backwards and fell to the ground. Batman couldn't help but stare at Kid's skill at flying cards. I have as many playing cards on me as I want. I don't think you have as many bat darts though. Matheson fetched a playing card and flung it towards Batman once more. This time it was the bat dart that stopped the playing card. Batman knew that what Kid had said was true and that he did not have many bat darts on him. Looking at Matheson's thin body, Batman concluded that he had no formal training in martial arts. Batman instantly exploded to the limits of human speed, crossing the 10 meter distance between him and Kid in less than a second. In the blink of an eye, he was right in front of Matheson. A punch was thrown squarely at the chest of Phantom Kid. Thud. In a flash of lightning, Matheson only had time to block with his arms across and brace himself for a hard blow. That was fast and heavy. This punch was a complete manifestation of Batman's strength. Perhaps not as strong as those with superpowers, but still definitely at the peak of human strength. After receiving this blow, Matheson felt that his forearm had become numb. In the next moment, alarm bells went off in Matheson's mind. Without thinking, he rolled to the side reflexively, forcing himself to hold back the pain. He was able to avoid Batman's next punch. Quick movement and quick reaction, 
but unfortunately not properly trained for combat. Batman reclosed on Phantom Kid while still having room to observe Matheson's movements. Batman is a master of all martial arts on the planet, his skill is almost superhuman. He targeted Matheson's vital organs with every kick or punch. They were fast, accurate, and hard. Any blow could cause severe pain or break a bone. Matheson could only rely on his superior motor nerves and light body to constantly dodge Batman's attacks. What the hell? I clearly remember that in the movie, Batman's body was decaying. He did not train for eight years, so he should not be able to maintain such a high level of fighting strength. Faced with another swing from Batman, Matheson leapt forward, reached out and pressed his hand on Batman's swinging arm to burrow strength again, then directly leapt over his head. Could it be my appearance that caused Batman to start his training early? But, that was only a month ago at most. Can a person who has a crippled body become a super martial arts master at the pinnacle of mankind in a month? How is it possible? A drop of sweat was left on Matheson's forehead. Although he was planning to cast some offensive red magic spells, these spells have one very fatal weakness. Using offensive red magic requires the construction of a magic formation in advance, a long preparation time, and must not be interrupted in the middle. In his battle with Batman, Matheson did not dare to be careless for even a split second. Luckily, his own physical condition was not bad, so he gradually adapted to Batman's speed. As he dodged his attacks, he quietly built magic formations under his feet. And despite Batman having a vague premonition that Phantom Kid seemed to be planning something, he could not see through it, because he had never been exposed to magic before. It was a mismatch of information and as unfair as it seemed, battles are not meant to be fair. Only to an outsider's eye, Phantom Kid was at an overwhelming disadvantage. Look, Batman and Phantom Kid are fighting. Oh my god, is this a fantasy showdown? This is the fight to live for. Batman had never lost a battle, as long as he strikes, that white thief is destined to be imprisoned. What? Batman is the crazy murderer from eight years ago. Keep in mind that Harvey Dent died at his hands. What right does he have to catch Phantom Kid? Wow, Phantom Kid is so getting beaten by Batman. He can't even fight back. As soon as the fight on the Watchtower started, it caused a heated debate among the people below. Chapter 56, Black and White's Battle. Da -da -da. Suddenly, without warning, a helicopter opened fire at the top of the Watchtower and the bullets spread all over the place, forming a tongue of flames. Such a sudden change immediately separated Batman and Phantom Kid. The two quickly used the wall at the top of the tower as a cover, to avoid the helicopter's strafing. Unit 7, cease fire, immediately. Who gave you permission to open fire? Who gave the order? Gordon's face blackened and growled at the intercom. Report, it was Sheriff Foley who gave the order. The actual name of the sheriff in the Dark Knight Rises. Foley, didn't I tell you not to just fire randomly without my orders? Gordon scolded the sheriff harshly. Chief Gordon, how is this random firing? Foley smirked, seemingly disrespecting Gordon. Our targets are, a thief who dared to steal Her Majesty's most precious gem, and the other is a super wanted villain who killed Harvey Dent eight years ago. Wouldn't it be a good thing to eliminate these two felons in one fell swoop? Commissioner Gordon, are you worried that I will take the credit alone? Once he reported, the surrounding GCPD members, regardless of their positions, had instantly gazed at him with such ugly expressions on their faces. Foley was recommended to the GCPD by the mayor himself. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been promoted to his current position this quickly. Even a pig can see that, if that wasn't for Gordon's special place in people's hearts, he would have been replaced by Foley ages ago. Foley is not particularly popular amongst the GCPD, and he is indifferent towards this. In all honesty, Foley's ability is not that bad. He deserves the position of sheriff. He has also arrested many felons. Otherwise, even without the mayor's recommendation, he would have made it. The only reason that makes him incompatible with the GCPD is that he does not like Batman. He is the number one Batman hater among anti-Bat people. All because he is a fanatic supporter of Harvey Dent. As a result, it is natural for him to hate on Batman, who killed Harvey Dent. Of course, he is more likely doing this for the credit. After all, 
There are no more than five people in the whole of Gotham who clearly know the truth about that year, and although countless citizens would like to believe in Batman, their voices are simply insignificant. Watch your words, Foley, Gordon said with a serious tone. The watchtower has been established for more than half a century. No one can guarantee its solidity. Rashly using firepower on it may cause the innocent citizens here to be killed, and the blame will all be on you. Foley bristled. He obviously is not a fan of Gordon's rhetoric. The helicopter attacked the top of the tower and not the tower itself. How could this possibly collapse the observation tower? I know you all love that bat nerd so much that you completely overlooked Harvey Dent's death, but that doesn't mean I'll choose to give up on arresting Batman. After leaving these words, Foley angrily walked away. Hey Batman, it looks like the gang down there doesn't like you. Clinging to the wall, Matheson looked at the opposite side of Batman and said with a soft smile, but yeah, compared to me, a regular thief. The supervillain who killed Harvey Dent carries a lot more hate. Say, if you caught me, where are you going to send me? Blaggate or Arkham? Suddenly, Matheson asked with great interest. He wanted to see, from Batman's perspective, how dangerous he really is. The criminals in Blackgate prison are generally murderers sentenced to life imprisonment, and you are not qualified to enter the Arkham Asylum. The GCPD prison is enough to let you know how to be a good citizen. Batman said indifferently. Matheson frowned, as he knew that Catwoman was imprisoned in Blagate prison. They were both supervillain thieves. Why would he only stay at the GCPD's prison? Well, Catwoman's record of escaping from prison is just as impressive as her record of stealing. But that doesn't mean she's superior to Kid. Certain rumors say that, in Gotham, the prison you are captured in represents your status among the villains. If you have not been sentenced at least in Arkham, you dare not say that you are a villain from Gotham. Phantom Kid felt offended. Two people's A's collided together in the void, and invisible sparks were burning in their eyes. The second round of the encounter began. This time, it was Matheson who took the lead to launch an attack. He rapidly flung his hand sending a dozen playing cards flying out at the same time. Each playing card was reinforced with magic, making it extremely sharp. Batman judged in a split second that kid hasn't, until now, possessed such fast hand speed and amazing combat efficiency. Batman rolled at 47 degrees degree of his direction, that was the only gap between the dozen playing cards. However, just after he crossed from the gap, these dozen playing cards flew several meters away, then strangely flew back to him. Not only that, their speed and even the surrounding environment become slower. That's right, Matheson once again used bullet time. Although he obtained the most wanted killer, Carlos's lifetime combat experience. Apart from his supernatural gun skills, his melee ability is really not very strong. He is not proficient in any martial arts. The only melee combat ability he knows is the ability to assassinate with a dagger. The Mutual Aid Association's melee ability is really not a good one. At most they can only abuse ordinary people. That's why, in front of Batman, Matheson's fighting levels seem so average. So besides magic, the only ability that Matheson can rely on is bullet time. After all, with these fancy gadgets like flashbangs and smoke bombs, Batman also has the same style of equipment and much more advanced stuff. Matheson's heart rate quickly broke through 400 BPM, and everything around him once again slowed down countless times. At the same time, his stamina began to flow quickly. Bullet time does not bring harm to the body, and once the stamina is consumed too much, the ability will automatically be gone. This means that Matheson must fight quickly. Upon seeing the dozen playing cards in the delicate control of Kid's technique flying back, Batman's way to retreat was sealed. Although Batman's movement was tens of times slower, in Matheson's line of sight could, he clearly saw that his pupils were on the left side, and his head was also leaning to move left. This means that while the bullet time was in effect, Batman spotted the threat behind him. What a terrifying combat instinct. Matheson shed a drop of cold sweat. Compared to Harry Hart, Batman is way too good. PFFT, PFFT, poof, 
In the end, Batman was only hit by three playing cards, which hit his right shoulder, right rib, and right calf, while the rest were blocked by the hard material of the cape. As for whether Batman intended to use the cape to cover his back, that is left unknown. I request an audience with Her Majesty the Queen, under the Watchtower, at Queen Elizabeth. The UK crowd had little to no information about Batman, who had been missing for eight years and just found the right time to appear again. They just think that the black and white battle is so interesting, until a man wearing the GCPD sheriff's costume arrived and declared that he had something important to request from the Queen. Chapter 57 Black and White Epilogue Sheriff Foley, what is it you want to tell the Queen? Johnny came forward and asked. Foley smiled mysteriously pointed to the battle above the watchtower, and said, it is to do with those two guys up there. Johnny, however, did not move out of the way. Where is Commissioner Gordon? Why are you the one who came to explain by yourself? Foley cursed Johnny in his mind, but only a complicated look was shown on his face at the time being. This matter concerns a scandal in Gotham. Eight years ago, it is inconvenient for too many people to come and Commissioner Gordon happens to be the center of the vortex of that scandal. Johnny took a deep look at Foley, examining his face, and nodded to let him see the Queen. Your Majesty, I must sorrowfully tell you about a past event in Gotham. On the watchtower, Matheson's bullet time lifted as he was soaking with sweat. He used bullet time just not long ago. Although both times lasted for a short period, the physical energy consumed will only be recovered after a while. Batman, on the other hand, did not suffer too serious injuries. Only very shallow wounds were left on his right shoulder and right rib, and more than half of the left calf was directly shot by a playing card. Ordinary people will not only lose the ability to move immediately after this kind of injury, but the intense pain would have long caused them to fall to the ground. But Batman seemed to be totally okay. He squatted down on the spot, squeezed the playing card and pulled it out of his calf. The blood immediately spilled out from the wound. Batman quickly took out the wound coagulation spray from the multifunctional belt, sprayed it on the wound several times, and the blood stopped flowing out immediately. This is just an ordinary playing card, theoretically. It is impossible to be this sharp and that bizarre state just now. Batman stood up and gazed at Matheson. Phantom Kid, it seems that you are not as simple as you seem. Matheson forced a smile. There are so many things you don't know. Seeing that Batman's mobility was barely affected, he understood why Batman had just covered the left half of his body with the cape, leaving his right leg to take the worst of the damage because Bruce's right leg was already nearly senseless. Batman was relying on the addition of an exoskeleton to the right leg in order to move normally, and also to further strengthen the kicking power of his right leg. So the right leg injury just needs to stop bleeding, and it won't have any effect on Batman. Looking at you, the burden of using that ability must be very large. You should not be able to use it again. Batman's sharp eyes seemed to penetrate Matheson's mind. The truth is, if Matheson forced bullet time one more time, that would directly exhaust his stamina. Then, he won't be even able to walk, nor escape the fate of arrest. Do you really think that I showed you everything? No matter what. On the surface, Matheson cannot let himself look weak. Matheson's hands were full of cards again and his face was full of confidence. The sweaty weary face he had on has instantly disappeared. Both Batman and Kid are masters of micro-expressions, and no one can guarantee that they will be able to see through each other. The construction of the magic circle is not yet complete. Matheson, deep down, pondered how he should respond if Batman forcefully attacked over in the next second. Just now, that state, did time stop? If he could really manipulate time, then I wouldn't be able to detect his real attack just now. What if he was controlling my perception of things in the outside world? Batman was thinking of the same thing. In case Phantom Kid happens to use this ability in the next seconds, what should Batman respond with? Once again, they were caught in the confrontation. Report, Chief. A group of people are approaching the Watchtower, they are the United Kingdom's Royal Guards. Suddenly. A GCPD officer shouted in alarm, and Gordon felt that something was wrong. The Royal Guard specializes in protecting the Queen. How could they easily leave her side? But soon, Gordon thought of Foley, 
who had just left. Could he have said something to the Queen? If this is truly Foley's doing, then the Royal Guard's action must be to target Batman and Phantom Kid. Then, what should the GCPD do? Or rather, who should they help? Gordon certainly wants to help Batman, and almost the entire staff of the GCPD will also carry out this order. Going up to help Batman will certainly be counted as Batman's accomplice. Staying below will be considered as doing nothing productive. Fighting against Batman is something against the will of the GCPD. As for Phantom Kid, he still isn't the main concern of many, in comparison to Batman. How would one choose? Gordon did not hesitate. He immediately led a team of policemen and rushed to the watchtower. This is the greed of Gordon's life. Even if it sometimes costs him his conscience, he must do it. The watchtower is not big. There was no need to bring too many people, both the Royal Guard and Gordon brought all together only about a hundred people. All of them combined would be just enough to fill the whole tower. Tap tap tap. Hey, just when Batman was planning to arrest Phantom Kid in one fell swoop, the Royal Guard broke the door and entered. The door at the top of the watchtower was forced open and one heavily armed agent rushed in. Gordon departed quite a bit later than the Royal Guard so he was still running up the stairs. Wow, it suddenly became lively here. Phantom Kid surprisingly smiled. His magic formation was constructed exactly when the Royal Guard interrupted the two men's confrontation. Batman, you finally showed up. Maybe killing Gotham's White Knight has made you suffer from guilt. For the past eight years, Foley came out of the Royal Guard and looked at Batman rather triumphantly. Ah, yes, and you, the thief. Thank you for pestering Batman enough for us to catch him now. I can guarantee you a lighter sentence. Foley seemed to have already sentenced Batman and Phantom Kid to death. However, neither Batman nor Kid have paid any attention to him. Matheson clenched his right hand across his chest, stretched outwards, spreading his five fingers open. A prototype dark red wall of fire appeared out of thin air, surrounding Batman and Matheson to separate them from the others. This. What is this thing? Foley was so frightened that he couldn't even think of this supernatural scene before. A wall of fire also rose in the middle to separate Matheson and Batman. Then, Matheson faced Batman, pulled down the bowler hat on his head a little bit, and looked directly into Batman's eyes. Batman, you were once known as the world's most powerful private detective. If a thief is a creative artist, then the police and detectives will only follow his lead and blow the whistle on him. At best, you all are just critics. As soon as he said these words, Phantom Kid snapped his fingers. The magic circle that only Matheson could see was instantly activated, only to see a strange strong light flicker, and the figure of Phantom Kid can no longer be seen around. Chapter 58 Making a Name for Oneself At this time, Gordon also happened to bring his team up and saw the Phantom Kid's disappearance scene. There was no sign of flashbangs, gliders, or dummies. The only possibility is that Kid, again, disguised himself as someone, only to get mixed with the crowd. Gordon subconsciously let everyone present pinch the face of the person next to them, while he firmly guarded the only doorway. Helicopters are always hovering at the top of the tower, and there is no way that Phantom Kid could have escaped from the sky. It was clear that they couldn't find Matheson. No one knows how Phantom Kid escaped from this place. Even Batman was in deep meditation, to a degree that he completely ignored the fact that he was also in danger. Batman, although Phantom Kid ran away, arresting you would also be a great achievement. Sheriff Foley laughed. The idea of Batman also disappearing didn't, at all, cross his mind. In the face of Foley shouting, Batman only glanced at him slightly and lost interest, as if the Royal Guard encirclement did not exist. Batman crossed his right arm, tapped lightly on the wrist armor, and then accelerated towards the wall to charge, jumping down the tower. Open fire. Foley was the first to rush to the wall and pull out his pistol to shoot frantically at the bottom. The members of the Royal Guard followed, firing all kinds of firearms. A torrent of bullets towards Batman. However, Batman's diving speed was so fast that not many shots could hit him at all, and even if a few bullets did, they would be bounced off the strong material of the Batsuit directly.
buzz. I don't know where that loud engine rattle came from. A cool black automobile drove out from somewhere in the park and rushed to the watchtower at an amazing speed, just below Batman. Peng. Batman's body descended straight downward and immediately opened his cape when he landed at a distance of four or five meters above the Batmobile. His bat wing shape fully expanded to offset the impact on him. At the same time, Batman's body quickly rotated and returned to an upright position. The roof of the Batmobile's cockpit opened automatically, allowing Batman to sit in it in one breath, and then rushed towards the outside of Robinson Park. The whole process was like flowing water, in just a few seconds, it has been completely achieved. Foley could only stand on the edge of the tower reluctantly looking down, with his pistol magazines shot empty. On the other hand, in the dense forest, a kilometer away from the watchtower, a dark red light faded in a flash to reveal the figure of Matheson. There is no one around, one can only vaguely see the lights coming from the direction of the watchtower. Matheson gasped, leaning against a large stone to rest. The magic of teleportation consumes a lot of magic power. It's no wonder that Akiko Koizumi would rather force Kid to fly so far himself, rather than teleporting him instantly. The system does not even give a mana bar to measure the spell casting. He can only judge the magic required based on his feelings and the extremely general words in the magic book. He originally thought that the distance was only a kilometer, and he would run with all his strength for three minutes. He didn't think that he would spend this much magic power. But he almost drained himself, while resting. He took off his costume and changed into his own clothes. Matheson took a deep breath and calmly returned to the watchtower again, seamlessly melting into the thousands of ordinary people. That inexplicable flame that just flared up, at the top of the watchtower. Even if the culprit has escaped, evidence cannot be missing. Even Bob and Starling squatted on the ground. Observing the disappearance of the strange thief kid, the firewall naturally burned out, leaving a circle of scorched marks on the floor. No combustible material found. Is it phosphorus? No, phosphorus burning causes yellow-white flame and produces a lot of white smoke. The flames just now were dark red and no smoke emerged at all. I don't believe there is such a thing as magic in the world, he must have used a chemical reaction that we don't know about. Starling said. Bob, Gordon, and others thought not much different from her. Commissioner Gordon, I heard that you got a sample of the suspected blood of Phantom Kid, is that right? Bob suddenly asked Gordon. Yes, we did find suspicious blood stains, but we can't be sure it's Phantom Kid's blood. But that's also a big breakthrough. I want to take a sample to the CIA's laboratory department. After all, the GCPD's database should not be as complete as the CIA. I suggest that Agent Starling also takes a copy to the FBI. Gordon and Starling nodded. Bob's suggestion was spot on. Under the watchtower, Barbara was a little disappointed, because for the first time she found that the iconic Batman also had an opponent that could not be caught. But she soon regained her cheerfulness because she was convinced that it was only a matter of time before Batman caught Phantom Kid. Perhaps, in the matter of catching Phantom Kid. She can also invest a little effort, for example, hacking the traffic bureau's surveillance system, or even hacking a satellite. By the way, how come I don't see Matheson around? He should be among the crowd. Barbara kept looking into the crowd to find Matheson, but the scene was filled with many people, civilians, and policemen. After looking for a while, Barbara still did not see his figure. So, she had to go into the crowd, hoping to run into him. Huddled in the crowd, Barbara kept looking around. Barbara, are you looking for me? Suddenly, a hand grabbed Barbara's wrist, scaring her so much that she almost slapped her hand back in dislike. Matheson, who else? If not me, Matheson said helplessly. He took Barbara's hand and squeezed his way out of the crowd. Phantom Kid and Batman are gone. People naturally did not need to stay here any longer. Gordon and other people still have investigations to do. As a result, Barbara and Matheson went back home. On the way, Matheson and Barbara had a small talk. Your idol, Batman, seems to have lost to Phantom Kid. Oh, are you not sad? Who said that Batman lost to Phantom Kid? Obviously, Kid was the one to be beaten by him. Hearing Matheson suddenly saying so, Barbara fiercely replied. 
But didn't Batman also fail to catch Kid in the end? Isn't that a failure for him? He will be caught by Batman sooner or later. I don't think so. Are you trying to say that Batman is not as good as the thief? Why do you have to speak so for Kid? Uck. Batman is also a wanted criminal, and his behavior as a policeman is not less than the crime committed by Phantom Kid in a strict sense. You don't like him that much. First, he didn't kill Harvey Dent. Second, Batman delivers justice, and the people he arrests are felons. Phantom Kid also helped a lot of people. That's not the same. Yeah, 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 you're right about everything. Dash dash. Super Showdown, Phantom Kid vs. Batman. The magician under the moonlight commits another crime, and the victim is the Queen of the United Kingdom. Shock, Tamil Ruby was stolen by Phantom Kid. Queen Elizabeth, Phantom Kid is the most interesting magician I've ever seen. Soon, the story of Phantom Kid's successful theft of the Tamil Ruby necklace spread around the world. Countless people have developed a keen interest in this miraculous thief. Chapter 59 Achievement System Unlocked The nightly event in which Phantom Kid stole the Tamil Ruby necklace was in Bristol District, outside of Gotham City. At the waterfall on the back of Wayne Manor, a black and cool chariot speeded on the dirt road, and finally drove to the cliff opposite the waterfall. 